Spirituality means waking up. Most people, even though they don't know it, are asleep. They're born asleep, they live asleep, they marry in their sleep, they breed children in their sleep, and they die in their sleep without ever waking up. They never understand the loveliness and the beauty of this thing that we call human existence. You know, all mystics, Catholic, Christian, non-Christian, they're all unanimous, no matter what their theology, no matter what their religion, they're all unanimous on one thing. And that one thing is, all is well. All is well. Everything's in a mess. And all is well. Strange paradox. But tragically, most people never get to see that. They never get to see that all is well because they're asleep. They're in a nightmare. You know, talking about sleeping reminds me, last year on Spanish television, I saw a nice little story. There's this elderly gentleman who knocks at the door of his son, who's fast asleep. He says, Jaime, wake up. And Jaime says, I don't want to get up, Papa. And the old man says, get up, you've got to go to school. And Jaime says, I don't want to go to school. Why not, says the old man, because first, it's so dull. Second, the kids all tease me. And third, I hate school. So the old man says, I'm going to give you three reasons why you must go to school. First, because it is your duty. Second, because you're 45 years old. <laughs> And third, because you're the headmaster. <laughs> Better go to school. So, wake up! Wake up! You're grown up. You're too big to be asleep. Wake up! Stop playing with your toys. Most people tell you that they want to get out of kindergarten, but don't believe them. Don't believe them. All they want for you to do is to mend their broken toys. Give me back my wife. Give me back my job. Give me back my money. Give me back my reputation, my success. This is what they want. They want their toys repaired. That's all. Now, even the best psychologists will tell you that. They'll tell you, people don't really want to be cured. What they want is relief. A cure is painful. Waking up is unpleasant, you know. You're nice and comfortable in bed. And at least as long as you're asleep, it's irritating to be woken up. That's the reason why I told you the wise guru will not attempt to wake people up. I hope I'm going to be wise these days and make no attempt whatsoever to wake you up if you're asleep. None of my business. My business is to do my thing, to dance my dance. If you profit from it, fine. If you don't, too bad. As the Arabs say, the nature of the rain is the same, but it grows thorns in the marshes and flowers in the garden. Do you think I'm going to help anybody? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't expect to be able to be of help to anyone. And I don't expect to do damage to anyone. If you're damaged, 
you did it. <laughs> and if you're helped, you did it. You really did. We'll come to that later when I challenge your beliefs. You think people help you. They don't. You think people support you. They don't. I had an interesting example of a woman in a therapy group. She was a sister. She was a religious. And she said to me, you know, I don't feel supported by my superiors. Listen to this one now. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, look at my superior, the provincial superior. She never shows up at this novitiate where I am. She never shows up, never says a word of appreciation. So I said to her, all right, let's do this. I know your provincial superior. Let's do a little role playing. I know exactly what she thinks about you. How would that be? And she said, fine, all right. So I said, you know, Mary, acting the part of the provincial superior now, I said, you know, Mary, the reason why I don't come to that place you're in is that's the one place in the province that's trouble-free, no problems. I know you're in charge, so all is well. How do you feel now? <laughs> and Mary said, I feel great. I said, all right, now, would you leave the room for a minute or two? This is part of the exercise. So she did. When she, now, when she was away, I said to the group, I'm still Sister Mary Jane the Provincial, okay? Uh, Mary out there is the worst novice directress we've had in the whole history of the province. In fact, I don't go to the novitiate because I can't bear to see what she's up to. Oh, it's awful. And if I tell her the truth, she's only going to make those novices suffer all the more. We're getting somebody to take a place within a year or two. We're training someone. So in the meantime, I, I sort of say these nice words to her and keep her going. What do you think of that? They said, well, it's the only thing you can do. All right. Come on in, Mary. So Mary comes in. How do you feel? She says, I feel great. You feel supported by your superior? Yeah, I feel supported. Question. Who was supporting Mary? God, she says. <laughs> Poor God, why did she drag him in now? <laughs> well, that's good, that's good, that's right. All right. So poor Mary. There it was. She thought she was being supported. You think you're in love with somebody? Well, I got news for you. You're never in love with anyone. You're only in love with your prejudiced and hopeful idea of that person. Want a minute to think about that? You're never in love with anyone. You're in love with your prejudiced idea of that person, with your hopeful idea of that person. Are you really in love with the person? Well, how come you fell out of love? Your idea changed, didn't it? How could you have let me down when I trusted you so much? Did you really trust me? You never trust anyone. Come off it. That's part of the brainwashing of your society and mine. We never trust anyone. You're only trusting your judgment about that person. So what are you complaining about? You don't like to say, my judgment was lousy. That's not very uh, flattering to you, is it? So you prefer to say, how could you have let me down? So there it is. People don't really want to grow up. People don't really want to change. People don't really want to be happy. As someone has said so wisely, don't try to make them happy. You'd only get into trouble. Like the guy who gets into a bar, uh, sits down, 
and he sees this fellow with a banana in his ear. A banana in his ear. And he says, uh, I wonder if I should tell him that. <laughs> and he thought, none of my business. And he thought, maybe I ought to tell him. So after he had had a drink or two, he says, excuse me, uh, you got a banana in your ear. So the guy says, what? <laughs> he says, you got a banana in your ear. What was that? You got a banana in your ear. He said, talk louder, I got a banana in my ear. <laughs> it's useless, give up, give up, give up. Say your thing and get out of here. And if they profit, that's fine. And if they don't, too bad. So now the first thing I want you to understand, if you really want to wake up, is that you don't want to wake up. The first step to understanding or to waking up is to be honest enough to admit to yourself that you don't like it. You don't want to be happy. You want a little test? Let's try it. It'll take you exactly one minute. You could close your eyes while you're doing this little exercise. You could keep, it, uh, keep your eyes open. It doesn't really matter. But listen to this. Think of someone you so-called love very much. Someone you're close to someone who is precious to you and say I'd rather have happiness than have you and see what happens I'd rather be happy than have you if I had a choice no question about it I choose happiness. How many people felt selfish when they said this? Would you raise your hands? Isn't that wonderful? See how we've been brainwashed? See how we've been brainwashed into thinking, how could you be so selfish? <coughs> Look who's being selfish. Just imagine somebody says, how could you be so selfish that you choose happiness over me? Who's being selfish now? How could you be so selfish that you would demand that I choose you above my happiness? When I was a child in the eighth grade, a Jesuit cousin of my mother gave the Traore at the Jesuit Church in Milwaukee. And he opened each of the conferences with this word, for the test of love is sacrifice. And the gauge of love is unselfishness. So I think you should love her. That's marvelous. She speaks about a Jesuit who says, the test of love is sacrifice. And the gauge of love is selflessness, unselfishness. But now tell me, would you want me to love you at the cost of my happiness? Yes. She said yes! <laughs> Isn't that delightful? You're great, you're tremendous. You're tremendous. <laughs> now, what's your name? Claire. Okay, Claire. Now, wouldn't that be wonderful that you would love me at the cost of your happiness and I would love you at the cost of my happiness, and you got two unhappy people, but long live love. <laughs> we were saying, we don't want to be happy. We want other things. Or let's put it more accurately, we don't want to be unconditionally happy. I'm ready to be happy provided I have this and that and the other. And you know what we're really saying? We're saying 
You are my happiness to our friend or to our God or to anything. You are my happiness. If I don't get you, I refuse to be happy. And it's so important to understand that. Yes, give me your name. Jenny. Jenny. Yes, Jenny. Is it, is it so much that we don't want to be happy or that we cannot imagine being happy without all of it? All right, that's uh, pretty well put. Wouldn't it rather be that we cannot imagine being happy without all those things? That's pretty accurate, Jenny. Yes. And that's the reason why we don't want it. Because we cannot conceive of the fact that we would be happy without all of those things. We've placed our happiness. We've been taught to place our happiness in all of those things. So that's the first thing we need to do if we want to come awake, which is the same thing as saying if we want to love, if we want freedom, if we want joy and peace and spirituality. In that sense, spirituality is the most practical thing in the whole wide world. I challenge anyone to think of anything more practical than spirituality as I have defined it. Not piety, not devotion, not religion, not worship. Spirituality, waking up. Wake up. Look at the heartache everywhere. Look at the loneliness, look at the fear, the confusions, the conflicts in the hearts of people, inner conflict, outer conflict. Suppose somebody gave you a way of getting rid of all of that. Suppose somebody gave you a way of stopping that tremendous drainage of energy, of health, of the emotions, that come from these conflicts and confusions. Would you want that? Suppose somebody showed us a way where we would truly love one another and be at peace at last. Can you think of anything more practical than that? But here you have people thinking that big business is more practical or politics is more practical or science is more practical. What's the earthly use, the earthly use, of putting a man in the moon when we cannot live on the earth? Is psychology more practical? Nothing is so practical as this. What can the poor psychologist do? He can only relieve the pressure. I'm a psychologist myself, and I practice psychotherapy. But you know, I have this great conflict within me when I have to choose sometimes between psychology and spirituality. I wonder if that makes sense to anybody here. It didn't have... for many years. All right, I'll explain that. Why would you have to choose? I'll explain that. You know, it didn't make sense to me for many years until I suddenly discovered that people have to suffer enough emotionally before they're ready to wake up. And what I was doing as a psychotherapist was easing the suffering. People have to suffer enough in a relationship that they'd get disillusioned with all relationships. Isn't that a terrible thing to say? They've got to suffer enough in a relationship before they wake up and say, I'm sick of it. There must be another way of living than depending on another human being. And what was I doing as a psychotherapist? They were coming to me with their relationship problems, <laughs> with their communication problems, etc. And sometimes that was a help. And sometimes, I'm sorry to say it wasn't, because it kept them asleep. Maybe they should suffer a little more. Maybe they ought to touch rock bottom 
before they say, I'm sick of it all. It's only when you're sick of your sickness that you'll get out of it. Most people, uh, well, they, they, they go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist to get relief. To get relief. You know the story of little Johnny who was mentally... They said he was mentally retarded, the poor kid. Uh, but he evidently wasn't, as you'll learn from the story I'm going to tell you, because he goes to modeling class in a school for special children, and he gets uh, plasticine, and he's modeling it. He takes his little lump of plasticine and goes to a corner of the room, and he, he, he's playing with it. So the teacher goes up to him and says, Hi, Johnny. And Johnny says, Hi. And she says, What's that you got in your hand? He says, This is a lump of cow dung. She says, what are you making out of it? He says, I'm making a teacher. <laughs> so teacher thought, little Johnny has regressed. She saw, the, she saw the principal passing by in the corridor and she said, Johnny's regressed. So the principal goes up to him and says, hi son. And Johnny says, hi. He says, what have you got in your hand? He says, a lump of cow dung. So what are you making out of it? And he says, a principal. <laughs> well, the principal said, this is the case for the school psychologist, sent for the psychologist. The psychologist was a clever guy. He goes up, he says, hi. And Johnny says, hi. He says, I know what you got in your hand. What? A lump of cow dung. He says, right. And I know what you're making out of it. What? You're making a psychologist. No, not enough cow dung. <laughs> there are times when psychotherapy is a tremendous help because you know when you come to that point where you're about to get insane, raving mad, you're about to become either a psychotic or a mystic. <laughs> Because that's what the mystic is. You know one sign that you've woken up? You're asking yourself, am I crazy or are all of them? <laughs> it really is. Because they're crazy. The whole world is crazy. They're living on crazy ideas about love, about relationships, about happiness, about joy, about everything. They're crazy. To the point that I've come to believe that if everybody's saying something, you can be sure it's wrong. Sure. Every new idea, every great idea, when it first began, was in a minority of one. That guy called Jesus Christ. Minority of one. Everybody was saying something different. Buddha, minority of one, everyone was saying something different. In fact, it's even worse. I think it was Bertrand Russell who said, every great idea starts out as a blasphemy. That's well and accurately put. You're going to hear lots of blasphemies during these days. He hath blasphemed. Because they're crazy. They're lunatics. And the sooner you see this, the better for your mental and spiritual health. Don't trust them. Don't trust your best friends. Get disillusioned with your best friends. They're very clever, as you are when you're dealing with everybody, though you probably don't know it. Oh, you're so wily and subtle and clever. You're putting on a great act and not being very complimentary, am I? But you want to wake up. You're putting on a great act, aren't you? And you don't even know it. You think you're being so loving. Ha ha, whom are you loving? Even when you go in for self-sacrifice, as Claire was telling us a little while ago. Gives you a good feeling, doesn't it? 
Me, I'm sacrificing myself. I'm living up to my ideal. Boy, you're getting something out of it, aren't you? You're always getting something out of everything you do until you wake up. So there it is. Step one. Realize that you don't want to wake up. It's pretty difficult to wake up. When you have been hypnotized into thinking, as I said to you before, that a scrap of old newspaper is a check for a million dollars, you're hypnotized. How difficult it is to tear yourself away from that scrap of newspaper. Anytime you're practicing renunciation, you're deluded. How about that now? <laughs> you're deluded. What are you renouncing? Anytime you renounce something, you're tied forever to the thing you renounce. There's a guru in India. He says, every time Tute comes to me, She's talking about nothing but God. She says, I'm sick of this life I'm living. I want God. He says, every time a priest comes to me, he's talking about nothing but sex. <laughs> he's full of sex. Tied to it forever. As long as you're fighting it, A, you're giving it power. You give it as much power as you are using to fight it. You must receive your demons. Because when you fight them, you empower them. But nobody ever told you this. And when you renounce something, you're tied to it. The only way to get out of this is to see through it. Don't renounce it. See through it. Understand its true value. You won't need to renounce it. It'll just drop. But of course, if you don't see that, if you're hypnotized, as I told you, you've been hypnotized into thinking that you won't be happy, as Jenny there was saying, into thinking that you won't be happy without this or that or the other. So you're stuck. What we need to do for you is not what so-called spirituality is attempting to do to get you to make sacrifices to get you to renounce things. That's useless. You're still sleeping. What we need to do for you is to help you to understand. 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 If you understood, you'd drop it. Which is another way of saying, if you woke up, you'd drop it. How does one wake up? Well, I told you, some people, some of us get woken up by the harsh realities of life, suffer so much, we wake up. Most people keep bumping again and again into life, but they still go on sleepwalking, they never wake up, tragically. It never occurs to them that there may be another way never occurs to them that there may be a better way. Now, if you haven't been bumped sufficiently by life and you don't suffer enough, then there is another way. A, to listen. If you are ready to listen during these days, not to agree with what I'm saying, that wouldn't be listening. And believe me, it really doesn't matter. You're going to find this hard to understand. But it really doesn't matter whether you agree with what I'm saying or you don't. Because as I shall explain to you later, agreement and disagreement has to do with words and concepts and theories. It doesn't have anything to do with truth. Truth is never expressed in words. Truth is cited suddenly as a result of a certain attitude. And you could be disagreeing with me and you might cite the truth. 
but it has to be an attitude of openness, of willingness to discover something new. That's important. Not you're agreeing with me or disagreeing with me. Now, all I can tell you is not the truth, but the obstacles to the truth. Those I can describe. I cannot describe the truth. No one can. All I can give you is a description of your falsehoods so that you can drop them. All I can do for you is to challenge your beliefs and your belief system that makes you unhappy. To point out your errors. All I can do for you is help you to unlearn. That's what learning is all about where spirituality is concerned, unlearning. Unlearning almost everything you've been taught. A willingness to unlearn. So to listen. Are you listening as most people do in order to find something that would confirm what they already think? Observe your reactions as I talk, frequently you'll be startled or shocked or scandalized or irritated or annoyed or frustrated or you'll be saying, yay, great, hey, are you listening for what will confirm what you already think or are you listening in order to discover something new? That's important. That's difficult for sleeping people. Jesus proclaimed the good news. He was rejected not because it was good. He was rejected because it was new. We hate the new. We hate it. And the sooner we face up to that fact, the better. We don't want new things, particularly when they're disturbing, particularly if they involve change, particularly if it involves saying, I was wrong. I remember meeting an 87-year-old Jesuit in Spain had been my professor and rector in India, oh, 30 years ago, and he attended a workshop like this. He said to me, I should have heard you about 60 years ago. You know something? I've been wrong all my life. God, to listen to that is like looking at one of the wonders of the world. That ladies and gentlemen, is faith, an openness to the truth, no matter what the consequences, no matter where it comes from, no matter where it leads you, you don't even know where it's leading you. That's faith. Not belief, faith. Your beliefs give you a lot of security, don't they? Faith is insecurity. You don't know. You're ready to follow, and you're open. You're wide open. You're ready to listen. And mind you, being open does not mean being gullible. It doesn't mean swallowing whatever the speaker is saying. Oh, no, no, no. You've got to challenge everything I'm saying. But challenge it from an attitude of openness. Openness, and challenge it all. Those lovely words of Buddha when he said, monks and scholars must not accept my words out of respect, but they must analyze them the way a goldsmith analyzes gold. Rubbing, cutting, melting, that's the way to do it. Challenging, testing. Then you're listening. 
then you've taken another major step towards awakening. The first step I said was a readiness to admit that you don't want to wake up. You don't want to be happy. There are all kinds of resistances within you to that. The second step, a readiness to understand, to listen, to challenge your whole belief system. Not just your religious beliefs, your political beliefs, your social beliefs, your psychological beliefs, all of them. A readiness to reappraise them all. <coughs> and I'll give you plenty of opportunity to do that here. Even your most selfless acts are really selfishness masquerading under the form of altruism. Let's, let's simplify it. Let's make it as simple as possible. How would this be? Uh, the two types, let's make it as blunt and extreme as possible to begin with. The two types of selfishness. The first type is the one where I give myself the pleasure of pleasing myself. That's what we generally call self-centeredness. The second one is when I give myself the pleasure of pleasing others. How would that be? More refined kind of selfishness, huh? <laughs> yes? The first one is very obvious, but the second one is very hidden. Very hidden, that's right, and so more dangerous. Because then we get to feel we're really great, but maybe we're not all that great, but somebody else is protesting, and that's great. Go ahead, yes, yes. Uh, I think it's a two-way street, isn't it? Because I have, <coughs> in my own case, I'm a widow, I live alone, and I go to the rectory and give several hours of my time. But I really know that I'm doing it out of a selfish reason, because I need to be needed, and I also need to be, uh, you know, needed in a way that uh, makes me feel like I'm contributing to the world a little bit. But the other thing is they also need me to do this work, so it's kind of like a two-way Give me your name. You're, you're, you're almost enlightened. <laughs> we got to learn from this lady. What did you say her name was? Julia. Julia. Julia, that's right. That's right. She's saying, I give something, I get something. I go out to help. I give something, I get something. That's beautiful. That's true. That's real. That isn't charity. That's enlightened self-interest. <laughs> yes, Joe. Yes, Joe. Uh, Tony, I'd like to have you put two things together. One, the gospel of Jesus is the gospel of ultimate self-interest, the achievement of eternal life, by acts of charity. I'm blessed of my father. When I was hungry, you gave me to eat, and so on. So therefore, the gospel of Jesus is a gospel of ultimate self-interest achieved through acts of charity. Perfect confirmation of what you said. When we look at Jesus himself, was not the performance of acts of charity by Jesus act of ultimate self-interest. In other words, to win souls for eternal life. So that isn't the whole trust and meaning of life, the achievement of ultimate self-interest by acts of charity. All right. <laughs> that's, that's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> but now you see, Joe there is cheating a bit because he brought religion into this. <laughs> but it's, it's legitimate, it's valid. Now how would it be if I deal with the Gospels, with the Bible, with Jesus at the end, Joe, towards the end of this workshop. But I will say this much, to complicate it even more. You know, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. When? When did we do it? We didn't know it. 
unself-conscious. So I sometimes have a horrid fantasy where the king is saying, I was hungry and you gave me to eat, and the people on the right say, that's right, Lord, we, we, we know I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> it doesn't fit into the script. You're not supposed to have known. Isn't that interesting? You know, you know your inner pleasure while you're doing it. Ah, uh, that's right. It's like, like Julia there, she says, what's so great about what I did? I did something, I got something. I had no notion I was doing anything good. My left hand had no idea what my right hand was doing. You know, a good is never so good as when you have no awareness that you're doing good. You are never so good as when you have no consciousness that you're good. Or as the great Sufis would say, a saint is one until he or she knows it. <laughs> Unself-conscious. Can I ask you a question, uh, or I guess it's a comment, really, on eternal life? And let's bring it down away from religion for a minute. So this pleasure that you receive in giving, isn't that eternal life right here and now? Oh, I wouldn't know. The, I call pleasure, pleasure. Uh. <laughs> you know, it's a, but for the time being, till we get into religion, maybe for the, the religionists among you, uh, we get into religion towards the end, okay? <laughs> But I want you to understand something right at the beginning, that religion is not, repeat, not necessarily connected with spirituality. Does that make sense to you? Yes. My, you're, a, you're tremendous, you know. You're tremendous, I'm yes. I'm thinking, please keep religion out of this. All right, I will, for the time being. <laughs> Somebody had his hand up there. Uh, yes. Uh, isn't it true that everything we do has about six, seven, ten mixed motives in it. And I think I hear you saying it would be good if we stand back and try to figure out what some of the less worthy motives are. The less worthy motives. All right, did you hear that? Uh, she says, everything we do have about six, seven, ten motives to it. We could have we stepped back and saw the less worthy ones. The less worthy ones are awful. And the worthy ones are selfish. Selfish. <laughs> but we keep that between the two of us, okay? We won't tell anyone. We won't tell anyone. Yes. Who jumps on a grenade and falls on a tube to keep it from exploring? All right. How about the soldier who jumps on a grenade and, uh, you know, sort of gets killed to keep it from exploding on others? Uh, you read about that guy who got into a truck, a truck full of dynamite and drove into the American camp in Beirut a couple of years ago? How about that guy? Greater love than this, no one has. But the Americans don't think so. That's right, he did it deliberately. He was terrible, wasn't he? <laughs> but he wouldn't think so, I assure you of that. He thought he was going to heaven, that's right, just like your soldier. No, but I think the other is unconscious. You do it reflexively. All right. Yes. You know, uh, I'm not excluding an act where there is no self. Where you awake and what you do is done through you. Your deed becomes a happening. Oh, I'll have to explain that as we go along. Let it be done unto me. I'm not excluding that. But when you do it, I'm searching for the selfishness. Even if it is only, I'll be remembered as a great hero. Or, I'd never be able to live if I didn't do this. I'd never be able to live with the thought that I ran away. Remember, I'm not excluding the other. I didn't say, did I? that there never is an act where there is no self. Maybe there is. We'll have to explore that. No, mother saving a child. Mother saving her child. child. Got it? Yes. How come she's not saving the neighbor's child? Uh-huh, uh-huh. 
hers, a soldier dying for his country. You know, lots of those deaths, pardon me, are the result of brainwashing. Lots of martyrs got an idea in their head, got to die. It's a great thing. You got to do it. They feel nothing. They go right in. Not all of them. So you'd better listen to me properly. I didn't say all of them, but I wouldn't exclude the possibility. Lots of communists get brainwashed. Now you're ready to believe that one, huh? <laughs> They're brainwashed. They're ready to die. I sometimes say the process that we use for making a St. Francis Xavier could be exactly the same process used for producing the terrorist. No difference in the process. A man who gets into a 30-day retreat and comes out all aflame with the love of Christ and without the slightest bit of self-awareness. None. He could be one big pain. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see you filled in the blanks. <laughs> and quite unaware of it. He thinks he's a great saint. Without meaning to slander old Francis Xavier, who probably was a great saint, he was a difficult man to live with, you know. And he was a lousy superior. <laughs> he really was. You want to do your historical investigations? Ignatius was always having to step in to undo the harm that this good man was doing in his intolerance. You need to be pretty intolerant to achieve that kind of feat. Go, 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 no, ma no matter how many corpses fall by the wayside. And. Uh, some critics of Francis Xavier claim exactly that. He was dismissing men from our society, quite blithely. They'd appeal to his, to St. Ignatius, who'd say, come on to Rome, we'll talk about it. And he was surreptitiously getting them in again. How much self-awareness was there? Uh, who are we to judge? We don't know. I'm only talking about the possibility. Yes. No, I'm saying that ordinarily everything we do is in our self-interest, everything. If you do something for the love of Christ, mm -hmm. is that in your self-interest? Mm-hmm. You're doing something for the love of anybody in your self-interest. Oh, we'll have to explain that. <laughs> Tell me something you did or someone could do for the love of Christ. I have a feeding station in Haiti, and uh, we feed over 500 children a day. Does that give you a good feeling? Does it give me a good feeling? It gives me uh, a good feeling. I'm so happy to hear that. I really am. I'll tell you why. Well, would you expect it to give me a bad feeling? Yes, sometimes it does, and that's the worst kind of charity. Why? Uh, why would it give me a bad feeling? Because there are some people, and thank God you're not in their number, who do things so that they won't have a bad feeling. And they call that charity. They're guilty. That isn't love. Now thank God you're doing things for people and it's pleasurable, wonderful. You're a healthy individual. Um, Tony, when you were talking about St. Francis, I like a quote that, he, oh, that I read that he said and it said, Nothing is as strong as gentleness, and nothing is as gentle as real strength. And then hearing you talk about St. Francis, I just said somewhere in his life he must have had this conversion or transformation or become awake that he could make that. Do you think everything we say we practice? <laughs> yes. Let me, let me summarize what I was saying about what we call selfless charity. Uh, I said there are two types of selfishness, maybe I should have said three. First, when I do something, or rather, when I give myself the pleasure of pleasing me. Second, when I give myself the pleasure of pleasing others. Don't take pride in that now. Don't think you're a great guy. 
You're a very ordinary guy, but you got refined taste. <laughs> your taste is good. Not the quality of your spirituality or anything of that sort. You know, when you were a kid, you liked Coca-Cola. Now you've grown older and you appreciate chilled beer on a hot day. You've got better taste. When you were a kid, you loved chocolates. Now you're older, you enjoy a symphony. You enjoy a poem. Ah, you got better tastes. But you're getting your pleasure all the same. All right. And then you've got the third type, which is the worst. When you do something so that you won't get a bad feeling. Doesn't give, doesn't give you a good feeling to do it. Gives you a bad feeling to do it. You hate it. You're making sacrifices. You're grumbling. You're complaining. You think we don't do things that give us a bad feeling? Ha! How little you know of yourself if you think that you don't do things. If I had a dollar, for every time I did things that gave me a bad feeling, I'd be a millionaire by now. You know, uh, could I meet you tonight, Father? Um, 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 yeah, 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 come on in. I don't want to meet him. I hate meeting him. I want to watch that TV show tonight, but how do I say no to him? I haven't got the guts to say no. Come on in. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I've got to put up with this pain tonight when I be. Doesn't give me a good feeling. It doesn't give me a good feeling to meet him. It doesn't give me a good feeling to say no to him. So I choose the lesser of the two evils. And I say, okay, come on in. I say, how are you? And somebody said, boy, I'm going to be happy when this thing gets over so I'll be able to take my smile off. <laughs> how are you? I'm mean, wonderful. And so he goes on and on and on. He says, you know, I love that workshop of yours. I'm thinking, oh God, have you come to tell me what you could have... Uh, and he goes, when, do you, when is he going to come to the point? And finally he comes to the point and then I indirectly slam him against the wall. I say, well, any fool could solve that kind of thing, uh, you know, and send him out. <sighs> got rid of him. And next morning at breakfast he says, you know, I, I'm guilty already. I, I, I was a bit rude. And, and I go up to him and say, How's life? <laughs> How's life? He says, pretty good. You know what you said did help me last night. Could I meet you today after lunch? Oh, God. Yeah, come on in. Oh, God. Any priest who hasn't done this, I'm ready to canonize him. Only you'll have to wait till I become Pope, which I'm hoping to be someday. I really am. Yes. See, that's the worst kind of charity where you're doing things so you won't get a bad feeling, you're guilty, you've got no guts. You don't have the guts to say, no, I want to be left alone. Sorry. So what kind of a priest are you? Oh, oh, come on in. <laughs> See the selfishness? I want him to think I'm a good priest. I don't like hurting people. Get off it. I don't believe you. I don't believe anyone who says that he or she does not like hurting people. We love to hurt people, especially some people. We love it. And when somebody else is doing the hurting, we rejoice. But we don't want to do the hurting because we'll get hurt. Ah, there it is. You'll have a bad opinion of me. You won't like me. You'll talk against me. I don't like that. So I don't want to hurt you. My, that's a large dose of truth for one morning. All right, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you a 15-minute break when you can loiter around, and then we'll come back. I have one favor. I'll be sitting in that corner out there. Would you please leave me alone? <laughs> Life is a banquet. And the tragedy is that most people are starving to death. See, that's what I'm really talking about. It's a nice story of uh, some people on a raft off the coast of Brazil who were perishing from thirst and they had no idea that the water they were floating on was fresh water. See, the river was coming out into the sea with such force that it went on for a couple of miles. They had fresh water right there. They had no idea of it. 
So it's like we're surrounded with joy, with happiness, with love. And most people have no idea whatsoever of this. <clears throat> Reason, they're brainwashed. Reason, they're hypnotized. They're asleep. Imagine a stage magician who hypnotizes someone and this person is seeing what isn't there and not seeing what is there. That's what it's all about. Repent and accept the good news. Repent. Wake up. Not weep for your sins. What are you going to do weeping for your sins? Which you committed in the first place because you were asleep anyway. <laughs> are you going to cry because of what you did in your hypnotized state? Why do you want to identify with that guy? Wake up! Wake up! Repent! Put on a new mind. Take on a new way of looking at things. For the kingdom is here. It's the rare Christian who takes that seriously. Now I said to you, the first thing you need to wake up is to face the fact that you don't like being woken up. You'd much rather have all of these things which you were hypnotized into believing are so precious to you, so important to you, so important for your life and your survival. Second, understand understand that maybe you've got the wrong ideas and it is these ideas that are influencing your life and making it the mess that it is and keeping you asleep. Ideas about love, ideas about freedom, ideas about happiness, etc. And it isn't easy to listen to someone who would challenge those ideas of yours that have come to be so precious to you. You know, they've made some interesting studies in brainwashing. And they've proved, as I'll probably tell you later on if we have the time, that you're brainwashed when you take on, when you introject an idea that isn't yours, somebody else's idea. And the funny thing is that you'll be ready to die for it. Isn't that strange? The first test that you've been brainwashed, that you've got introjected convictions and beliefs, is that the moment they're attacked, you feel stung. You react emotionally. That's a pretty good sign, not infallible, but a pretty good sign that we're dealing with brainwashing. And you're even ready to die for an idea that never was yours, the terrorist or the saint, so-called, takes on an idea, swallows it whole, and is ready to die for it. Not easy to listen, especially when you get emotional about an idea. And even when you don't get emotional about it, not easy to listen. Because don't forget, you're listening from your programming, from your conditioning, from your hypnotic state. And you're frequently interpreting everything that's being said in terms of your hypnotic state, of your conditioning, of your programming. Like this girl who's listening to a, a lecture in agriculture and she says, excuse me, sir, you know, I agree with you completely. Best manure is old horse manure. But would you tell us how old the horse should be? <laughs> Look where she's coming from. We all have our positions, don't we? And we listen from those positions. Henry, oh, you've changed. 
You were so tall, you've grown so short. You were so well built and you've become so thin. You were so fair, you've become dark. What happened to you, Henry? The guy says, I'm not Henry. <laughs> I'm John. You changed your name to. <laughs> How'd you get this guy to listen, huh? a little exercise for you. Think. Think of all the good deeds you've done, or some of them. <laughs> because I'm only giving you a few seconds, see? <laughs> you think you'd have enough for those? <laughs> now, understand that they really sprang from self-interest, whether you knew it or not. Refined tastes, maybe. What happens to your pride? What happens to your vanity? What happens to that good feeling you gave yourself, that pat on the back, every time you did something that you thought was so charitable? It gets flattened out, doesn't it? What happens to that looking down your nose at your neighbor who you thought was so selfish. Whole thing changes, doesn't it? Well, he's got coarser tastes than you. You're the more dangerous person. You really are. Jesus Christ seems to have had less trouble with the other guy than with your type. Much less trouble. He ran into trouble with people who were really convinced they were good, you know. The other guys didn't seem to have given him much trouble at all. The guys who were openly selfish and knew it. Can you see how liberating that is? Hey, wake up! It's liberating! It's wonderful! Are you feeling depressed, maybe? Are you? <laughs> Isn't it wonderful to realize you know better than anybody else in this world? Isn't it wonderful? You're disappointed? <laughs> Look what we brought to light. Hey! Look what we brought to light. What happens to your vanity, huh? You like to give yourself a good feeling. You're better than the others. Look how we brought a Pharisee to light. You had something to say? Um, I guess I'm struggling with my resistance to wake up. <laughs> I guess I never thought self-interest in the way you're presenting it was in itself a bad thing. And I never equated it with selfishness. I mean, equated it. Hey, bad comes from you. I didn't say it's bad. Well, I said it's self-interest. You really added bad. Because self-interest to me, it, it seems like it comes right out of our instinct of self-preservation, which is our, I think, our deepest and first, so that how can we, how can, could we even want to act for selflessness that would be almost like acting for non-being? Wonderful. You're just saying we cannot be selfless. Are you saying that? Well, to me, it would seem like it would be the same thing as asking for non-being. Whatever it is, look, all I'm saying is stop feeling bad. We're all the same. It's wonderful. <laughs> Somebody had a terrible thing, a terribly beautiful thing to say about Jesus, though I promised I wouldn't get into that, but it's too tempting to get into it here. Yeah. Yeah, here, it's very tempting. He said, he said, the lovely thing about Jesus, and this guy wasn't an official Christian, he said, the lovely thing about Jesus was that he was so much at home with sinners because he understood that he wasn't one bit better than they were. We differ from others, from criminals, <coughs> only in what we do or what we don't do, but not in what we are. The only difference between Jesus, I assume, 
and those sinners was that he was awake, they weren't. You want to glory in that? Look at me, I won the lottery. I'm so proud to accept this prize. It's really a prize. For, not for me, but for my nation and my society. Does anybody talk like this when he wins the lottery? <laughs> he was lucky. He was lucky. He won the lottery. First prize. Anything to be proud of in that? I woke up. I got enlightened. And you'll gradually learn there's nothing you could do with your good luck good fortune. And if you did anything towards being enlightened, now listen to this. Almost every one of you really wants to wake up in the interest of whom? Ha ha! You want a glory in that? Look at me. I really worked for myself. What's there to glory about? Can you see how utterly stupid it is to be vain about your good deeds? The Pharisee isn't an evil man, he's a stupid man. He's stupid, he's not evil. He's stupid. Don't stop to think. Like somebody who said, I dare not stop to think, because if I did, I wouldn't know how to get started again. Anyone <laughs> can be expected to be selfish and to seek their own self-interest, whether in coarse or in refined ways. So there's nothing to be disappointed about, and there's nothing to be disillusioned about. If you had been in touch with reality all along, you would never have been disappointed. But you chose to paint people in glowing colors. You chose not to see through human beings because you chose not to see through yourself, and so you're paying the price now. Before you discuss this, let me tell you a story which I remember just now. Somebody said, what is enlightenment like? What is awakening like? It's like the tramp in London who was settling in for the night. He'd barely been able to eat a, cr a crust of bread. Then he gets onto this embankment on the River Thames, and there's a slight drizzle, so he huddles in his old, tattered cloak. And as he's about to sleep, what do you know? A Rolls Royce rolls up, chauffeur-driven, and out of that car steps a gorgeously beautiful young lady who says, my poor man, are you planning to spend the night here on this embankment? And the poor man says, yes. She says, I won't have it. You're coming to my house and you're going to spend a comfortable night and you're going to get a good dinner. So she insists on his getting into the car. They ride out of London, get into a place where she has a sprawling mansion, large grounds. They get in, they're ushered in by the butler and she hands this man over to the butler and says, James, make sure he's put in the servants' quarter, quarters and treated well, which is what James does. And when the young lady's about to go to bed, she'd undressed and was going to bed, she suddenly remembered her guest for the night, so she slips something on and goes over to the servants' quarters and pads along the corridor and sees a little chink of light where the man was apparently put up. So he hadn't gone to sleep. She taps lightly at the door and opens it and finds the man awake. And she says, what's the trouble, my good man? Uh, did you not get a good meal? He said, never had a better meal in my life, lady. Uh, are you warm enough? He says, yes, lovely warm bed. She says, maybe you, uh, you need a little company. huh? Why don't you move over a bit? And she comes close to him. He moves over and falls right into the Thames. Ah, <laughs> oh, you didn't expect that one. <laughs> Enlightenment! Enlightenment! Wake up! <laughs> you really did expect that one, huh? <laughs> See how good you are? <laughs> Wake up! When you're ready to exchange your illusions for reality, 
when you're ready to exchange your dreams for facts. Cold awakening. But that's where you find it all. That's where life finally becomes meaningful. Life becomes beautiful. Uh, it's the famous story, I don't remember where I read it, of Ramirez. Ramirez, who's old, and is living up there in his castle on top of a hill, and he looks out the window. He's in bed, really, and paralyzed. He's looking out the window, and he sees his enemy, old as he himself is, leaning on a cane, climbing up the hill, slowly, painfully. Takes him about two and a half hours to get up. And there's nothing Ramirez can do because the servants have the day off. And his enemy walks in, opens the door, comes straight to the bedroom, puts his hand inside his cloak pocket and pulls out a gun. And he says, at last, Ramirez, we're going to settle scores. And Ramirez tries his level best to talk him out of it. He says, come on, Borges, you can't do that. You know, I am no longer the man who ill-treated that youngster years ago, and you're no longer that youngster. Come off it. Oh, no, your sweet words aren't going to get me off this divine mission of mine. It's revenge I want, says Borges, and there's nothing you can do about it. And Ramirez says, there is. Oh, is there? What? I can wake up, and he did. He woke up. <laughs> That's what enlightenment is like. There's nothing you can do about it, isn't there? Of course there is. What? I can wake up. All of a sudden, life is no longer the nightmare that it has seen. Wake up. Somebody came to me with a question. What do you think the question was? Are you enlightened, says this question. <laughs> what do you think the answer was? What does it matter? You want a better answer? How would I know? Because I don't care. How do you know? And what does it matter? You know something? If you want it too badly, you're in big trouble. You know something else? If I were enlightened, and you listened to me because I was enlightened, you're in big trouble. <laughs> You ready to be brainwashed by someone who's enlightened? You could be brainwashed by anybody, you know. So does it really matter? No, it doesn't. Where you're concerned, what does it matter whether someone's enlightened or not? But see, we want to lean on someone, don't we? We want to lean on somebody who we think or we judge has arrived. We love to hear, to hear that people have arrived. It gives us hope, <laughs> doesn't it? What do you want hope for? Isn't that another form of desire? You want to hope for something better than what you have right now, don't you? Or else you wouldn't be hoping. But then you forgot that you've got it all right now and you don't know it. Why not concentrate on now instead of hoping for better times in the future? Why not understand the now instead of forgetting it and hoping for the future? Isn't that another trap? The only place someone can be of help to you is in challenging your ideas. Maybe, if you're ready to listen and you're ready to be challenged. But there's one thing 
the most important of all, and I haven't mentioned it as yet, that you could do when no one can help you. What's this most important thing of all? It's called self-observation. No one can help you there. No one can give you a method. No, can, no one can show you a technique. Because the moment you pick up a technique, you're programmed again. Self-observation, watching yourself, which is not the same as self-absorption. Self-absorption is self-preoccupation. You're concerned about yourself. You're worried about yourself. I'm talking about self-observation. What's that? It means to watch everything as far as possible in you and around you as if it were happening to someone else to watch everything in you and around you as if it were happening to someone else what does that last sentence mean? It means that you do not personalize what is happening to you. It means you look at it as if you have no connection with it whatsoever. The reason you suffer from your depressions and your anxieties is that you identify with them. You're saying, I am depressed, and that is false. You are not depressed. If you want to be accurate, you might say, I is experiencing a depression right now. But you could hardly define yourself with the verb to be and say, I am depressed. You are not your depression. But by a strange kind of trick of the mind, by a strange kind of illusion, you have deluded yourself into thinking, though you're not aware of it, that you are your depression, that you are your anxiety, that you are your joy and the thrills that you have. I am delighted. You certainly are not delighted. Delight is in you right now. But hang around. It'll change. <laughs> Won't last. Never lasts. Keeps changing. It's always changing. Clouds come and clouds go. Some of them are black. Some of them are white. Some of them are large. Others are small. And if we want to follow the analogy, this isn't philosophy now, this is just an analogy. You are the sky. You're observing them all. You're a passive, detached observer. My, that's shocking. Particularly in the Western culture. This is shocking. Passive? You're not interfering. Don't interfere. Don't fix anything. Watch. Observe. The trouble with people is they're busy fixing things they don't even understand. We're always fixing things, aren't we? Never strikes us that things don't need to be fixed. They really don't. This is the great illumination. They need to be understood. If you understood them, they change. They really would. If you understood them, you want to change the world? How about beginning with yourself? How about changing yourself? How about being transformed yourself first? How do you achieve that? Through observation, through understanding. 
with no interference, with no judgment, because what you judge, you cannot understand. My, that's a tall order, isn't it? He's a communist. Understanding has stopped at that minute. You slapped a label on him. She's a capitalist. Understanding has stopped as of that minute. You slapped a label on her. And if the label carries undertones of approval or disapproval, even worse. How are you going to understand what you disapprove of or what you approve of, for that matter. Sounds like a new world, doesn't it? Well, ready to hear something new? <laughs> no judgment, no comment, no attitude. One observes, one studies, one watches. Not even with the desire to change what is. Example, a dog trainer who's attempting to understand a dog so that he can train the dog to perform certain tricks. The scientist who observes the behavior of ants with no further end in view, he just wants to study ants and to learn as much as possible about them and he has no further aim he's not attempting to train them or to get anything out of them he's interested in ants he wants to learn as much as he can about them that's the attitude the day you attain that you will experience a miracle you will change effortlessly, correctly. Change will happen. You will not bring it about. As the light of awareness settles upon your darkness, whatever is evil will disappear. Whatever is good will be fostered. You will have to experience that for yourself. But this calls for a disciplined mind. And when I say disciplined, I'm not talking about effort. I'm talking about something else. Have you ever studied an athlete whose whole life is athletics? What a disciplined life he or she leads. And look at that river as it moves towards the sea. It creates its own banks, does it not, to contain it. And when there's something within you that moves in this direction, it creates its own discipline. The moment you get bitten by the bug of awareness, oh, that's so delightful. The most delightful thing in the world, the most important and the most delightful. Because there's nothing so important in the world as coming awake, nothing. And there's nothing so delightful as being aware. Would you rather live in darkness? Would you rather act? and not be aware of your actions, talk and not be aware of your words? <coughs> Would you rather listen to people and not be aware of what you're hearing? Or see things and not be aware of what you're looking at? The great Socrates who said, the unaware life is not worth living. But a self-evident truth but most people don't live 
aware lives. They're living mechanical lives. Mechanical thoughts, generally somebody else's. Mechanical emotions. Mechanical actions. Mechanical reactions. Want to see how mechanical you are? My, that's a lovely shirt you're wearing. I feel up. For a shirt, for heaven's sake. <laughs> you feel proud of yourself when you observe that? People come over to my center there in India and they say, what a lovely place your center is situated in. These lovely trees, for which I'm not responsible at all, and this lovely climate, and already I'm feeling good till I catch myself feeling good. Say, hey, could you imagine anything more stupid than that? I'm not responsible for those trees. I wasn't even responsible for choosing the location. I didn't order the weather. It, it, it happened. But it's mine. Me got in there, and I'm feeling good. And I'm feeling good about my culture and my nation. How stupid can you get? <laughs> I mean that. And they're saying, you know, your great Indian culture that has produced all these mystics. I didn't produce them. <laughs> I'm not responsible for it. And you know, uh, oh, that country of yours, disgusting. Look at the poverty. I'm feeling ashamed. I didn't create it. <laughs> What's going on? Ever stop to think? You know something? I think you're very charming. Oh, I feel wonderful. I got a positive stroke. That's what they call it. <laughs> I'm okay, you're okay. I'm going to write a book someday which will be entitled, I'm an ass, you're an ass. I really am. I really am. Yes, most liberating thing in the world. Wonderful. Most liberating thing in the world. Can you imagine that? When you're openly ready to admit you're an ass, it's wonderful. They say, you're wrong. I say, what could you expect of an ass? <laughs> disarmed. Everybody disarmed. We, we're coming to that. We're coming to that. We're coming to that. The final liberation. I'm an ass. You're an ass. <laughs> I press a button. You're up. I press another button. You're down. You like that? How many people you know who are unaffected by praise or blame? Totally and completely unaffected. That isn't human. Human means you've got to be a little monkey. So everybody can twist your tail and you do whatever they think you ought to be doing. Is that human? You mean you find me charming? You know what that means? It means right now you're in a good mood. That's what it means. <laughs> Generally, it also means that I fit your shopping list. Every one of us carries a shopping list around, you know. And it's like, you've got to measure up to this. Tall, mm-hmm. Dark, mm-hmm. Handsome, mm-hmm. <laughs> According to my tastes, mm-hmm. I like the sound of his voice. I'm in love. You're not in love, silly ass. <laughs> Any time you're in love, I wonder if I should say this, you're being particularly asinine. <laughs> you really are. Sit down and watch it. What's happening to you? You're running away from yourself? You want a nice good escape? As somebody said, thank God for reality and for giving us the means to escape from it. <laughs> so that's what's going on. We're so mechanical. We're so controlled. And we write books about being controlled and how wonderful it is to be controlled and how necessary to be controlled and how necessary that people would tell you that you're okay so that then you'll have a good, okay feeling about yourself, etc., etc., etc. How wonderful it is to be in prison, 
or as somebody said yesterday so rightly, to be in your cage. You like being in prison? You like being controlled? Because I'll tell you something. If you ever let yourself feel good when they tell you that you're okay, you're preparing yourself to feel bad when they tell you you're not. And secondly, you're going to be a monkey for the rest of your life because you're the whole time going to live up to their expectations. You better watch out what you wear and how you comb your hair and whether your shoes are polished and whether you live up to every D-A-M-N-E-D expectation of theirs. Every one of them. You like that? You call it human? See? See what I mean? This is what you'll discover when you observe yourself. You'll be horrified. Because the fact of the matter is that you're neither okay nor not okay. You really are not. What's okay? What's not okay? You mean you fit the current mood or trend or fashion so you become okay? Does your okayness depend on that? Does your okayness depend on what people think of you? Jesus Christ must have been pretty not okay, you know, by those standards. So, you're not okay. You're not not okay. You're you. And that, I hope, is going to be the big discovery. At least some of you, if three of you, I think you're about 220 or 30 or whatever, if three or four of you make this discovery during these four days we're going to spend together, my, what a wonderful thing, extraordinary, unprecedented. You're you. Cut out all the okay stuff and the not okay stuff. Cut out all the judgments and observe. Watch. You'll make great discoveries. Those discoveries will change you. You won't have to make the slightest effort, believe me. Here's another bombshell. <laughs> Talking about a bombshell. Reminds me about this guy in London after the war. He's sitting with a large parcel on his lap, wrapped in brown paper. Big, heavy object. And the bus conductor says to him, he says, what have you got in your lap there? And the man says, this is an unexploded bomb. We dug it out of the garden and taking it to the police station. He says, is that an unexploded bomb? And he's, the guy says, yes. You don't want to carry that on your lap, put it under the seat. <laughs> That's my story for telling what psychology and spirituality as we generally understand it does for you. You know, it transfers the bomb from your lap to under your seat. <laughs> It doesn't really solve your problems. It doesn't. It exchanges your problems for other problems. Has that, has that ever struck you? You had a problem. Now we exchange it for another one. And it's always going to be that way. Till we solve the problem called you, we're going to get nowhere. And so these great mystics and masters in the East will say, who are you? Want to know the most important question in the world? You think it is, who is Jesus Christ? Wrong. You think it is, does God exist? Wrong. You think it is, is there a life after death? Wrong. You know, it's a funny thing. Nobody seems to be grappling with the problem of, is there a life before death? <laughs> No one. No one. And my experience has been that it's precisely the ones who don't know what to do with this life who are all bothered about what they're going to do with another life. Really. That's one sign that you're awakened. You don't give a damn what's going to happen in the next life. You're not bothered about it. You don't care. You just don't care. Not interested. Period. Somebody talked about eternal life a little while ago, the gentleman there. You know what eternal life is? Whatever that is. 
you think it's everlasting life. But your own theologians will tell you that that's crazy. Because everlasting is still within time. It's time perduring forever. You got it all wrong. Eternal means timeless. No time. Whatever that means, because the human mind cannot understand that. The human mind can understand time and can deny time. But what timeless means is beyond our comprehension. Except we have, we have hints of it, don't we? And the mystics tell us that it's right now. How's that for good news? <laughs> it's right now. People get so distressed when I tell them, forget your past. So proud of your past. You're crazy. Remember? I'm an ass, you're an ass. You're crazy. What are you proud of? You're so ashamed of your past. You're crazy. Drop it. But mustn't I weep for my sins? That's past. It's dead. Drop it. Get into now. See your great religious distraction from waking up. Weep for your sins. Repent. Wake up, that's what repent means. Wake up. Understand, understand. Stop all your crying. And so the great masters tell us, the most important question in the world is, who am I? Who am I? What is I? We'll address ourselves to that question this afternoon at four o'clock. I'll begin with that, hopefully. I say hopefully because I never know what I'm going to say next, because it all depends on the mood of the group, etc. But that's so important. What is I? What is this thing I call I? What is this thing I call the self? You mean you understood everything else in the world and you didn't understand this? You mean you understood astronomy and black holes and whatever those other things are, quasars or whatever they call them, you understood that and you picked up computer science and you don't know who you are? My, you're still asleep. You're a sleeping scientist. <laughs> you mean you understood what Jesus Christ is and you don't know what you are? How do you know that you have understood? Who's this guy? Who's this woman who's doing the understanding? Found that out first? That's the foundation of everything, isn't it? And it's because we haven't understood this that you've got all these stupid religious people who are engaging in all kinds of stupid religious wars, Muslims fighting against Jews, Protestants fighting Catholics, and, and all the rest of that rubbish. They don't know who they are. Because if they did, there wouldn't be wars. Like the little girl who says to the little boy, Are you a Presbyterian? He says, no, we belong to another abomination. <laughs> so, so there it goes. It's, uh, who are you? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? We'll be dealing with that later, as I said. But what I'd like to stress right now is self-observation. You're listening to me. Are you picking up any other sounds besides the sound of my voice as you listen to me? Are you aware of your reactions as you listen to me? It's extremely important or else you're going to be brainwashed. Or else you're going to be influenced by forces within you of which you have no awareness at all. And when you're aware of how you're reacting to me, are you simultaneously aware? Now that's, that's postgraduate work, okay? Okay. Are you aware of where it's coming from? Maybe you're not listening to me at all. Maybe your daddy's listening to me. You think that's possible? Of course it is. Again and again in my therapy groups, I come across people who aren't there at all. Their daddy's there. Their mommy is there. They're not there. They never were there. 
They really want. I live now, not I. My daddy lives in me. Really. Well, that's absolutely true. Literally true. Literally true. I could take you apart and say, now this sentence, does it come from daddy, mommy, grandma, grandpa, from whom? <laughs> Reminds me of grandma and grandpa who are celebrating their wedding anniversary. They're old. It's the 60th anniversary of their wedding. And they go through all the celebrations. And they're tired. And towards the evening, the two of them are sitting alone in a room. And grandpa says to grandma, he says, you know, grandma, I'm proud of you. I really am. She says, what, what's that you said, pa? You know, I can't hear you. You know, I can't hear you without my hearing aid. Would you say that louder? He says, I said, I'm proud of you. She said, that's all right. I'm tired of you, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. So it's like, who's living in you? <laughs> it's pretty horrifying when you come to know that. You think you're free. But this probably, there probably isn't a gesture, a thought, an emotion, an attitude, a belief in you or that isn't coming from someone else. Isn't that horrible? And you don't know it. Talk about a mechanical life that was stamped into you. And you're feeling pretty strongly about certain things and you think you are feeling strongly about it. But are you really? It's going to take a lot of awareness for you to understand that maybe this thing that you call I is simply an agglomeration of your past experiences and of your conditioning and your programming. You're a human computer. That's painful. In fact, when you're beginning to awake, you experience a good deal of pain. It's painful to see your illusions being shattered and everything that you thought you had built up crumbling. That's painful. That's what repentance is all about. That's what waking up is all about. So now how about this? How about you're taking a minute right where you are, where you're sitting now, to be aware of, even as I talk, of what you're feeling in your body and what's going on in your mind. and what your emotional state is like. How about being aware of that blackboard if your eyes are open and the color of the walls? How about being aware of my face and the reaction you have to that face of mine because you have one whether you're aware of it or not. and it probably isn't yours, you were conditioned to have that kind of reaction. And how about being aware of some of the things I said? Though that isn't awareness now, that's memory, I'm cheating. But still, we're, I'm assuming you're beginners. Think of some of the things you did not like. And think of some of the things you liked. And how you reacted. Does that say anything about you? And let's make a sudden switch now. Be aware of your presence in this room. It's a sudden switch. I'm in this room. It's as if you were outside yourself, looking at yourself, sitting here, as if you're looking at someone else. Do you notice the slightly different feeling? Later we'll ask, who's this person who's doing the looking? I am looking at me. What's I? 
fuck me. Could but for the time being, it's enough that I would be watching me. And if you're tending to condemn yourself, or to approve of yourself, don't stop the condemnation now. Don't stop the judgment. Don't stop the approval. Just watch it. I'm condemning me. I'm disapproving. Or I'm approving. Just look at it. Don't try to fix it. Don't say, oh, we were told not to do this. No, just observe what's going on. As I said to you before, self-observation means watching, observing whatever is going on in you and around you as if it were happening to someone else. Ever hear what happened to the hippopotamus who swallowed a Jewish rabbi a no. Protestant minister and a Catholic priest? No. Why he had an ecumenical movement? That's what happened. <laughs> Let's continue from where we left off this morning. I'm sure lots of you will have questions. I propose we leave them for a little later. Because once I've spoken about two or three other topics, maybe some of the things you were going, you were planning to ask me about will get clarified. So, I suggest that before I take up the next topic, you do the following. Would you write down on a piece of paper any adjectives that you would use to describe yourself? <laughs> any adjectives? Businessman, priest, human being, Catholic, Jew, anything. Well, or any labels like businessman, etc. Anything. Adjectives or nouns that you would use to describe yourself. You're in for a big surprise. You really are. So uh, write those down. You're really going to enjoy this. Now let's have a few samples, one from each person, just a few samples, you know. Anyone, what was that? Prognosticative. 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 <laughs> she planned this one. <laughs> okay, any others? Fruitful. Searching pilgrim. Searching pilgrim. Competent. Alive. Alive. Impatient. Impatient. Centered. Flexible. Flexible. Lover. What was that? Reconciler. Reconciler. Lover. Lover. A member of the human race. Member of the human race. Sure. Overly structured. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. That's a pretty good introduction for what we're going to get into right now. Remember I said to you this morning, that you would derive immense profit from self-observation, observing yourself, remember? As if you were watching another person. Observing everything in you and around you. Now let's take a look at that phenomenon. We're going to get right into whatever you want to call it. Philosophy, mysticism, spirituality, you name it. The name doesn't matter. Here you've got I observing me. Now this is an interesting phenomenon which has never ceased to cause wonder to philosophers mystics, scientists, psychologists, I can observe 
me. It would seem that the animals are not able to do this. It would seem that one needs a certain amount of intelligence to be able to do this. Self-consciousness. Now I'm warning you, what I'm going to give you now is not metaphysics, it is not philosophy, it's plain observation, plain common sense. Maybe we'll come back to the philosophy of it later on. But watch this. When I observes me, I looking at me, remember I told you this morning many of these great mystics of the East would say, who are you? Who am I? Who is I? They're really referring to that I, not to the me. And let's suppose that I were to observe me observing me. Have you noticed this has become me now? Who's this guy? Search for the I. That's what they're saying. Who's I? And no matter how far back you go, you're always going to have to search for I. What is I? Who is I? Ever thought of that? We've been given all kinds of answers, or we've taken all kinds of answers for granted, but never stopped, probably, to analyze or to find out for ourselves who I is, or what I is. As a matter of fact, some of these mystics will tell you that we first begin with things, with awareness of things. Then we move on to awareness of thoughts. Me. And finally, to awareness of the thinker. Things, thoughts, thinker. What we're really searching for is the thinker. Can the thinker know himself? Can I know what I is? Some of these mystics reply, can the knife cut itself? Can the tooth bite itself? Can the eye, E-Y-E, see itself? Can the eye know itself? But this we will have to leave for later. I am concerned with something infinitely more practical right now, and that is with deciding what the I is not. And I'll go as slowly as possible because it's important that you follow every step here because the consequences are devastating. <laughs> Terrific or terrifying depending on your point of view. You've got the seed of liberation here. Now listen to this. Am I my thoughts? Is I the thoughts that I am thinking? No. Thoughts come and go. I am not my thoughts. Is that clear? Yes. How about my body? Am I my body? They tell us that the cells of our body keep getting changed and renewed, millions of them every minute, so that at the end of about seven years, you don't have a single living cell in your body which was there seven years previously. 
they're always changing. Cells come and go. Cells arise and die. I seems to persist. So am I my body? Evidently no. I is something other and more than the body. You might say the body is part of I, but it's a changing part. It keeps moving, it keeps changing. We have the same name for it, but it's constantly changing. Just as we have the same name for Niagara Falls. But Niagara Falls is constituted by the water, which is constantly changing. Same name for an ever-changing reality. I seems to continue even though the body cells are changing. How about my name? Is I my name? Evidently not, because I could change my name. I don't change the I when I change my name. How about my career? How about my belief? I am a Catholic. I am a Jew. Is that an essential part of I when I move from one religion to another? Has I changed? And let's suppose I get back to my original religion. Has I changed? Do I have a new eye, or is it the same eye that has changed? In other words, is my name an essential part of me, of the eye? Is my religion an essential part of the eye? Remember I told you this morning about the little boy who says to the little girl, are you a Presbyterian, remember? Somebody told me one about someone in, in Belfast. Paddy was walking down the streets and he finds there's a gun there at the back of his head, pressing against the back of his head, and a voice says, Are you Catholic or Protestant? Well, Paddy had to do some pretty fast thinking. He said, I'm a Jew. <laughs> And he hears the voice say, I've got to be the luckiest Arab in the whole of Belfast. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how important labels are for us? They're so important. I am a Democrat. I am a Republican. Are you really now? You mean when you switch parties, do you have a new I? Or is it the same old I with new political convictions? Remember hearing about the guy who says to his friend, he says, Hey Tom, are you planning to vote Democrat in the next elections? He says, no, I'm planning, or rather, are you planning to vote Republican? The guy says, no, I'm planning to vote Democrat. Why? Because my father was a Democrat, my grandfather was a Democrat, my great-grandfather was a Democrat, so I'm voting Democrat. And the other guy says, that's crazy logic, Paddy. I mean, now let's put it this way. If your father was a horse thief, and your grandfather was a horse thief, and your great-grandfather was a horse thief, what would you be? He said, well, then I'd be a Republican. <laughs> so labels, 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 labels. So where does that get you? And we spend so much of our lives, don't we, reacting to labels, our own and others, identifying the label with the eye. Talking about Catholics and Protestants, did you hear one, the one about the guy who comes in and says, Father, 
I want you to say a mass for my dog. Father's indignant. He's outraged. What do you mean say a mass for your dog? He says, you know my dog, my pet dog. I love that dog. I'd like you to, to offer a mass for him. Father says, we don't offer masses for dogs, for animals here. You may try the, uh, the denomination lower down the street. Ask them. They might have a service for you. And the guy, as he's moving away, he says, too bad. I really love that dog. I was planning to offer a million dollars and stipend for that uh, mass. Uh, Father says, oh, wait a minute. You never told me your dog was Catholic. <laughs> he was, uh, when you're caught up in labels, what value do these labels have when applied to I? That's an interesting question. I'll invite you to think about it later, to discuss it. Could we say that I is none of the labels that we attach to it? That these labels belong to me? That what is constantly changing is me. Does the observer ever change? Why bother? The fact is that no matter what labels you can think of, except perhaps human being, you apply them to me. I is none of these things. So when you step out of yourself and observe me, when you step out of yourself and no longer observe, and sorry, and no longer identify with me, you learn all kinds of interesting things. For instance, suffering. Suffering exists in me and when you identify with me. Anytime you identify, anytime I identifies with anything or person outside of itself, or it identifies with me, Suffering begins. Now comes fear. Now comes desire. Now comes a threat. The I begins to feel threatened. When I does not identify with money or name or nationality, or persons, or friends, or any quality, the I is not threatened. Can be very active, as I will show you later on, but it isn't threatened. Everybody think of a time, or think of some suffering that you have right now. Anything that's causing you pain, or worry, or anxiety. Think of that. First, can you pick up the desire under that suffering? There's something you desire very keenly or you wouldn't be suffering. What is it? Second, that isn't just an ordinary desire, that's a craving. Worse, there's an identification there. You have somehow said to yourself, the well-being of I, almost the existence of I, is tied up with this desire. How true is it that all suffering is caused by my identifying myself with something? Whether that something is within me 
or outside of me. And when it is outside of me, whether it is a thing or a person. Talk about it for a couple of minutes, then let's see if we can get some reactions from you. Okay. How about some reactions? Yes. Well, I want to share with you something wonderful that happened to me. I saw your movies, and I was at work shortly after that, and I was really having trouble with three people. And I said, all right, just like I learned in the movie, I'm going to come outside myself. And for a couple hours, I just got all my feelings together about how bad I felt about these three people. And I said, well, I really hate those people. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was honest. I got it all together. And uh, I said, well, Jesus, now what can you do about that? <laughs> and um, a little while later, I started to cry because I realized that Jesus died for those people. And they couldn't help how they were. Mm -hmm. And that afternoon, I had to go in the office. And I spoke to those people. And I told them why I was right and what my problem was. And they agreed with me. Because I wasn't mad at them. And I didn't hate them anymore. Okay, that's wonderful. We'll go a little deeper into that later, shall we? Okay. About the negative feelings we have towards others. Any time you have a negative feeling towards anyone, you're living in an illusion. There's something seriously wrong with you, as you discovered. You're not seeing reality. Something inside of you has to change. But what do we generally do when we have a negative feeling? We're saying, he is to blame. She is to blame. She's got to change. Oh, no, 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 no. The world's all right. The one who has to change is you. But we'll have much more to say about that later. Any other reaction? Yes. Uh, I did work at an institution and I was trying to get some kind of an example of what you meant when you said that if I identified any quality in me, that could be gained. And uh, if we had a staff meeting and someone says the pool stinks, normally the dietitian will go into order. <laughs> so my question is, does that relate to what you're saying? In other words, if we didn't take it personally, the pool could change. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, uh, yes. You know, she's identified with this, and she's saying, anyone who attacks the food is attacking me. I feel threatened, but I is never threatened. It's only me that is threatened. Yes? Supposing you're, you're witnessing some out of out injustice or something that is obvious to an objective speaking wrong. Now, would it not be a proper reaction to say this cannot be happening or to be somehow want to involve yourself in, in correcting this wrong? It may not be simply that I feel bad about the situation, but the situation is objectively wrong. Someone's injuring a child with abuse going on, etc. Um, how about that kind of thing? That, and that's now, did you assume that I was saying that you wouldn't do anything? I said you wouldn't have negative feelings, as a result of which you'd be much more effective. Because when the negative feelings come in, you go blind. Me steps into the picture. And everything gets fouled up. And frequently, we had a problem on our hand before. Now we have two problems. But that's a very good question, because I'll have to come back to that again. Don't assume, I'm glad you brought that out, because a lot of people might assume that not having negative feelings of anger and resentment and hate would mean that you do nothing about a situation. Oh, no, 
Oh no. You're not affected emotionally, but you are actionally, if that makes any sense. You spring into action. You become very sensitive to things and people around you. What kills the sensitivity is this. What many people would call the conditioned self. When you identify with me, there's too much of you in it for you to see things objectively, to see things detachedly. And it's very important that when you swing into action, you be able to see things detachedly. But when negative emotions get in, you can no longer do that. So that was a very good uh, question. Yes. You had a question, John. I'm just wondering if there's um, an area before something becomes an attach, or before it becomes an um, identification, like a, a friend dies. It seems to me that it's human to feel something about that, a sadness. But it becomes an identification when it gets in the way of my becoming less free. But I think there ought to be some type of reaction to my friend's death. All right. It seems that there ought to be some kind of reaction to my friend's death. Self-pity? What would you be grieving about? Think about this, everybody. What are you grieving about? What I'm saying is going to sound terrible. I told you I'm coming from another world. <coughs> Personal loss, right? Feeling sorry for me? All right. You mean you're feeling sorry for other people who are feeling sorry for themselves? <laughs> or they're not feeling sorry for themselves? Then what would I be feeling sorry for? What we call grief. Do we ever feel grief when we lose something that we have allowed to be free? that we have never attempted to possess and we have never allowed ourselves to be attached to. Meaning. What does it mean to be attached? Meaning. I made my happiness depend on this thing or this person, at least to some extent. We're so accustomed to this that to hear the opposite sounds inhuman, doesn't it? I'm not saying that me, the conditioned self, will not sometimes fall into this, because that's the way we have been conditioned. But is it conceivable that you would live a life where you would be so totally alone that you would depend on no one. Please try to understand this. We all depend on one another, don't we, for all kinds of things. We depend on the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker. Interdependence, that's fine. We set up society and we organize society in this way. We allot different functions to different people for the welfare of everyone so that we will function better and live more effectively, hopefully. But to depend on another psychologically, to depend on another emotionally, what does that mean? That means to depend on another human being for my happiness. Think about that. Because if you do, the next thing you will be doing, whether you're aware of it or not, is you will be demanding that that person contribute to your happiness. Next step, 
fear, fear of loss, fear of alienation, fear of rejection, mutual control, perfect love casts out fear. Where there is love, there are no demands, there are no expectations, there is no dependency. I do not demand that you make me happy. My happiness does not lie in you. If you were to leave me, I will not feel sorry for myself. I enjoy your company immensely, but I do not cling. I enjoy it on a non-clinging basis. What I really enjoy is not you. It's something that's greater bo than both you and me. It is something that I discovered, a kind of a symphony, a kind of an orchestra that plays. And on the occasion of your presence, it plays one melody. And when you depart, the orchestra doesn't stop. On the occasion of meeting someone else, it plays another melody, which is also very delightful. And when I'm alone, it continues to play. A great repertoire there never ceases to play. That's what awaking is all about. That's why when we're hypnotized, we're brainwashed, we're asleep, it seems so terrifying. But can you be said to love me if you cling to me and will not let me go or will not let me be? Can you be said to love me if you need me? psychologically, emotionally, for your happiness. My, you've got lots to reflect on there, don't you? But you know something? This is the universal teaching of all the scriptures, of all religions, and of all the mystics. How come we missed it? How come I missed it for so many years? I say to myself repeatedly. How come I didn't see it? When you read those radical things, in the scriptures, my, you begin to wonder, is this man crazy? After a while you begin to think, is everybody else crazy? Unless you hate your father and mother, brothers and sisters, unless you renounce and give up everything you possess, you cannot be my disciple. You've got to drop it all. Not physical renunciation, you understand. That's easy. It's seeing through the delusion. That's easy too. And they drop. The delusions drop. You're in touch with reality at last. And believe me, you will never again be lonely. Never again. You have found it. Loneliness is not cured by human company. Loneliness is cured by contact with reality. Oh, I have so much to say about that. Contact with reality. Dropping one's illusions. Making contact with the real, whatever that is. It has no name. We can only know it through dropping the unreal. You can only know what aloneness is 
When you drop your clinging, when you drop your dependency. But the first step towards that is that you would even see this as desirable. Because if you don't even see it as desirable, how will you get anywhere near it? And think, that loneliness of yours, will human company ever take it away? Or will it only serve as a distraction? There's an emptiness inside, isn't there? And when the emptiness surfaces, what do you do? You run away. Turn on the TV. Turn on the radio. Read a book. Search for human company. Seek entertainment. Seek distraction. Everybody's doing that. Big business nowadays an organized industry, entertainment, distract us, entertain us, observe yourself. That's why I said to you this morning, self-observation is so delightful, such an extraordinary thing. After a while, you don't have to make an effort because as illusion begins to crumble and you begin to know this thing that cannot be described called happiness, everything changes. You become addicted to awareness. Awareness, awareness, awareness. There's a story of the disciple or a traveler who goes to the master and he says, could you give me a word of wisdom? Could you tell me something that would guide me through my days? It was the master's day of silence. So he picked a pad and wrote one word on the pad. He said, awareness, and gave it to the traveler. When the traveler saw that, he said, but this is too brief. Could you expand on it a bit? And the master took the pad back pleasantly and wrote, awareness, awareness, awareness. <laughs> he said, yes, but what does it mean? And the master took the pad back and wrote, awareness, awareness, awareness means awareness. <laughs> That's what it means. Watch yourself. I told you this morning, no one can show you how to do it because he would be giving you a technique. He'd be programming you. But watch yourself. You had a reaction this morning when you were talking to someone. Were you aware of it? Were you not identifying with it? You got angry with somebody. Were you aware that you were angry? And were you not identifying with your anger? And later when you had the time, did you study it? Did you attempt to understand it? Where did it come from? What brought it on? I don't know of any other means of transformation than awareness. I don't know of any other. If any of you cover some other method of self-transformation, I'd be very happy to hear it from you. But I don't know of any other. You only change what you understand. What you do not understand and are not aware of, you repress. You don't change. Just gets repressed. But when you understand it, it changes. When you become aware of it, it changes. My, that was a pretty lengthy discourse, wasn't it? You seem a bit stunned, are you? <laughs> Why don't we give you a five-minute break to stand up and stretch, and then we we'll continue. Gee, I, I really knocked you all out, didn't I? <laughs> yes. I just want to know, you said, going in awareness is a gradual thing, or is it aware of kind of I don't know how much help this is going to be, but it's both kind of things. <laughs> it is. There's some lucky people 
He'll see it in a flash. And as far as I know, there is no known means of acquiring this. How do you get it? I, I don't know. You just become aware. There are others who keep growing into it, slowly, gradually, increasingly, they see things. Illusions begin to drop off. Fantasies begin to be peeled away and they get in touch with facts. So there's no general rule really. There's this famous story of the lion who once pounced upon a flock of sheep and to his amazement he found a lion among them. It was a lion who had been brought up by the sheep ever since he was a cub and he would be bleating like the sheep and uh, running around and the lion went straight for him and when this sheep lion stood in front of the real one he trembled in every limb and the lion said to him what are you doing among sheep here and the lion said I am a sheep he said oh no you're not you're coming with me and he got hold of him and took him to a pool and he said look and when the lion who thought he was a sheep looked at his reflection in the water in that minute he was transformed was never the same again if you're lucky if the gods are gracious if you are gifted with divine grace use any theological expression you want you might suddenly understand who I is and you'll never be the same again. Never, ever. And that's where you'll dwell. And nothing will ever be able to touch you again. And no one will ever be able to hurt you again. And you will fear no one. And you will fear nothing. Isn't that extraordinary? You live like a king, like a queen. This is what it means to live like royalty, not the rubbish where you get your pictures in the, in the newspapers and where you, you've got a lot of money, but a lot of rot and you're as terrified and confused as everyone else and you're trying to hide it. When you fear no one because you fear losing nothing. When you fear no one because you're perfectly content to be nobody. Who wants to be somebody here? What's the use of it all? You don't give a damn. It doesn't matter. Success, failure, means nothing. Honor, disgrace, nothing. You make a fool of yourself, means nothing. My, is that a wonderful state to be in? Now some people arrive at this painstakingly, step by step, through months and weeks of self-awareness. But I promise you one thing, I've not known of one person who would give time to being aware, who wouldn't see the difference in a matter of weeks. Already the quality of your living is changing. You don't have to take it on faith anymore. You're seeing it. You're different. You react differently. In fact, you're reacting less and you're acting more. You see things you've never seen before. You're much more energetic, much more alive. People think that if they had no cravings, they'd be like dead wood. You know what would happen to you? You'd lose your attention. Your fear of failure, your tension about succeeding, and you'd be yourself, relaxed. You wouldn't be driving with your brakes on. That's what would happen. There's a lovely saying of Chuang Tzu that I took the trouble, great Chinese sage Chuang Tzu, that I took the trouble to learn by heart. Hope I remember it, but if we fail, it's all right. <laughs> it says, when the archer shoots for nothing, he has all his skill. When he shoots for a brass buckle, he is already nervous. When he shoots for a prize of gold, he goes blind. 
sees two targets. He is out of his mind. His skill has not changed, but the prize divides him. He cares. He thinks more of winning than of shooting. And the need to win drains him of power. Isn't that lovely? Isn't that an image of what most people are? When the archer shoots for nothing, he has all his skill. When you're living for nothing, you've got all your skill, you've got all your energy available to you. You're relaxed. You don't care. It doesn't matter whether you win or lose. Now there's human living for you. That's what life is all about. That can only come from awareness. And in awareness, as I shall explain as we go along, you will understand that honor doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't. It's a social convention. That's all. And so the prophets didn't bother one bit about it. Honor, disgrace, meant nothing to them. They were living in another world, in the world of the awakened. Success, failure, meant nothing to them. Kind of I'm an ass, you're an ass, so where's the problem? <laughs> Somebody said, I think it was a man called Sidney Harris. I recollect reading, uh, he said, the three most difficult things that a human being can do are not physical feats or intellectual achie uh, achievements. They are, first, Returning love for hate. Second, including the excluded. And third, admitting that you are wrong. My, easy as pie, easiest thing in the world, easiest thing in the world. If you haven't identified with me, what's the problem? Yeah, I'm wrong. If you knew me better, my God, you'd see how often I'm wrong. What would you expect from an ass? <laughs> but I haven't identified with him, see? I is not this. So you cannot hurt me. Can you imagine that? Initially, oh, the old condition me will react, and you'll be depressed, and you'll be anxious, and you will grieve, and you will cry, etc. Before enlightenment, I used to be depressed. After enlightenment, I continue to be depressed. <laughs> but there's a difference. I don't identify with it anymore. You know what a big difference that is? Do you know what it means? I'll say this slowly. Do you know what it means to step outside of yourself and look at that depression and not identify with it? and not do a thing to make it go away and to be perfectly willing to go on with your life while it passes through you and disappears. My, if you don't know what that means, you really have something to look forward to. And the anxiety, there it comes. And you're not troubled, how strange. You're anxious and you're not troubled? Isn't that strange? Isn't that a paradox? And you're willing to let this cloud come in because the more you fight it, the more power you give it. And you're willing to observe it as it passes by. Do you know something? You can be happy in your anxiety. Isn't that crazy? And you can be happy in your depression, it's just that you got the wrong notion of happiness. 
You thought happiness was excitement. You thought happiness was thrills. You know something? That's what causes the depressions. Didn't anyone tell you that? You're thrilled. All right, you're preparing the way for your next depression. You're thrilled. Have you picked up the anxiety behind that? How could I make that last? Somebody said that yesterday evening. How can I make it last? That's not happiness. That's thrills. That's kicks. That's addiction. That's drugs. Talk about the drug addict. My, I've got something to show you. I wonder how many non-addicts there are in this hall tonight. If you're anything like the average group, very few, very few. Don't look superiorly down your nose at the alcoholic and the drug addict. Maybe you're just as addicted as he or she is. The first time, my, I'm becoming personal. The first time I got a glimpse of this world, it was terrifying. Terrifying. To understand what it meant to live alone. To have nowhere to rest your head, but nowhere. To leave everyone free and to be free yourself. To be special to no one. To love everyone. Because love does that. It shines on good and bad alike. And it makes its rain to fall on saints and sinners alike. No difference. It doesn't depend on an object to exist. You don't pull it out. It's there, available. Like the rose. Is it possible for the rose to say, I will give my fragrance to the good people who smell me, and I will withhold it from the bad? Or like a lamp, is it possible for the lamp to say, I shall give my light to the good people in this room, and withhold my light from the evil people? Or like a tree, can a tree say, I'll give my shade to the good people who rest in my shade and withhold my shade from the bad? There are images of what love is all about. But I told you, we don't really know what love is. But it's right there staring us in the face in the scriptures. We never cared to see it because we were so drowned in what our culture calls love in its love songs and its poems. That isn't love at all. That's the opposite of love. That's desire. That's control. That's possessiveness. That's manipulation. That's fear. That's anxiety. That's not love. And we were told that happiness lies in thrills. It's so painful. It really is so painful to watch those commercials. Happiness is a smooth complexion, <laughs> a holiday resort. But you know that already. You know that already, or you wouldn't be here. You know it isn't these things. But then we have other subtle ways of m making our happiness depend on other things, both within us and outside of us. I refuse to be happy until my neurosis goes. How about that one? I got good news for you. You can be happy right now with the neurosis. Yes, sir. You want even better news? There's only one reason why you are not experiencing what in India we call anand. We have a special word for happiness, for this kind of happiness. It's called anand, bliss. Bliss. There's only one reason why you are not experiencing bliss. This present 
moment. And it is because you're thinking or you're focusing on what you don't have. Or else you would experience bliss. You're focusing on what you don't have. Right now, you have everything you need to be in happiness, bliss, anand, right now. <coughs> Jesus was talking horse sense. He was talking to lay people, to married people, to third world people, to starving people, to poor people. He's telling them, good news, it's yours for the taking. Ready for it? Here goes. But who listened? No one's interested. They'd rather be asleep. Let's have a little interaction. It's going to pop out of me. All right. I think there's only two things in the world, God and fear. All right. Only two things in the world, God and fear, love and fear. But only two things. There's only one evil in the world, fear. There's only one good in the world, love. It's sometimes called by other names. It's sometimes called happiness. It's sometimes called freedom, or peace, or joy, or God, or whatever. But the label doesn't matter really. And there's not a single evil in the world that you cannot trace to fear. Not a one. Not one. Ignorance and fear. Ignorance caused by fear. That's where all the evil comes from. That's where your violence comes from. The person who is truly non-violent, who is incapable of violence, is the person who is fearless. It's only when you're afraid that you become angry. Have you ever thought of that? Think of the last time you were angry. Go ahead. Think of the last time you were angry. Search for the fear behind that. What were you afraid of losing? What were you afraid was being taken away from you? That's where the anger comes from. Think of an angry person, maybe someone you're afraid of. Can you see how frightened he or she is? He's really frightened. He really is. She's really frightened. Or she wouldn't be angry. How true. Ultimately, there are only two things. Love and fear. But my, I've gone far ahead of what I was planning to do. But I'd rather leave it like this. I'd rather leave it unstructured and move from one thing to another and keep returning to themes again and again because that's the way to really to grasp what I'm saying maybe because what when it doesn't hit you the first time, it might the second time. And what doesn't hit one person might hit another. So I've got different themes, but they're all about the same thing. Call it awareness, call it love, call it spirituality, or freedom, or awakening, or whatever. It really is the same thing. So to summarize what I said this afternoon, as you begin to observe yourself, self-observation, watching everything inside of you and outside, oh, I'm going to have a lot to say about that too, outside, the trees, the stars, the traffic, the faces of friends, the people you're living with, dried leaves, the birds, a pile of stones, water, anything, anything. Observe. 
watch. You might suddenly stumble upon a whole world you had never seen. And you'd say, God, I've been, I've been here all along. How come I never saw this? To watch everything inside of you and outside. And when there's something happening to you, to see it as if it were happening to someone else. With no comment, no judgment, no attitude, no interference, no attempt to change, only to understand, only to understand. Now as you do this, you will begin to realize that increasingly you are disidentifying from me. St. Teresa of Avila says that towards the end of her life, God gave her this extraordinary grace. She doesn't use this modern expression, of course, but that's what it really boils down to, of disidentifying from herself. Extraordinary liberation at last. You know how it is? Uh, John Smith has cancer. I don't know John Smith. John Smith is in me. So I'm not that, all that affected. If I have love and sensitivity, maybe I'll help. But I'm not all that affected emotionally. You have an examination. I'm not all that affected. I can be quite philosophical about it. And I'll say, well, the more you worry about it, the worse it's going to get. Why don't you take a good break? But when it comes my turn to have an examination, well, that's something else, isn't it? Because I've identified with me. I identify with my family, my country, my possessions, my body, me. How would it be if I had a grace, if God gave me the grace, that I wouldn't call these things my? That isn't I at all. I'd be detached. I'd be disidentified. That's what it means to lose the self. To deny the self. To die to self. To the ego. To me. To be objective about it. To be disidentified and detached from it. Now as you begin to practice this, you could try it tonight you know, don't, it's not a matter of nerves now or muscles, of tightening your muscles, but as you move around, if you can be aware of what you're doing, if you can be aware of what you're saying, if you can be aware of how you are reacting, what a difference. It won't be long before you notice the effect. It's sad to think that human beings would go through life with fixed ideas, programming, and they never change. And they're not aware. They're just not aware of what's going on. Very religious people, some of them, but no awareness. I really meant that. You might as well have been a block of wood. You might as well have been a rock. Really. A talking, walking, thinking. Machine, computer, that's not human. Puppet, jerked around by all kinds of things. Press a button, you'll get the reaction. I told you that yesterday. You could almost predict to the nth degree how a human being is going to react. Just study the person, oh, for a day, and I'll tell you exactly how he or she is going to react. I sometimes write it on a piece of paper for my therapy group and say, so-and-so is going to start the session. So-and-so will reply, there are the machines, true to plan, go on. That's painful. They're not aware. And don't listen to the people who say to you, forget yourself, go out in love to others. Don't listen to them. They're all wrong. The worst thing you can do is to forget yourself 
when you go out to others. Go out in your so-called helping attitude. You know, this was brought home to me very forcefully many years ago when I did my studies in Chicago in psychology. We had a course in counseling for priests. It was only open to priests who were actually engaged in counseling and who agreed to bring a tape to class. So we did that. Well, must have been about 20 of us. When it was my turn, I brought a cassette, a tape, to class that uh, had engraved on it, uh, impressed on it, an interview that I had with a young woman. Well, uh, I took it to class. The instructor put it in a tape recorder, and we all began to hear it. After five minutes, as was his custom, the instructor stopped the tape. He said, any comments? Someone said to me, why did you ask her that question? I said, I'm not aware that I asked any question. As a matter of fact, I'm quite sure I did not ask any question. He said, oh, no, you did. See, I was quite sure because, because I was consciously following the method of Carl Rogers, person-oriented, non-directive. You don't ask questions. You don't interrupt. You don't uh, give advice, etc. So I was very aware that I mustn't ask questions. All right, there was a bit of a dispute between the two of us, and the instructor said, why don't we play that again? So we played that again and heard it. And there, to my, to my horror, <laughs> was a whopping big question, as tall as the Empire State Building. A huge question, you couldn't miss it. Now, you know, the interesting thing was that I had heard that question three times. The first time, presumably, when I asked it. The second time, when I listened to the tape in my room because I wanted to take a good tape to the to class, see? And the third time, when I heard it in the room, in the classroom, but it hadn't registered. I wasn't aware. That happens frequently in my therapy sessions or direction, spiritual direction sessions or whatever. We tape the interview. We record it. And again and again and again, when the client listens to it, he or she says, you know, I, I didn't really hear what you said in the interview. I only heard it when I listened to the tape. More interestingly, I didn't really hear what I said. In the, uh, when we had the interview, I only had, look what I said. Somewhat humiliatingly, I sometimes discover what I said when I'm listening to the tape with her. That's shocking. It's shocking to discover that I'm saying things. I'm saying things, for heaven's sake, in a therapy session that I'm not aware of. the full import of which only dawns on me later. You call that human? Forget yourself and go out to others? Well, I had an even more shattering experience that morning because when we listened to the whole tape, the instructor said, any comments? One of the priests, a 50-year-old man, whom I took a liking to, he'd sit in one corner of the room smoking his pipe. He said to me, Tony, I'd like to ask you a personal question. Would that be all right? I said, yeah, go ahead. If I don't want to answer it, I won't. What's the personal question? He said, this woman you're interviewing, is she pretty? <laughs> now, you know, honest to goodness, I was at a stage of my development or undevelopment, or whatever you want to call it, where I really didn't notice if someone was good looking or not. I really didn't. It didn't matter. I mean, she was a sheep of the flock of Christ. I was the pastor. I sort of... <laughs> I dispensed help. Yes, I mean, it did say great. That's the way we were trained, the good old training. Ha ha. They... So I said to, her, said to him, what has that got to do with it, whether she's pretty or not? He said, you don't like her, do you? What? You don't like her, do you? Well, hadn't ever struck me that I liked or disliked people or... Mostly, occasional powerful likes 
and dislikes would register in consciousness, but the other ones wouldn't. You know, it was mostly neutral. I said, what makes you say that? He says, the tape. I said, uh, you mean you get that from the interview? He said, yes, would you like me to show you? That? I said, yes, I'd be happy to. He, and he, we went through that tape again, and he said, listen to your voice here, how sweet it has become. You're irritated, aren't you? <laughs> I was. I was only becoming aware of it right there. And look what you're doing here, non-directively for heaven's sake. You know what I was saying to her? I was saying, don't come back, but I wasn't aware of it. And he said, she's a woman, she'll have picked this up. <laughs> they say women have a sixth sense. Yes. Remember the guy who's supposed to have had a sixth sense, but he lacked all the other five? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So he said, you're saying, don't come back, don't come back. He said, when are you supposed to meet her next? I said, well, next Wednesday. He said, my guess is she won't come back. She didn't. She didn't. I waited for one week, she didn't come. Waited for another Wednesday, she didn't come. Then I called her. I broke one of my rules. I called her. Generally, don't. Let them take the initiative. Don't be a rescuer. But I said to her, you remember that tape you allowed me to, uh, to make for the class? Uh, and she said, yes. I said, you know, it was a great help because they pointed out all kinds of things to me. I didn't tell her what. Uh, that would help me to be more effective. So if you'd care to come back, you're free to. I think I'd be somewhat more effective. She said, all right, I'll come back. She did. The dislike was still there. I hadn't gone away, but it wasn't coming in the way. That's important. What you are aware of, you are in control of. What you are not aware of is in control of you. You are always a slave to what you're not aware of. When you're aware of it, you're free from it. It's there, but you're not affected by it. You're not controlled by it. You're not enslaved by it. That's the difference. Awareness. Awareness, awareness, awareness. What they trained us to do at that uh, course was to become participant observers. Like, I'd be talking to you, uh, to put it somewhat graphically, I'd be talking to you, and I'd be here talking to you, and I'd be out there watching you and watching me. When I'm listening to you, it is infinitely more important for me to listen to me than to listen to you. See if you could get that one. When I'm listening to you, it's infinitely more important for me to listen to me than to listen to you. Of course it's important to listen to you, but it's even more important that I be listening to me. Or else I won't be hearing you. Or else I'll be distorting everything you say. Or else I'll be coming at you from my own conditioning or else I'll be reacting to you in all kinds of ways from my insecurities, from my need to manipulate you, from my desire to succeed, from my irritations and feelings that I may not be aware of. So it's frightfully important that I be listening to me when I'm listening to you. That's what they were training us to do, it was a training in awareness. And as I shall tell you this morning, how important it is that you be listening to yourself, observing yourself, watching yourself constantly as you react to life and to people, to the world. So important. How does one do this? Does one do this consciously? You know, I said to you, observe yourself the way you would be observing someone else. That needs a little explanation. You don't always have to imagine yourself hovering up, up somewhere there in the air, 
looking at yourself, no, no, no. You know, to give you an idea, a rough idea of what I'm talking about, imagine a good driver is driving a car. He's concentrating on what you're saying. In fact, he's having an argument with you. That's how much he's concentrating. But he's perfectly aware of all the road signals. And the moment anything untoward happens, the moment there's any untoward sound or noise or bump, he hears it at once. He says, you sure you closed that door the back there? How did he get that? He was aware. He was alert. The focus of his attention, his attention, was on the conversation, on the argument. But his awareness was more diffuse. He was taking in all kinds of things. What I'm advocating here is not concentration. That's not important. Lots of meditative techniques inculcate concentration. I'm wary of those things. They involve violence and they frequently involve further programming and conditioning. What I would advocate is awareness, which is not the same as concentration at all. Concentration is a spotlight. Awareness, floodlight. You're open to anything that comes within the scope of your consciousness. Big difference. So when you're practicing awareness, you're never distracted. You may go to sleep. Go to sleep even though you're awake, which means you may turn off the awareness. Then you're asleep, even though you're talking and reading, etc. But when the awareness is turned on, there's never any distraction because you're always aware of whatever, whatever your, the focus of your attention happens to be. Like now I'm looking at those trees. Now I'm worrying. Was I distracted? You would have been distracted only if you were meant to concentrate on the trees. But if you're, you're aware that you're worried, that isn't a distraction at all. Just be aware of where the focus of your attention goes. And above all, if you're practicing this, even to a limited degree, you will develop an extraordinary skill. When anything goes awry, or anything untoward happens, you'll be alerted at once. Something's going wrong. The moment any negative feeling comes into consciousness, you'll be alerted. Something going wrong. And you'll give it to your attention. Something like the driver of the car. Awareness, awareness, awareness. Now, I told you that as you begin to practice self-observation, you will see yourself that you are observing you. I am observing me. Now that's a strange phenomenon. I observing me. Remember I told you yesterday, St. Teresa of Avila would say that God gave her the grace of disidentifying herself from herself. You know, little children talk that way. A two-year-old will say, Tommy had his breakfast this morning. He doesn't say I. He says Tommy. Third person. Mystics feel that way. They don't feel I have a problem. They feel Tommy has a problem. That's extraordinary. They have dis identified from themselves and at last they're at peace. This is the grace that St. Teresa of Avila was talking about. This is the I that the mystic masters of the East are constantly urging people to discover and of the West too because you can count Meister Eckhart among them, they're urging people to discover the I. Who's I? What's I? Now the important thing is not 
listen to this sentence carefully. The important thing is not to know who I is or what I is. You will never succeed. There are no words for this. The important thing is to drop the labels. As the Japanese masters, the Zen masters say, don't seek for truth, only drop your opinions, drop your theories. Don't seek for truth. Truth isn't something you seek for. If you would stop being opinionated, you would know. If you would drop your beliefs and opinions, you would know. Now something similar happens here. If you would drop your labels, you would know. What do I mean by labels? Every label you can conceive of, except perhaps human being. I am a human being, fair enough. Doesn't say very much. But when you say, I am successful, that's crazy. Because success is not part of the I. Success is something that comes and goes. It could be here today and gone tomorrow. That's not I. But you said, I am a success. That's where you were in error. That's when you got plunged into darkness. You identified yourself with success. I am a failure. I am a lawyer. I am a businessman. Now, you know what's going to happen to you if you identify yourself with these things? You're going to cling to them. You're going to be worried that they may fall apart. And that's where all your suffering comes in. That's what I meant in the beginning when I said to you, if you're suffering, you're asleep. Do you want a sign that you're asleep? Here it is. You're suffering. You're asleep. Suffering is a sign that you're out of touch with the truth. Suffering is given to you that you might open your eyes to the truth, that you might understand that there is some falsehood somewhere. Just as physical pain is given to you to understand that there's a disease, there's an illness somewhere. So suffering points out that there's some falsehood somewhere. Suffering occurs when you clash with reality when your illusion clashes with reality, when your falsehood clashes with truth, then you have suffering. Otherwise, there is no suffering. Now listen very carefully. The next few minutes, this sounds a bit pompous, but it's true. The next few minutes could be the most important minutes in the lives of some of you. If you could grasp this, you've hit upon the secret for awakening. You would be happy forever. You would never be unhappy again. Nothing, but nothing would have the power to hurt you. And I mean that, nothing. It's like, you know, you take black paint and throw it up in the air and keep throwing black paint in the air. The air is uncontaminated. You don't color the air black. And no matter what happens to you, you remain uncontaminated. You remain at peace. There are human beings, and you know it, who have attained to this. That is what I call human, not what people are generally living. That's what I call being a human being. That's what I call natural. Not this nonsense of being a, pup, a puppet, jerked about this way and that, having any event or any person tell you how to feel, and then you proceed to feel it. They call it being vulnerable. Ha! 
I call it being a puppet. You want to be a puppet? We press a button and you're down. You like that? So there it is. If you do not identify with any of those labels, first of all, most of your worries cease. What are you generally worried about? Later we'll talk about your fear of disease and death. But ordinarily you're worried about what's going to happen to your career. A businessman, small time businessman kind of, 55 years old, he's sipping beer somewhere at a bar and he thinks, well, look at my classmates. They've really made it. The idiot, they've made it. What do you mean they've made it? They got their names in the newspapers? You call that made it? Huh? They got their names in the news, in the prison journal? Huh? which all the prisoners are reading, and he thinks they've made it. <laughs> Successful president of a corporation, the other guy has become the chief justice, and somebody else has become this, and the other person has become that. Monkeys, all of them. Who determines what it means to be a success? The main preoccupation of society is to keep society sick. And the sooner you realize that, the better. Every one of them. Most of them. They're loony. They're crazy. You became the president of the lunatic asylum. And you're proud of it. It means nothing. It really means nothing. Being the president of a corporation has absolutely nothing to do with being awake, or being happy, or being a success in life. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Having a lot of money has nothing to do with being a success in life. You're a success in life when you wake up. When you don't have to apologize to anyone. When you don't have to explain anything to anyone. You don't feel the need to explain anything to anyone. You don't give a damn what anybody thinks of you or what anybody says about you. You have no worry. You're happy. Now that's what I call being a success. I don't know about you. So this poor guy is thinking sadly that he isn't a success like his classmates. Nobody has ever told him that having a good job and being famous and having a great reputation has absolutely nothing to do with happiness or success. Nothing. It's totally irrelevant. And so he's worried about what his children will think about him. What will his, the neighbors think about him? What will his wife think? He should have become famous. That's what your society and your culture is drilling into your head day and night, and so is mine. People who made it. Made what? Made asses of themselves. Because they drained all their energy in getting something that was worthless. And they're frightened, and they're confused, and they're puppets like the rest. Look at them strutting across the stage. Look how upset they'd get if they had a stain on their shirt. You call that a success? Look how frightened they are at the prospect that they may not be re-elected. You call that a success? So controlled, so manipulated. These are not happy people. These are miserable people. They don't enjoy life. They're constantly tense and anxious. You call that human? And do you know why that happened? There's only one reason. They identified with some label. They identified the I. That was their error with their money, with their job, with their profession. Heard about the lawyer who says to a plumber, when he's looking at the plumber's bill, he says, hey, you're charging nearly $200 an hour. Even I don't make that kind of money as a lawyer. And the plumber said, even I didn't make that kind of a money when I was a lawyer. He said, That's right, so... 
So, uh, you could be a plumber or a lawyer or a businessman or a priest that does not affect essential I. That doesn't affect you. I change my profession tomorrow. That's like changing my clothes. I is untouched. Are you your clothes? Are you your name? Are you your profession? Stop identifying with that because that will come and go. You know what happens when you really understand this? No criticism can affect you. No flattery or praise can affect you either. When someone says you're a great guy, what's he talking about? He's talking about me. He's not talking about I. I is neither great nor small. I is neither successful nor a failure. It is none of these labels. These things come and go. These things depend on the criteria that your society establishes. These things depend on your conditioning. These things depend on the mood of the person who happens to be talking to you right now. They have nothing to do with I. I is none of these labels. Me is generally selfish, foolish, childish, and a great big ass. So when you say, you're an ass, so you're telling me, ha ha, I've known it for years. That guy there, the conditioned self, the conditioned self, what could you expect? I've known it for years. Why did you identify with him? Silly. That isn't I. That's me. Now, here are those important minutes I was telling you about. You want to be happy uninterruptedly. Happiness is uncaused. Try to understand that. Happiness, true happiness, is uncaused. You cannot make me happy. You are not my happiness. You say to the awakened person, why are you happy? And the awakened person replies, why not? Happiness is our natural state. Happiness is the natural state of little children to whom the kingdom belongs until they have been polluted and contaminated by the stupidities of our societies and our cultures. To acquire happiness, you don't have to do anything because happiness cannot be acquired. Does anybody know why? Because you have it already. How can you acquire what you already have? <coughs> then why don't you experience it? Because you've got to drop something. You've got to drop an illusion. You don't have to add anything on to be happy. You've got to drop something. Life is easy. Life is delightful. It's only rough on your illusions. You've got illusions. You've got ambitions. You've got greed. You've got cravings. You know where they come from? From your having identified with all kinds of labels here. The first thing you need to do is get in touch with those negative feelings. If you're not even aware of them, you're not going to drop them. Lots of people have negative feelings they're not even aware of. Lots of people are depressed and they're not aware they're depressed. It's only when they make contact with joy that they understand how depressed they were. 
You're not going to be able to deal with a cancer that you haven't detected. You're not going to get rid of wolves in your farm if you're not aware of their existence. So the first thing you need is awareness of your negative feelings. What kind of negative feelings? Gloominess, for instance. You're feeling gloomy and moody. You feel self-dislike and self-hate or guilt. You feel that life is pointless, makes no sense. You've got hurt feelings. You're feeling nervous. You're feeling tense. Get in touch with those feelings first. Second step. This is a four-step program. Understand that the feeling is in you. It's not in reality. Now that's such a self-evident thing. But do you think people know that? They don't, believe me. They've got PhDs. They're presidents of universities. They haven't understood this. They didn't teach me how to live at school. They taught me everything else. Like the guy who said, well, I got a pretty good education and it took me years to get rid of it, to get over it. <laughs> yes, you really need it. That's what spirituality is all about, you know, unlearning. Unlearning. Unlearning all the rubbish they taught you. Now, that negative feeling is in you. It's not in reality. So stop trying to change reality. And our bosses, and our friends, and our enemies, and everybody else and everything else. You don't have to change anything. The negative feeling is in you. No person on earth has the power to make you unhappy. You want me to repeat that? It's very important. There is no event on earth that has the power to disturb you or to hurt you. No event no condition, no situation, no person. Only nobody told you this. They told you the opposite. That is why you're in the mess that you are in right now. That is why you're asleep. They never told you this. But it's self-evident. Rain washes out a picnic. Who's feeling negative? The rain or you? What's causing the negative feeling, the rain or your reaction? When you bump your knee against that chair there or against a table, the table's okay. It's busy being what it was meant to be, a table. The pain is in your knee, not in the table. And it's a funny thing, you know. The mystics keep telling us again and again, reality is all right. Reality is not problematic. Problems only exist in the human mind, we might add, in the stupid, asleep human mind. Reality is not problematic. Take away human beings from this planet, and life would go on, and nature would go on, in all her loveliness and her violence. Where would the problem be? No problem. You created the problem. You are the problem. You identified with the me. This is the problem. So understand that the feeling is in you, not in reality. Third step, never ever identify with that feeling. There's nothing to do with the I. Don't define your essential self in terms of those feelings. Don't say, I am depressed. You want to say, it is depressed, that's okay. You want to say, depression is there, that's fine. You want to say, gloominess is there, that's fine but not I am gloomy. You're defining yourself in terms of that feeling. That's your illusion. That's your mistake. You watch it. 
there is a depression there right now. There is a hurt feeling there right now. Let it be. Leave it alone. It'll pass. Everything passes, but everything. Your depressions and your thrills have nothing to do with happiness. Your depressions and your thrills have nothing to do with your happiness. Those are the swings of the pendulum. I told you yesterday, if you're seeking kicks, you're seeking thrills, get ready for the depression. You want your drug? Get ready for the hangover. One end of the pendulum swings to the other. This has nothing to do with I. This has nothing to do with happiness. This is the me. You know, if you remember this, if you say this to yourself a thousand times, if you try these three steps a thousand times, maybe you won't even need to do it three times. I don't know. There's no rule for it. But do it a thousand times. You'll make the, big, the biggest discovery in your life. To hell with those gold mines in Alaska. What are you going to do with that gold if you're not happy, if you can't live? You found gold. You're a king. You're a princess. You're free. You don't care anymore about being accepted or rejected makes no difference. You know this thing that psychologists tell us about how important it is to get a sense of belonging? Baloney. <laughs> what do you want to belong to anybody for? What do you want to belong to any group for? It doesn't matter anymore. They tell me there's an African tribe. A friend of mine told me that just three or four days ago. There was an African tribe. There is an African tribe where capital punishment means you're ostracized. You're thrown out of the tribe, and the man dies, or the woman dies. Just dies, physically, from the impact of that feeling that they're ostracized. You know, if you were kicked out of New York City, or wherever you're residing, you wouldn't die. How come he dies? Because he partakes of the common stupidity of humanity. He thinks he wouldn't be able to live if he did not belong. Not much different from most people, is it? He's convinced he needs to belong. You don't need to belong to anybody. You don't need to belong to anything or any group. Who told you that? You don't need to be loved. Who fooled you? What you need is to be free. What you need is to love. That, yes, that's your nature. What you need is to be happy. But to be loved? What are you talking about? What you're really telling me is you want to be desired, you idiot. <laughs> you want to be applauded. You want to be attractive. You want to have all the little monkeys running after you. You're wasting your life. Wake up. Wake up. You don't need this. You could be blissfully happy without this. Your society is not going to be happy to hear this, you know, because you become terrifying when you open your eyes and understand this. How do you control this kind of person? He doesn't need you. He's not threatened by your criticism. He doesn't care what you think of him or what you say about him. He's cut all those strings. He's not a puppet anymore. He's terrifying. We've got to get rid of him. Crucify him. He tells the truth. He's become fearless. He stopped being human. Human. Behold the human being at last. Broke out of his slavery. Broke out of their prison. Quick summary. First step. Get in touch with that negative feeling. It's so simple a child could do it. Try it about a dozen times today. I'll give you a couple of exercises after the break. Get in touch with that negative feeling. B. Don't try to change reality. 
Oh, I'm not saying you won't do something later on. But first of all, let's make sure that you're at peace. Let's make sure that you're awake. Let's make sure that you're not acting, going out in social work from your illusion. Let's make sure that you're real. Now, we may change things or we may not. But what you have to understand is that the negative feeling is in you, not in the events. No event justifies a negative feeling, period. Get that one. There is no situation in the world that justifies a negative feeling. That's what all our mystics have been crying themselves hoarse to tell us. But nobody hears. The negative feeling is in you. The Bhagavad Gita, the sacred book of the Hindus, Lord Krishna says to Arjun, marvelous sentence, plunge into the heat of battle and keep your heart at the lotus feet of the Lord. Keep your heart at peace at the lotus feet of the Lord. Plunge into the heat of battle. Because as some of you probably know, the book is set on a battleground. Extraordinary symbolism there. Do I run away from the battle? Do I fight my relatives? Go right ahead. Do your duty. But your heart is unaffected. The eye is unaffected. So, the negative feeling is in you. Understand that. Put the focus where it belongs. Stop blaming other people. There are people in your situation who would not react negatively. How about that now? You know, you'll notice a funny thing happening to you. You'll think you're really going crazy because you know what you're going to be doing after a while? Seeking out the company of people whom you avoided before because they created negative feelings in you. You're going to be saying, let's see if he creates a negative feeling in me now. He doesn't. He doesn't. Glory be to God. That's the kind of thing you're going to be doing. You're going to go out into the lanes, the bottom the, the, the hedges, and bring in the lame and the crippled and the blind and the dumb. You're bringing them all in. Bring them all in. There's room for everybody. Remember that sentence I said to you yesterday? To include the excluded. To return love for hate easiest thing in the world if you understand that the negative feeling is in you. Third step, don't ever identify with that feeling. That feeling isn't you. There's nothing to do with you. Later we'll find out where it comes from. It's the result of your conditioning. It's humiliating to realize, perhaps, that you were trained to react that way. You were trained to react that way, for heaven's sake. All right, that'll do. Let's take a 20-minute break. That was a four-point program, wasn't it? And I gave you only three. <laughs> I can see you're quite eager to get the fourth point. <laughs> It's very encouraging for the speaker, you know. <laughs> All right. So remember we said point one, identify the negative feeling. If you would drop it, you would be happy. You don't even need to drop it to be happy. Happiness is your state of being. You don't have to do anything to acquire happiness. The great Meister Eckhart said very beautifully, God is not attained by a process of addition to anything in the soul, but by a process of subtraction. You don't do anything to be free. You drop something then you're free. Reminded of the Irish prisoner who dug a tunnel under the prison, managed to escape. He comes out right in the middle 
of a school playground with these little children playing. And of course, when he emerges from the tunnel, he couldn't restrain himself anymore. He began to jump up and down and said, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. And there was a little girl there who looks at him scornfully and, he, and she says, that's nothing, I'm four. <laughs> So you drop something. You drop your prison cage and you're free. You don't do anything. You drop your illusions and you're awake. You drop your attachments and you are love. You are sensitive. You are conscious. You're in touch with all of life. You drop your misconceptions your negativities, and you have happiness. The other thing that you acquire isn't happiness at all. Those are thrills. That's your drug. And I'm sure it has occurred to some of you to think, wouldn't it be a dull life, no cravings and no thrills? Wouldn't that be dull? That's right. The addict always feels that life would be dull without the drug. When you taste it, you'll understand. So, step number one, get in touch with those negative feelings. Identify them. Step two, understand that those feelings are in you, in the me, not in the external world, not in other people. Step three, never identify the I with those feelings. Feelings come and go. Just as I am not my thoughts, I am not my body selves, I am not my clothes, I am not my name, I am not my profession, I am not these feelings. I am not depressed. Depression exists right now. There within me. I observe it. I watch it and let it be. Stop trying to fix it. Let it be. It's all right. Someday you will understand it. And that's the fourth point. How about change? How about changing things? How about changing ourselves? Now there are many things you have to understand here. Or basically just one thing. But could be expressed in many ways. Imagine a, doc a patient goes to a doctor and tells the doctor what he is suffering from. And the doctor says, very well, I've understood your symptoms. You know what I'll do? I'll prescribe a medicine for your neighbor. And the patient replies, thank you very much, doctor. Uh, that makes me feel much better. Isn't that absurd? Isn't that absurd? That's what we're all doing. Repeatedly, people are doing this. The sleeper always feels that he'll feel much better if somebody else changes. You're suffering because you're asleep. And you think, how wonderful life would be if somebody else changed. How wonderful life would be if uh, my neighbor changed, my wife changed, my husband changed, my boss changed. There's that lovely Zen couplet written by one of the great masters. I sometimes make an exercise out of it, but we're not going to have time to do it here. When we have these longer courses of eight or nine days, then we can afford that kind of luxury. The man says, if my grumbling wife were alive tonight, I would have enjoyed the sight of the moon. If my grumbling wife had been alive tonight, how I would have enjoyed the sight of the moon. <laughs> we better not go too deep into that one. <laughs> well, we always want somebody else to change so that we will feel good. But has it ever struck you that if your wife changes or your husband changes, 
What does that do to you? You're just as vulnerable as before. You're just as idiotic as before. You're just as asleep as before. It's you who need to change. It's you who need to take the medicine. So, there's always the feeling of, I feel good because the world is right. Wrong. The world is right because I feel good. That's what all the mystics are saying. When you awake, when you understand, when you see, the world becomes right. We're always bothered, aren't we, by the problem of evil. That extraordinary, powerful story of the little kid who's walking in a jungle village in Africa along the banks of a river and sees a crocodile who's been trapped in a net. And the crocodile says, would you have pity on me and release me? I may look ugly, but it isn't my fault, you know. I was made this way. And whatever my external appearance, I've got a mother's heart. I came out this morning in search of food for my young ones. And I got into this trap. And the boy says, aha, if I were to help you out of that trap, you'd kill me. You'd grab me. And the crocodile says, do you think I'd do that to my benefactor and liberator? So the boy was persuaded, and he took the net off, and the crocodile grabbed him. There he was, caught between the jaws of the crocodile, and he says, so this is what I get for my good action. And the crocodile says, well, don't take it personally, son. <laughs> this is the way the world is. This is the law of life. And the boy says, this is not the way the world is. This is not the law of life. And the crocodile says, you want to ask someone? He says, uh, sees a bird sitting up on a branch. And he says, bird, this is what the crocodile says. What have you to say? The bird says, the crocodile is right. Look at me. I was coming home one day with food for my fledglings. And imagine my horror as I was coming back to my nest to see a snake crawling up that tree, making straight for my nest. And I was totally helpless while it kept devouring my young ones, one after the other. I kept screaming and shouting, but it was useless. The crocodile is right. This is the law of life. This is the way the world is. See, said the crocodile. Come, let's go. The boy said, well, let me ask someone else. And the crocodile said, all right, go ahead. And there was an old donkey passing by the bank of that river. And he said, donkey, is this is what the crocodile says. Is the crocodile right? And the donkey said, the crocodile is quite right. Look at me. I've worked and slaved for my master all my life. And he barely gave me enough to eat. And now that I'm old and useless, he has turned me loose. And here I am wandering in the jungle, waiting for some wild beast to pounce on me and put an end to my life. The crocodile is right. This is the law of life. This is the way the world is. See, says the crocodile, let's go. The, the boy said, give me one chance, one last chance. Let me ask one other being. Look how good I was to you. So the crocodile said, all right, your last chance. And the boy sees a rabbit passing by, and he says, Rabbit, is the crocodile right? The rabbit sits on its haunches and says to the crocodile, Did you say that to that kid? And the crocodile said, Yes, I did. He said, Wait a minute now. We've got to discuss that. The crocodile said, Go right ahead. And the rabbit said, How could we discuss it if you've got that boy in your mouth? Release him. He's got to take part in the discussion too. The crocodile says, you're a clever one, you are. The moment I release him, he'll run away. And the rabbit said, I thought you had more sense than that. If he attempted to run away, one slash of your tail would kill him. Fair enough, said the crocodile. So he released the boy. 
And the moment the boy was released, the rabbit said, run! And he ran and escaped. Then said the rabbit to the boy, don't you enjoy crocodile flesh? Don't the people in your village, in, wouldn't they like to have a good meal? You know something? You didn't really release that crocodile. Most of his body still caught in the net. Why don't you go to the village and bring everybody and have a banquet? So that's exactly what the boy did. He went to the village, called all the men, folk. They came with their axes and staves and spears to kill the crocodile. And the boy's dog came with him. And when the dog saw the rabbit, he gave chase caught hold of the rabbit and throttled it. And the boy comes panting on the scene, too late. And as he watches the rabbit die, he says, the crocodile was right. This is the way the world is. This is the law of life. And there's no explanation you could give that would explain away all the suffering and the evil and the torture and the destruction and the hunger in the world. You never explain it. You try and gamely with your formulas, religious and otherwise, but you never explain it. Because life is a mystery, which means your thinking mind cannot make sense out of it. For that you've got to wake up and you suddenly realize that reality is not problematic. You are the problem. The scriptures are always hinting at that, but you'll never get it because you won't understand a word of what the scriptures are saying till you wake up. Sleeping people read the scriptures and crucify the Messiah on the basis of them. You've got to wake up to make sense out of the scriptures. But you know something, when you do wake up, they make sense. So does reality. But you'd never be able to put it into words. Now, wouldn't you do something? Wouldn't you swing into action? Of course you'd swing into action. But we've got to make sure that you're not swinging into action to get rid of your negative feelings. Am I making sense? Lots of people swing into action and only make things worse, you know, because they're not coming from love. They're coming from negative feelings. They're coming from guilt, from anger, from hate, from a sense of injustice, or whatever. We've got to make sure of that first. We've got to make sure of your being before you swing into action. You've got to make sure of who you are before we see what you do. And unfortunately, when sleeping people swing into action, they just substitute one cruelty with another, one injustice with another, and so it goes on. Meister Reka, again, says so powerfully, it is not by your actions that you will be saved or awakened, call it any word you want, but by your being. It is not by what you do but by what you are, that you will be judged. Of course, of what good is it to you to feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty and visit the prisoners in jail? Remember that sentence? I could give my body to be burnt and all my goods to feed the poor, but if I have not love, aha, that's important. Not your actions, not your actions. Forget it. It's your being then you might get into action or you might not get into action. You can't decide that till you know, till you understand, till you're awake. And unfortunately, all the emphasis is being put on changing the world 
and very little emphasis on waking you up. When you wake up, you will know what to do or what not to do. Some of the mystics are very strange, you know, like that man Jesus who says, I wasn't sent to those people. I just limit myself to what I'm supposed to do right now. Later, maybe. Some of them go into silence, mysteriously. Some of them sing songs. Some of them get into service. We're never sure. They're a law unto themselves. They know exactly what is to be done. Get into the heat of battle. Keep your heart at the lotus feet of the Lord, as I said to you this morning. So, see what happens to us when we're asleep. It's like, I said to you before, the world is good or the world is right because you feel good. Imagine that you're unwell and you're in a foul mood and they're taking you through some lovely countryside, beautiful landscape, but you're not in the mood for seeing anything. Another day you pass by the same place and you say, good heavens, where was I that I didn't notice all of this? Everything becomes beautiful when you change. You're looking at the trees and the mountains through windows that are wet with the rain in a storm and everything looks blurred and shapeless and you want to go right out there and change those trees and change those mountains. Wait a minute, let's examine your window. When the storm ceases and the rain stops and you look out of the window, you say, well, how different everything looks. Because we see people and things not as they are, but as we are. And it's so important to understand that. That is why when two people look at something or look at someone, you get two different reactions. We see things and people not as they are, but as we are. Remember that sentence about everything turning to good for those who love God? When you awake, you don't try to make good things happen. They just happen. They just happen because you understand suddenly that everything that happens to you is good. Marvelous. So think of the people you're living with and whom you want to change. You find them moody, inconsiderate, unreliable, treacherous, or whatever. When you are different, they will be different. That's an infallible and miraculous cure. The day you are different, they will become different. You will see them differently. He seemed so terrifying, he's actually frightened. She seems so rude, I am actually frightened, or whatever, we suddenly see things differently. All of a sudden, no one has the power to hurt you anymore. No one has the power to put pressure on you. It's a marvelous state. You're putting pressure on me. You know, it's something like this. It's like you leave a book on the table and I pick it up and I say, you're pressing this book on me. You're not pressing any book on me. You're doing your thing. It's up to me to pick it up or not to pick it up. But people never understood that. They're so busy accusing everybody else, blaming everyone else, 
blaming life, blaming society, blaming their neighbor, you never change that way. You continue in your nightmare. You never wake up. So, if you would put this program into action, as I said to you this morning, a thousand times, A, identify the negative feelings, B, understand that they are in you, not in the world, not in external reality. C, do not say that that is an essential part of I. These things come and go. D, understand that when you change, everything changes. That still leaves us with the big question, how do I change? Do I do anything to change myself? I'm going to leave that for a little later. Let me give you a two-minute exercise give you a little discussion, field a few questions because I've done so much talking this morning. Then we'll move on to, do I do anything to change myself? Got a big surprise for you. Lots of good news, even better news. You don't have to do anything. The more you do, the worse it gets. All you have to do is understand. What you understand will change, will always change. But uh, more about that later, after this little exercise. This sounds like a commercial almost, doesn't it? <laughs> now, let's try this one. Get in touch with yourself for a few seconds. Become aware of your presence in this room. Become aware of the kind of thoughts that are going on within you. Think of somebody you're living with or you're working with whom you do not like, who causes negative feelings to arise within you. Now let's help you to understand that to understand what's going on. First, the first thing you need to understand is that the negative feeling is in you. You are responsible for the negative feeling, not the other person. Somebody else in your place would be perfectly calm and at ease in the presence of this person. Wouldn't be affected. You are. Now understand another thing. You're making a demand there. You have an expectation of this person. Can you get in touch with that? Now say to this person, I have no right to make any demand on you. Because as you say that, you will drop your expectations. I have no right to make any demand on you. Oh, I'll protect myself from the consequences of your actions or your moods or whatever, but you could go right ahead and be what you choose to be. I have no right to make any demands on you. See what happens to you when you do this. And if there's a resistance to saying that, my, how much you're going to discover about your me. Ha uh ha. -huh. 
Let the dictator come out. Let the tyrant come out. You thought you were such a little lamb, didn't you? I'm a tyrant, you're a tyrant. Little variety from I'm an ass, you're an ass. I'm a dictator, you're a dictator. I want to run your life for you. I want to tell you exactly how you're expected to be and how you're expected to behave. And you'd better behave as I have decided you have to behave. Or else, I shall punish myself by having negative feelings. <laughs> that sounds so wise, doesn't it? Remember what I told you? Everybody's a lunatic. Now you're catching on. Okay, give it a few seconds more, and we'll call a halt to the exercise. That will do. Okay, let's have those questions. Do you have any questions? Yes. Yesterday when I got home, I found out that my son got a reward, I mean an award, from his high school. He got a, an award for excellence in sports and uh, academic. Happy for him that he did that. But I was almost tempted to say, don't glory in that <laughs> award because it's setting you up for the time when you cannot perform as well. So I'm, I'm at a dilemma right now. <laughs> How am I to prevent the same thing happening to him that has happened to me without bursting the top of the time? Hopefully he'll learn, as you yourself grow in wisdom, it's not a matter of anything you say to him, but something that eventually you will become, and he will understand. Then you will know what to say and when. That award, the result of cruelty, the result of competition, built on hatred of oneself and of others. Ever thought of that? You get a good feeling on the basis of somebody getting a bad feeling. You win over somebody else. Isn't that terrible? Taken for granted in the lunatic asylum. There's an American doctor who wrote about the results of competition on his life. He said he went to medical school in Switzerland. And he said there was a fairly large contingent of Americans at that school. He said some of us went into shock when we realized that there were no grades and there were no awards and there was no marks list. There was no first or second rank at medical school. You either passed or you did not. So he said, some of us simply couldn't take it. We, we became kind of paranoid. We thought, there must be some kind of a trick here. And he says, they couldn't take it, so they went to another university. They went to another school. He said, those of us who survived that suddenly discovered a strange thing that we had never noticed at our American universities. Students, brilliant ones, helping one another to pass. Sharing notes. Hey, you might want to read this. He says, my son goes to medical school in the States now, and he tells me that in the practicals, people frequently skew up the microscope so that it'll take the next guy three or four minutes to rearrange it. They gotta get ahead. Competition. They got to succeed. They got to be perfect. And he tells a lovely little story which he says is real, but it could serve as a beautiful parable of a little town in the States where people gathered off an evening to make music. You had a, a saxophonist and a drummer and a violinist and Mostly old people, they got together for the company and for the sheer joy of making music, though they didn't make it very well. Why do you have to do things well? Do them enjoyably, not well. 
So they were enjoying themselves, having a great time, till they decided they'd get a, a new conductor who had a lot of goal and a lot of ambition and a lot of drive. And he said, hey, folks, we've got to make a concert. We've got to prepare a concert for the town. So then he gradually got rid of some of the people who didn't play too well, hired a couple of musicians, got an orchestra into shape, and they got their names into the newspaper. Wasn't that wonderful? And then they decided they'd go to the big city and, and play there. And some of the older people had tears in their eyes as they thought, well, it was so wonderful in the old days when we did things badly and enjoyably. Cruelty came in, but nobody recognized it as cruelty. See how lunatic people have got? Oh, oh, all right. What's the meaning of that sentence I added about, I'll protect myself, you go ahead and be yourself, that's all right, but I'll be myself. In other words, I won't allow you to manipulate me. I'll live my life. I'll go my way. I leave myself free to think my thoughts and to follow my inclinations and my tastes. And I'll say no to you. And if I think I don't want to be in your company, that will be fine. But it won't be because of any negative feelings that you cause in me because you don't anymore. You don't have any more power over me. But I just might prefer other people's company. And when you say to me, how about a movie tonight? And I say, sorry, I want to go with someone else. I enjoy his company more than yours. That's all right. Just say no to people. That's wonderful. That's part of waking up. Part of waking up is that you would live your life as you see fit and understand that that is not selfish. The selfish thing is to demand that someone else live their lives as you see fit. Ah, that's selfish. My, that's a, a big sentence to take in in a few minutes. You probably need a whole day for that. It is not selfish to live your life as you see fit. The selfishness lies in demanding that someone else live their life to suit your taste or your pride, or your profit, or your pleasure. That is selfish indeed. So I'll protect myself. I don't feel obligated to be with you. I don't feel obligated to say yes to you. If I find that your company is pleasant, fine. I'll enjoy it without clinging to it. Uh, and I no longer avoid you because of any negative feelings you create. You don't have that power anymore. Many other hands going up. Yes, John. I'm beginning to wonder if it's possible for a phobia of waste of eye. And I realize that if I, you know, run into uh, a year from now, it's terrible. And I say, oh, no, it's what a surprise to me. And I'm excited. But I'm also realize I'm excited because maybe what I can get from you with you is a the selfish thing there. But I'm wondering if it's a quite surprise well, it all depends on what you mean by surprise. When you don't expect something and it happens, you feel surprised. But I think what you're describing there, John, is a thrill. Would you be thrilled? I doubt it. You wouldn't want drugs anymore. You, you lose your taste for them. Every minute is so enjoyable that you wouldn't go in for kicks. You know the way some people just don't have a taste for drugs. Others do. How would you describe a surprise in this Oh, surprise means, uh, gee, I, I didn't expect that uh, today's session would be cancelled. It was, I'm surprised. As Webster is reported to have said to his wife, I think she, uh, she said, uh, she caught him kissing the maid. And she said she was very surprised. Now, Webster, who was a stickler for using words accurately, understandably, he wrote a dictionary. He said, no, my dear, I am surprised. You are astonished. <laughs> yes. How many people are asking questions about what will happen when we wake up? 
Why bother? Let's wake up. Does it matter to, to you so much that you be awakened? That's awful. You know what you're going to do now? You're going to make that a goal. And you're going to be determined to get there. And you're going to say, I refuse to be happy until I'm awakened. <laughs> so, it's okay to be the way you are and be aware of the way you are because awareness is happiness. But you won't understand that right now, probably. And you'll understand that you reacted so quickly because you were not aware and you'll understand that there are times when you react even in awareness but as awareness grows you react less and you act more you come less from here and more from here and it really doesn't matter you know there's the story of a disciple who says to his guru that he's going to go to some place and meditate and hopefully attain enlightenment. So he sends him a note every six months to report the progress that he's making. And the first report says, now I understand what it means to lose the self. The guru tore that up and threw it in the waste paper basket. Then he gets another report after six months which says, now I have attained to sensitivity to all beings torn up. Then another report says, now I understand the secret of the one in the many torn up. And so it goes on for years until finally no reports come in. No more reports. So the guru becomes curious and one day when there's a traveler going by that side, he says to him, why don't you find out what happened to that guy? And he gets a note from the guy saying, what does it matter? And when the guru gets that, he says, no, he made it, he made it, he made it, he got it, he got it. <laughs> know the one about the soldier who on a battlefield would drop his rifle and pick up a scrap of paper and look at it and then he would let it fall from his hands, it would flutter to the ground and then he'd go somewhere else and pick up a scrap of paper and let it fall to the ground. And they said, this man's exposing himself to death, he needs help. So they put him in hospital. They get the best psychiatrist to work on him, but it seems to have no effect. He wanders around the wards, he picks up scraps of paper, he looks at them idly, lets them flutter to the ground. And in the end, they say, we've got to discharge this guy. We've got to discharge him. He, you know. So they, they call him in, and they, they give him a certificate kind of discharging him, and he picks it up idly, looks at it, he says, this is it! This is it! That's right. What does it matter? <laughs> so, begin to be aware of your present condition, whatever that condition is. Stop being a dictator, I'll have to talk about that this afternoon, and trying to push yourself anywhere. And someday you will understand how, in that awareness, you have attained it, but you didn't know it. But that will come gradually. Be aware. And I'll explain to you this afternoon how awareness will bring the change. Where does compassion come in? Where does guilt come in? You'll know when you're awake. If you're guilty right now, how on earth could I explain that to you? And how would you know what compassion is? You know, sometimes people want to imitate Christ. When a monkey plays the saxophone, that doesn't make him a musician. It really doesn't. You can't imitate Christ by imitating his external behavior. You've got to be Christ. Then you know exactly what to do in a given situation, given your temperament, given your character, given your situation, given the character and temperament of the person you're dealing with, you know exactly what to do. No one can tell you. But for that, you must become you must be what Christ was. You will know, but merely external imitation will get you nowhere. You may think that compassion is softness. There's no way I could describe compassion to you. There's absolutely no way. 
Compassion can be very hard. Compassion can be very rude. Compassion can jolt you. Compassion can roll its sleeves up and operate on you. There are all kinds of things. Compassion can be very soft. There's no way of knowing. It's only when you become love. In other words, when you have dropped your illusions and your attachments, that you will know. As you identify less and less with the me, you're more at ease with everybody and with everything. Do you know why? Because you are no longer afraid of being hurt or not liked or being left. And you no longer desire to impress anyone. Can you imagine the relief when you don't have to impress anybody anymore? Oh, what a relief. Happiness at last. And as I said to you this morning, you don't feel the need or the compulsion to explain anything anymore. It's all right. What's there to be explained? And you don't feel the need or the compulsion to apologize anymore? What could you expect of an ass? He behaved like an ass. Now what I need to tell you, or well, you don't even feel the need to say that. But if anything had to be said, I'd much rather hear you say, you know, I've come awake, than hear you say, I'm sorry. I'd much rather hear you say to me, I've come awake since we last met. Won't happen again than to hear you say, I'm so sorry. Why would I demand an apology from you? Ever thought of that? Why would anyone demand an apology? Ah, there you've got something to explore. You're thinking of someone mean to you. Nobody was mean to you. You missed that. Somebody was mean to what he thought or she thought was you, but not you. Nobody ever rejects you. They're just rejecting what they think you are. If you choose to pick that up, that's your responsibility. But that cuts both ways, you know. Nobody ever accepts you either. Ever thought of that one? Until somebody is awake, that's the way they're behaving. They're accepting or rejecting their image of you. They've fashioned an image of you, and they're rejecting that, or they're accepting that. It'd be devastating to go deeply into that. A bit too liberating. Very liberating. Somebody talked about compassion. How easy it is to love people when you understand it. How easy it is to love everyone when you don't identify with this or what they think this is. You don't identify so, so easy to love them, to love everybody. Yes, did you uh, understand me to say the thinking I and the feeling me? Oh, I observing me, but not thinking, because me does a lot of bad thinking and good thinking too. But when I watches me, I is constantly aware. This is a reflection. In reality, you don't really think of I and me. In reality, you're like that driver driving the car who doesn't want to lose consciousness of the car ever. Now, are you telling me you want to go unconscious sometimes? It's all right to dream. It's all right to have daydreams. But never lose consciousness of your surroundings. You're always alert. You know, it's like a mother who would be sleeping. She doesn't hear the planes roaring above the house, but she hears the slightest whimper of the baby. She's alert. She's awake in that sense. That's what I mean. So you probably didn't quite get what I was hinting at, or maybe I didn't explain it clearly enough. When a person's awake, the person's awake. Let's get there. 
then we'll know. <laughs> one may not say anything about the awakened state. One can only talk about the sleeping state. One hints at the awakened state. One may not say anything about happiness. Happiness cannot be defined. What can be defined is misery, unhappiness. Drop that and you will know. Love cannot be defined. Unlove can. Drop unlove, drop fear, and you will know. Another hand up there, yes. Yes. Did anybody hear me say I don't favor meditation? No, that's all right. Meditation's okay. In fact, that's what I'm recommending the whole time. Yes. <laughs> that's a good one. Wouldn't this cause pain the people around you who are still asleep? You're causing a lot of pain when you are asleep, you know. Plenty of it. You want everybody to be awake. Good. Meaning yourself too. Now that's a good place to start. Okay. Oh, you don't want to be awake. Oh, you are. Congratulations. Yes. You'll know when you wake up. Everybody's asking questions on what will happen when they arrive. Very few are really. Is this curiosity? That's the word. Curiosity. It doesn't matter. What's important is that you would have grasped what I'm saying. But we're always asking, how would this fit into that system? Or would this make sense in that context? Or uh, what will it feel like when we get there? Get started. You'll know. It cannot be described. We cannot say. And so it is said so widely in the East. Those who know do not say. Those who say do not know. It cannot be said. Only the opposite can be said. The guru cannot give you truth, as I shall explain to you sooner or later. Truth cannot be put into words. You have a formula that isn't the truth, that isn't the reality. Reality cannot be put into a formula. The guru can only point out your errors. When you drop your errors, you will know truth. And then you cannot say. This is common teaching among the great Catholic mystics. The great Thomas Aquinas, who towards the end of his life, I thought he kept that famous silence of his for just a couple of months or something. It went on for years. He wouldn't write. He wouldn't talk. He had seen. And he realized that he had made a fool of himself. And he said so explicitly. It's like if you've never tasted a green mango, which are in a, found in abundance in my country, and you said to me, what does it taste like? And I'd say to you, oh. And in giving you a word, I've put you off the track. Try to understand that. Unless you're very wise, which most people are not, they seize upon the word. They seize upon the words of scripture. And they've got it all wrong. Sour. And you say, vinegar sour? Oh, no, no, not vinegar sour. You say, lemon sour? You say, no, 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 not lemon sour. What sour? Mango sour. <laughs> but I've never tasted one. Too bad. Then you go ahead and write a doctoral thesis on it. <laughs> you wouldn't have if you had tasted it. You really wouldn't. You would have written a doctoral thesis on other things, but not on this. And the day you taste a green mango, you say, God, I made a fool of myself. I shouldn't have written that thesis. Exactly what Thomas Aquinas did. He uh, read a whole book written by a great German philosopher and theologian precisely on the silence of St. Thomas. He just went silent, that's all. He wouldn't talk, wouldn't talk. 
the great foundation of his Summa Theologica, which was the summary of all his theology, in the prologue he says, about God we cannot say what he is, but rather what he is not. And so we cannot speak about how he is, but rather how he is not. And then he talks in his famous commentary of Boetius, De Trinitate, on the Trinity. And he says there are three ways of knowing God. One, in his creation. Two, in his action through creation. And the highest form of the knowledge of God is to know him tamquam ignotum, to know that one does not know the highest form, talking about the Trinity, to know that one does not know. Now this is not an oriental Zen master. This is a canonized saint of the Roman Catholic Church, the prince of theologians for centuries who's talking. To know him as unknown, and in another place he says, as unknowable. I'll explain that to you, possibly this afternoon. Why reality, God, divinity, truth, love is unknowable, meaning cannot be comprehended by the thinking mind. I'll explain that to you. I'll show you why it is so. And that will set at rest so many questions that people would have because we're always living under the illusion that we know we don't. We cannot know. What then is scripture? A hint, a clue, not a description, silly. The fanaticism of a sincere believer causes more evil than the united efforts of 200 rogues. It really does. It's terrifying to see what sincere believers will do because they think they know. You don't. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a world where everybody said we don't know? Wouldn't that be marvelous? We don't know. A man born blind who comes to me and says, what is this thing called reality? Or rather, What's the color green? What's the color green like? And uh, how does one describe the color green to someone who is born blind? One uses analogy. One says, you know, the color green, it's something like, uh, like soft music. He says, oh, something like soft music? Yeah, soothing, soft. Oh, okay. Another guy comes to me and says, what's the color green like? I say, you know, it's something like soft satin, hmm? very soft to the touch and soothing. He says, oh, I see. The next day I know they're bashing each other over the head with bottles, one saying it's, it's, it's soft music, the other one says it's satin, and so it goes on. And neither of them knows a thing of what they're talking about, because if they did, they'd shut up. It's as bad as that. And it's even worse, because one day, you restore sight to this man. And he's sitting there in the garden, and he's looking all around him. And I say to him, well, now you know what the color green is. He says, that's right, I heard some of it this morning. <laughs> you know you're surrounded by God, and you don't see see him because you know about him, that's why. The final barrier to the vision of God is God, is your God concept. You miss it because you think you know. That's the terrible thing about religion. That's what the Gospels are saying. They knew, so they got rid of him. The highest knowledge of God 
is to know God as unknowable. There's far too much God talk. The world is sick of it. There's too little awareness, too little love, too little happiness. Or let's not use those words either. There's too little dropping of illusions, dropping of errors, dropping of attachments and cruelty. Too little awareness. That's what the world is suffering from. Not lack of religion, lack of awareness, lack of waking up. That's what religion is all about. That's what it's supposed to be about. Look what we degenerated into. Come to my country and see them killing one another. You find it everywhere. This is what it ended up in. So, the one who knows does not say. The one who says does not know. All revelations, however divine, are never anything more than a finger pointing to the moon. And as we say in the East, when the sage points to the moon, all that the idiot sees is the finger. Jean Guiton, very pious, orthodox, Catholic writer in France, adds a terrifying comment. We frequently use the finger to gouge our eyes out. Isn't that terrible? So, awareness, awareness, awareness. In awareness is healing. In awareness is truth. In awareness is salvation. In awareness is spirituality. In awareness is growth. In awareness is love. In awareness is awakening. Awareness. I talked to you so far about awareness of what goes on in the self, the me. Why it is that when we look at a tree, we really don't see it. We think we do, but we don't. When we look at a person, we don't really see that person. We think we do. What we're seeing is something that we fixed in our minds. We get an impression, we hold on to that impression, and we keep looking at that person through that impression. And we do this with almost everything. If you understand that, then you will understand the loveliness and beauty of being aware also of everything around you. Because reality is there. God, whatever that is, is there. It's all there. The little fish in the ocean. Excuse me, he says. I'm looking for the ocean. Could you tell me where I could find it? Pathetic, isn't it? So, if we would open our eyes and see and realize, then we would understand. Let's get back to that business of me and I. There's that marvelous sentence in the Gospels, and, well, one finds it in most religious literature, and all religious and spiritual literature, mystical literature, about dying to the self, about denying oneself, about losing the self. Remember? All right. How does one lose oneself? Ever tried, ever tried to lose something? That's right. The harder you try, the more difficult it gets if you really want to lose it. As she says very well, when you're not trying, then you lose things. You lose something when you're not aware. You drop it. Or how does one die to the self? We're talking about death now. We're not talking about suicide. We're not told to kill the self, but to die. 
and to deny the self. Does that mean one causes pain to the self? One causes suffering to the self? But that would be self-defeating. That would be counterproductive. You're never so full of yourself as when you're in pain. You're never so centered on yourself as when you're depressed. You're never so ready to forget yourself as when you're happy. Happiness releases you from the self. It's suffering and pain and misery and depression that ties you to the self. Look how full you are of your tooth when you have a toothache. When you have no toothache, you're not even aware you've got a tooth. Or that you've got a head for that matter when you have no headache. But it's so different when you have a splitting headache. So it's quite false, quite erroneous to think that the way to deny the self is to cause pain to the self, to go in for abnegation, mortification, as it was traditionally understood, and uh, to cause suffering. To deny the self, to die to it, to lose it, is to understand its true nature, and it will disappear, it will vanish, I frequently give the example of somebody who walks into my room one day and I say, come right in. Uh, may I know who you are? He says, I am Napoleon. And I say, not uh, Napoleon, precisely, Bonaparte, that's right. <laughs> Emperor of France, what do you know? And I'm thinking to myself, I'd better handle this guy with care. Sit down, your majesty, says I. So he sits down, and I say, what can I do for you? And he says, uh, well, they tell me you're a pretty good spiritual director, and I've come up with a spiritual problem. I'm anxious. I'm finding it hard to trust in God, because I've got my armies in Russia, see, and I'm spending sleepless nights wondering how it's going to turn out. And I say, well, Your Majesty, I could certainly propose something for that. Uh, what I suggest is that, that you read Matthew 6. You know, look at the birds of the air, look at the lilies of the field. They're not anxious, they're not worried. By this stage, you're wondering, by the time we get to this stage, you're wondering who is crazier, he or I. But I'm going along with this lunatic, see? That's what the wise guru does with you in the beginning. He goes along with you. He takes your trouble seriously. He'll wipe a tear or two from your eye. Because you're crazy, but you don't know it as yet. The time soon has to come when he'll pull, pull the rug from under your feet and tell you, get off it, you're not Napoleon. In those famous dialogues of Catherine of Siena, God is reported to say to, to have said to her, I am he who is. You are she who is not. Ever experienced your is notness? In the East, we have an image for this the image of the dancer and the dance. God is viewed as the dancer and creation as his dance. It isn't as if he is the big dancer and you are the little dancer. Oh, no, 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 no. You got it all wrong. You're not a dancer at all. You are being danced. Ever experienced that? When this guy comes to his senses and realizes that he is not Napoleon, he does not cease to be. He continues to be. But he suddenly realizes that he is something other than what he thought he was. Is that clear? He realizes that he is something other than what he thought he was. To lose the self is to suddenly realize that you are something other than what you thought you were. You thought you were center. Now you experience yourself as satellite. 
you thought you were dance dancer you now experience yourself as danced now these are analogies these are images you cannot take them literally they just give you a clue they give you a hint they're pointers don't forget so you cannot press them too much don't take them literally i'll come back to this idea again when we come back to the scriptures the scriptures are mystical poetry they're not scientific descriptions but more about that when we come to the bible so the loss of the self when you understand who what you are the self the illusory self is lost as a step to attaining that to moving towards that i suggest this again this is a kind of an imagery now don't go around imagining that this i is another guy and me is another person no 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 these are ways of talking but as you begin to understand the transitory nature the transient nature of all these things that they keep attributing to you you dissociate yourself increasingly from them that's about the best you can do i think to prepare the ground for the loss of the self for the death to the self to move on to another idea this whole matter of one's personal worth self esteem self worth where do you get it from do you get it from success in your work do you get it from having a lot of money do you get it from attracting a lot of men if you are a woman or a lot of women if you are a man how fragile that is how transitory and when we talk about self worth are we not talking really about how we are reflected in the mirrors of other people's minds do we need to depend on that one understands one's worth again a way of talking when one no longer identifies or defines oneself in terms of these transient things one no longer does that i'm not beautiful because everyone says i'm beautiful i'm really neither beautiful nor ugly these are things that come and go i could be suddenly transformed into a very ugly creature tomorrow but i is still i and then again after plastic surgery i become beautiful does the i really become beautiful see you'll need to give a lot of time to reflect on these things i've sort of thrown them at you in rapid succession but if you would take time out to understand what i have been saying to dwell on it my you have a gold mine there i know because when i stumbled upon these things what a treasure i discovered and to summarize some of that stuff i was giving you this morning you know i put it in a simple sentence pleasant experiences make life delightful painful experiences lead to growth pleasant experiences make life delightful they don't lead to growth in themselves what leads to growth is painful experiences suffering points up an area in you where you have not yet grown where you need to grow and be transformed and changed just as physical pain points to an illness in your body if you would know how to use that suffering oh how you would grow let's limit ourselves for the time being to psychological suffering to all those negative emotions don't waste a single one of them 
I told you this morning in that four-point program what you could do with these emotions. That disappointment you experience when events don't turn out as you wanted them to. Watch that. What does that say about you? But without condemnation, or you're going to get caught up in self-hate now, or self-dislike. Observe it as you would in another person. Look at that disappointment. That depression you experience when you are criticized. What does that say about you? How much you will learn. That anxiety you experience. That worry. Ever heard about the guy who says, who says worry doesn't help? It certainly does. Every time I worry about something, it doesn't happen. <laughs> so it certainly helped him. Or the other one who says, he says the neurotic is a person who worries about something that did not happen in the past. Not like us normal people who worry about things that will not happen in the future. That's it. That worry, that anxiety, what does it say about you? What's happening to you? So, if you would use this negative feeling, every negative feeling, every psychological suffering for awareness, for understanding, for dissociating from the feeling and watching it from outside, in the beginning, the depression will still be there, but you will have cut your connection with it Gradually, you will understand the depression. As you understand it, it will keep coming re less frequently and will disappear altogether. Maybe, but by that time it won't matter too much. Before enlightenment, I used to be depressed. After enlightenment, I continue to be depressed. Wakefulness. That's where you are likely to get, gradually, or rapidly, or suddenly. The state of wakefulness, which is the state where you drop desires, but remember what I said, I meant by desire. Craving, meaning, unless I get what I desire, I refuse to be happy. I've made my happiness depend on the fulfillment of this desire. Desire in this sense, to drop desire, to drop illusion. Not to suppress desire, because then you'd become lifeless. You'd be without energy. That would be terrible. Desire in the healthy sense of the word is energy. And the more energy we have, the better. That's marvelous. That's wonderful. So don't suppress that now. Understand it. Understand it. Don't seek to fulfill the desire so much as to understand the desire. And don't just renounce the objects of your desire. Understand them. See them in their true light. See them for what they are really worth. Because if you just suppress your desire and you attempt to renounce the object of your desire, you're likely to be tied to it. Whereas you, if you look at it and see it for what it is really worth, if you understand how you are preparing the ground for misery and disappointment and depression, your desire will then be transformed into what I called a preference. Remember? You've got a baby boy. Oh, I'm quite happy because that was my second choice. Remember? Now, when you go through life with plenty of preferences, but you don't let your happiness depend on any one of them, then you're awake. You're moving towards wakefulness. And then dropping your illusions Happiness, call it what you wish, is the state of non-illusion where you see things 
not as you are, but as they are, in as much as this is possible to the human being. To drop illusions, illusions, to see things, to see reality. Every time you are unhappy, you have added something to reality. It is that addition that makes you unhappy. I'll repeat that. You have added something. There is a negative reaction in you. Reality provides the stimulus. You provide the reaction. You have added something. And if you examine what you have added, there's always an illusion there. There's a demand, an expectation, a craving. Always. Examples of illusions, they are bound. But as you begin to move ahead along this path, you will discover them for yourself. For instance, the illusion, the error of thinking, but that by changing the exterior world, you change. You do not change if you merely change your exterior world, if you're, you get yourself a new job, or a new spouse, or a new home, or a new guru, or a new spirituality. That doesn't change you. It's like imagining that you change your handwriting by changing your pen. Or that you change your capacity to think by changing your hat. That doesn't change you really. And most people spend all of their energy attempting to rearrange the exterior world to suit their tastes. And sometimes they succeed, you know, for about five minutes. And they get a little respite. And they're tense even during that respite. Because life is always flowing. Life is always changing. And if you want to live you must have no permanent abode. You must have nowhere to rest your head. You have to flow with it. As the great Confucius says, the one who would be constant in happiness must frequently change. Flow. But we're looking back, are we not? and clinging to things in the past, and clinging to things in the present. When you set your hand to the plow, you may not look back. You want to enjoy a melody, you want to enjoy a symphony, don't hold on to a few bars of the music now. Don't hold on to a couple of notes, let them pass, let them flow. The whole enjoyment of a symphony lies in your readiness to allow the notes to pass. Whereas if a particular bar were to take your fancy and you would shout to the orchestra to keep playing it again and again and again, that wouldn't be a symphony anymore. Are you familiar with those tales of Nasruddin? There's one tale of Nasruddin, the old mullah, He's a kind of a legendary figure. The Greeks, the Turks, the Persians, they all claim him for themselves. So there he was. He would give his mystical teachings in the form of stories, generally funny stories. And the butt of the story was generally old Nasruddin himself. So Nasruddin was one day strumming a guitar, or he was playing one note. And after a while, a crowd collected around him. This was in the marketplace. And one of the men there in the crowd said, that's a nice note you're playing, Mullah. But uh, why don't you vary it a bit like the other musicians? Nasruddin says, those fools, they're searching for the right note. I found it. <laughs> when you cling, life gets destroyed. When you hold on to anything, you cease to live. 
It's all over the gospel pages. And one attains this, my dears, by understanding. Understand. Understand another illusion that happiness is not the same as excitement. It's not the same as thrills. That's another illusion. A thrill comes from the fulfillment of a desire, of a craving. It breeds anxiety. And sooner or later, it brings its hangover. When you have suffered sufficiently from this, then you're ready to see it. You're feeding yourself on thrills. This is like feeding a racehorse with delicacies. You're giving it cake and wine. You don't feed a racehorse on that. This is like feeding a human being on drugs. You don't fill your stomach on drugs. You need good, solid, nutritious food and drink. Now you need to understand this for yourself. And there is another illusion that someone else can do this for you. That some savior or guru or teacher can do this for you. Not the greatest guru in the world can take one step for you. You've got to take it yourself. St. Augustine says so marvelously, Jesus Christ himself could do nothing for many of his hearers. Or as I said to you the other day, that lovely Arab saying, the nature of the rain is the same, and yet it produces thorns in the marsh and flowers in the garden. It is you who have to do it. No one else can help you. It is you who have to digest your food. It is you who have to understand. No one else can understand for you. It is you who has to see. Nobody can see for you. And if what you seek is truth, then you must do this. You can lean on no one. Or another illusion. The illusion that it is important to be respectable. It is important to be loved and to be appreciated. It is important to be important. That we have a natural urge to be loved and to be appreciated and to belong. That's false. Drop your illusion and you will find happiness. We have the natural urge is to be free. The natural urge is to love, as I shall explain later, but not to be loved. You know, sometimes I get a client in some of my psychotherapy sessions, and one very common problem is, nobody loves me. How could I be happy? And I explain to him or her, you mean... You never have any moment where you forget the fact that you're not loved and you let go and you're happy? Of course she has. She goes to a movie and she's all absorbed in the movie and it's a comedy and she's roaring with laughter and in that blessed moment she's forgotten to remind herself nobody loves me, nobody loves me, nobody loves me, nobody loves me and she's happy. Then she comes out of that theater with her friend, and her friend goes off with her boyfriend, her own boyfriend, and this girl's all alone, and she thinks, all my friends have their boyfriends. I've got no one. I'm so unhappy. Nobody loves me. This is like in India. Lots of our poorer people are beginning to acquire transistors, which is quite a luxury. Everybody got a transistor. I don't have a transistor. I'm so unhappy. But until everybody acquired a transistor, you were perfectly happy without one. <laughs> until somebody told you that you wouldn't be happy unless you were loved, you were perfectly happy. You become happy not by being loved, my dears, which means by being desired, by being attractive to someone. That's what you mean by being loved. You become happy by contact with reality. That's what brings happiness. By a moment-to-moment -moment contact with reality.
That's where you find God. That's where you find happiness. But most people are not even ready to hear that. All right, what can one do? Another illusion, the belief that reality external events have the power to hurt you, that other people have the power to hurt you. They don't. It is you who give it to them. Another illusion, you are all those labels that people have put onto you or that you have put onto yourself. You're not. You're not. So you don't have to cling to them. You know, the day somebody tells me I'm a genius and I take that seriously, I'm in big trouble. Can you understand why? Because I'm going to be tense now. I've got to live up to it. I've got to maintain it. I've got to keep it. I've got to find out after every lecture, did you like the lecture? Do you still think I'm a genius? See? So what you need to do is smash it. Smash it and you're free. Don't identify with those labels. That's what he thinks. That's how he experienced you at that minute. Are you a genius? Are you a nut? Are you a mystic? Are you crazy? Does it really matter? Provided you continued to be aware and you continued to live life from moment to moment. How marvelously described in those words. You want to know who the mystic is? You want to know who the awakened person is? Look at the birds of the air. Look at the lilies of the field. They do not toil. They do not spin. They do not gather up into barns. So why are you anxious? Can you, for all your anxiety, add a single moment to your life? Why bother about tomorrow? Is there a life after death? Will I survive death? Will... Why bother about tomorrow? Get in to today. Someone said, life is something that happens to us while we're busy making other plans. <laughs> That's pathetic. Live in the present moment. Now, this is one of the things that you will notice will happen to you as you're coming awake. You are living in the present. You are tasting every moment as you live it. Another fairly good sign. You're hearing the symphony, one note after the other. That brings me to what I said I would talk to you about. You could call it another theme, another topic. But it ties in very much with what I've been saying this morning and right now. Awareness. The things we add to reality. Let's take that one step at a time. Are you tired? Is it all right for me to go on to this next topic? I'll go on for a little while, then give you a break. you stand up and chat, etc. Now, Father Fitzpatrick, who's here told me the other day how he gave a talk here in New York when there was this, years ago, he got himself into Time magazine because he gave a talk when the Puerto Ricans were very unpopular because of some incidents that had happened here. Everybody was saying all kinds of things against the Puerto Ricans, etc. And he, he sort of gave a lecture somewhere here in New York where he said, well, let me read to you some of the things that the people of New York were saying about certain immigrants. And he was reading things that people were really saying about the Irish and about the Germans and about every new wave of immigrants that came in. I remember he put it very well that day at dinner. He said, these people don't bring delinquency with them. They become delinquents when they're here, when they're faced with certain situations. We've got to understand that. If you want to cure the situation, it's useless reacting from prejudice. You need understanding. You don't need condemnation. Not by saying, you dirty old sinner. No, 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 no. What's going on? Understand. Awareness. But in order to get awareness, you've got to see. 
And you cannot see if you're prejudiced. Now, I got news for you. Almost everything and person that we're looking at, we're looking at in a prejudiced way. It's almost enough to dishearten anybody. Take my friend. I meet him after a couple of years. And I say, hey, Tom, it's good to see you. And I give him a big hug. Whom am I hugging? The guy here or my memory of him? A living human being or a corpse? I'm just assuming that he's still the attractive guy that I thought he was. I'm just assuming that he still fits in with the idea I have of him, with my memories and associations, etc. And so I give him a hug. Five minutes later, I find he has changed. I got no interest in him. Hug the wrong person. You want to see how true this is? Listen. I get this from religious communities in India. Sister goes to make a course, or she goes for a retreat. Everybody in the community is saying, oh, we know. You know, that's part of her charism. She's always attending workshops and going to retreats. Nothing will ever change her. Now, it so happens that sister does change at this particular workshop or therapy group or whatever it is. She changes. Everyone notices the difference. Everyone says, my, you've really come to some insights, haven't you? And she says, yes, and she has. And they can see the difference in her behavior. You can see it in her body. You can see it in her face. You always do. When there's an inner change, it always registers in your face, in your eyes, in your body. Well, now, sister goes back to the community. And since the community has got a prejudiced meaning, fixed idea about her, they're going to look at her through the eyes of prejudice. They've got a picture of her stuck on their window, and they're looking at her through that picture. And they're the, they're the only ones who don't see any change. You know what they say? Oh, well, you know, she seems a little more heighty-flighty and a little more cheerful, but just hang around, she'll be depressed again. <laughs> and you know something? Within a couple of weeks, she's depressed again. She's reacting to their reaction. And they all say, see, we told you so. She hadn't changed. But the tragedy is that she had, only they didn't see it. What is a relationship? Ready for a bombshell? Hold on to your seats. Whatever a relationship may be, it certainly entails two things. Clarity of perception, in as much as we are capable of it. Some people would dispute to what extent we can attain this clarity of perception. But I don't think anyone would dispute that it is desirable that we move towards it. Clarity of perception. Accuracy of response you're more likely to respond accurately when you perceive clearly. When your perception is distorted, you're not likely to respond accurately. Tell me, how can you love someone whom you do not even see? Let's make it worse. Do you really see someone you're attached to? Do you really see someone you're afraid of? And therefore dislike? Because we always hate what we fear. Remember I told you, you have to be very careful with sentences of scripture. Because if you're sleeping, you'd very easily misunderstand it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
people say to me sometimes, hey, wait a minute, I hope you're understanding what you're saying, because we always hate what we fear. We always want to destroy and get rid of and avoid what we fear. When you fear somebody, you dislike that person in as much as you fear the person. And you don't see that person. Your emotion gets in the way. But that's just as true when you are attracted to someone. When love enters, you're going to find this hard to believe, you no longer like and dislike people in the ordinary sense of the word. You see them clearly and you respond accurately. Oh, at this level, this will go on, your likes and dislikes and preferences and attractions, etc., etc. You'd be fully human in the mechanical sense of the word and fully divine because this won't come in the way of love when you're aware of it. You will be aware of your prejudices, your likes, your dislikes, your attractions. They're all there. They come from your conditioning. Because tell me, what is it that you like? How come you like things that I don't like? Because your culture is different from mine. Your upbringing is different from mine. If I gave you some of the things to eat that I relish, you turn away in disgust. We've got people up there in certain parts of India who love, who enjoy dog flesh. And I know people who, if they were told they were being served dog steak, would vomit. Why? Different conditioning. Different programming. I could bring Hindus here who would vomit if they knew they had eaten beef. But you enjoy it. They say, but why won't they eat beef for the same reason that you don't eat your pet dog? The same reason, no other. Because the cow to the Indian peasant is what your pet dog is to you. That's what it is. So he doesn't want to eat it. They've got a whole cultural built-in prejudice against it which saves the animal that's needed for farming, etc. So, when you have... See, why do I fall in love with you really? Why is it that I fall in love with one type of person and not another? Because I've got a shopping list, see, inside. I'm conditioned. I've got a kind of an image subconsciously. This particular type of person appeals to me, attracts me. So when I meet this person, I fall head over heels in love. But have I seen her? No. I'll see her after I have married her. That's when the awakening comes. And that's when love may begin. But falling in love has nothing to do with love at all. That isn't love. That's desire. That's burning desire. You want, with all your heart, to be told by this adorable creature that you're attractive to her. That gives you a tremendous sensation. And everybody else is saying, what the hell does he see in her? <laughs> That's his conditioning. He's not seeing. They say, don't they, that love is blind. Believe me, there's nothing so clear-sighted as love. Nothing. The most clear-sighted thing in the world. Addiction is blind. Attachments are blind. Clinging and craving and desire is blind, but not love. Don't call that love. But of course the word has been desecrated in most modern languages. People talk about making love and falling in love. Like the little boy who says to the little girl, have you fallen in love? Have you ever fallen in love? She says, no, but I have fallen in like. So, what are people talking about when they fall in love? Now, the first thing, therefore, that we need is clarity of perception. Why do we not perceive people clearly? First, the first reason is evident. Our emotions get in the way. Our conditioning, 
our likes and our dislikes, we've got to grapple with that. But we've got to grapple with something much more fundamental, with our ideas, with our conclusions, with our concepts. Believe it or not, every concept which was meant to be a help to get in touch with reality, ends up by being a barrier to getting in touch with reality. Because sooner or later, we forget that the word is not the thing. The concept is not the thing. They're different. That's why I said to you the other day, the final barrier to finding God is the word God and the concept God. Comes in the way, if you're not careful. Was meant to be a help, can be a help, but can also be a barrier. Unless you realize very clearly that the word is not the thing. Metaphysics, or whatever you want to call it, but it's very, very simple. Listen to this. Every time I have a concept, it is something that I could apply to a number of individuals. We're not talking about a concrete particular name like Mary or John, which doesn't have a meaning. But when I have a concept, all other words are words that apply to any number of individuals, countless individuals, concepts are universal. For instance, I say tree, or I say leaf. Now the word leaf could be applied to every single leaf on that tree. You have the same word for all those individuals. You have the same word for all the leaves on all the trees in this campus, the big ones, the small ones, the tender ones, the dried ones, the yellow ones, the green ones, banana leaves, oak tree leaves, all types of leaves. If I say to you, I saw a leaf this morning, you you really don't have an idea of what I saw. Let's see if you can understand that. You do have an idea of what I did not see. I did not see an animal. I did not see a dog. I did not see a human being. I did not see a shoe. You have some kind of a vague idea of what I saw, but it isn't particularized. It isn't concrete. The Spanish philosopher Unamuno says, man, human being, but let's stick to man, not primitive man, not civilized man, not a grown-up man, not a child, not male, not female, not of this particular age or the other, not of this culture or the other, in other words, not man, because the human being is found Concrete. You never find a universal human being like your concept. Your concept points. But it is never entirely accurate. It misses uniqueness. It misses concreteness. For the concept is universal. And when I give you a concept, I give you something, and yet how little it is I have given you. So the concept, so valuable, so useful for science. For instance, if I said of every one of us here that we are animals, that would be perfectly accurate. But you know we're something more than animals. And so if I said, Mary Jane is an animal, that's true, but since I've omitted something essential to her, 
It's false. It does her an injustice. And when I call you a woman, that's true. But there are lots of things in you that don't fit into that concept. You are this particular, concrete, unique woman. That can only be experienced. It cannot be conceptualized. That I've got to see for myself. I've got to experience for myself. I've got to intuit for myself. The individual can be intuited, cannot be conceptualized. It's beyond the thinking mind. Lots of you would probably be proud to be called Americans, as lots of Indians, foolishly I think, would be proud to be called Indians. Because what is American? What is Indian? It's a convention. It's not part of your nature. But never mind about that now. And yet, even if you were proud to be called an American, if someone said to me, in reply to my question, who's Claire? And he says, Claire, she's an American. Oh, American. Ah, oh, well, I know, I know. Hey, she was quite proud to be an American. But when I said American, I know she feels insulted. Say, wait a minute, you really don't know. All you got is a label. You don't know me. See what I mean? The concept always misses, omits something extremely important, something precious that is found in reality, which is concreteness, uniqueness. Very important to understand that, as you recall, that the word, the concept, is not the thing. And so, the great Krishnamurti puts it so well when he says, the day you teach the child the name of a bird, the child will never see that bird again. How true. The first time that bird, the child sees that fluffy, alive, moving object, and you say to the kid, sparrow, sparrow, then tomorrow, when he sees another fluffy moving object that's similar to this one, he says, oh, sparrow, I've seen sparrows. I'm bored by sparrows. Do you know something? If you didn't look at things through your concepts, you'd never be bored. Every single thing is so unique. Every sparrow is so unlike every other sparrow. Even in its similarity, great help to find similarities so that we can abstract, so that we can have a concept. Great help from the point of view of communication, indication, science, but also very misleading and a great hindrance to seeing this concrete individual. And what about this particular sparrow? It keeps changing, you know, from moment to moment. But we're coming to that immediately. The first drawback in a concept is that the concept is abstract. Reality is concrete. I don't think anyone would quarrel with that. So if all that you experience is your concept, you're not experiencing reality because reality is concrete. The concept is a help to lead you to reality. But when you come there, then you've got to intuit or experience it directly. Second quality of the concept. <clears throat> it is static. Reality is in flow. We know enough to realize this. <clears throat> we have the same name for the Niagara Falls. But that whole body of water is constantly changing. How could you ever invent different words <clears throat> for each little movement of the river? You've got a word river. But that water is constantly flowing. The word remains static. You've got one word for your body. But all the cells in your body are constantly being renewed. <laughs> 
That's another drawback in the concept when it is compared to reality. And to give you an idea of what it is like, let's suppose there's an enormous wind outside here and I want the people in my country to get an idea of what an American gale or hurricane is like. So I, I capture it in a cigar box and I go back home and say, behold, well, it isn't a gale any longer, is it, once it's captured. Or I want you to get the feel of what the flow of water in a river is like, and I bring it to you in a bucket. Well, the moment I put it into a bucket, it stopped flowing. The moment you put it into a concept, it stopped flowing. It became static. It became dead. Something like a frozen wave. A frozen wave is not a wave. A wave is essentially movement. It is action. And when you freeze it, it's not a wave. Concepts are always frozen. Reality flows. Finally, if we are to believe the mystics, and it doesn't take too much uh, of an effort to understand this, or even believe it, one can see it at once. Reality is whole. Words and concepts fragment reality. They give us little fragments. That is why it is so difficult to translate from one language to another. Because each language cuts reality up differently. The English word home is impossible to translate into French or Spanish. Casa is not quite home. It has associations which uh, are peculiar to the English language. Every language has untranslatable words, words and verbs and expressions. Because we're, we're cutting reality up and adding something or subtracting something and usage keeps changing. Reality is a whole. Then we cut it up and make concepts and words to indicate different parts. But if you had never seen an animal in your life, and one day you found a tail, just a tail, you've never seen an animal in your life, and somebody said to you, that's a tail, would you have any idea of what that was, unless you had some idea of what an animal is? And unless you had some, couldn't be an idea, because ideas essentially fragment. Some vision, intuition, experience of reality as a whole. Would you really know what each fragment means? This is what the mystics are perpetually telling us. Words cannot give you reality. They only point. They only indicate. You use them as pointers to get to reality. But once you get there, you cannot, your concepts are helpless. Like the dispute that a Hindu priest had with a philosopher who claimed that the final barrier to God was the word God, the concept God. So he went to debate with him. And the philosopher replied, the ass that you mount and that you use to get to a house is not the means by which you enter the house. You've got to dismount. You use the concept to get there. Then you dismount. You get beyond it. Now, you don't need to be a mystic to understand this, that reality is something that cannot be captured by words or concepts. If you would understand, if you would know what reality is, you would have to know beyond knowing. Do those words ring a bell? Those of you who are familiar with the cloud, you've got to go beyond knowing. You've got to know beyond concepts, beyond words. 
poets, painters, mystics, the great philosophers, they, they have intimations of this, intuitions of this. Now comes the big part. Let's suppose that one day I'm watching a tree. Until now, every time I saw a tree, I said, well, you know, tree. But today when I'm looking at the tree, I don't see a tree. At least, I don't see what I've been accustomed to seeing. Suddenly I see something with the freshness of the vision of the child. There's no word for it. I see something that's unique, that's flowing, that's whole and not fragmented. And I'm in wonder. Now when I come back and you say, what did you see? What do you think I'd say? Ah, oh, that's a... No word for it. There is no word for reality. Because as soon as I put a word to it, we're back into concepts again. I could tell you a story. And if you have the sense of a mystic, you might get a clue to what I'm talking about. But I cannot give you a description. My dears, if I cannot express this reality that I experience or intuit when I look at a tree, when you talk about expressing God, what are you talking about? If I cannot express this reality that is visible to my senses, when I penetrate, I get beyond words and concepts and see how does one express what cannot be seen by the eye or the ear. How does one find a word for it? Are you beginning to understand what Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, and all of them were saying? What the church teaches constantly when she says, God is mystery, unintelligible to the human mind. What the great Karl Rahner said in one of his last letters when he wrote to a young German drug addict who wrote to him for advice and talked to him about God. He says, you, theologian, you talk about God. How could this God be relevant in my life? How could I get rid of my drug? And Rana says to him, I must confess to you, in all honesty, that for me, God is, and has always been, absolute mystery. I do not understand what God is. No one can. We have intimations, inklings, that we falteringly, inadequately attempt to put into words, but there is no word for it. There is no sentence for it. I'm talking to a group of theologians in London, I think it was, he said to them, the task of the theologian is to explain everything through God and to explain God as unexplainable. Unexplainable mystery. One doesn't know. One cannot say. One says, ah, ah, ah. And when one reveals God, one is using words is not one. One is using concepts. And once again, all the great mystics in the Catholic Church, in all the Christian churches, in all the religions are telling us those words are pointers. They're not descriptions. They don't fit. They indicate. They give you a clue. Now, tragically, people fall into idolatry because they think that where God is concerned, the word is the thing. Now, could, how could you get so crazy? Can you be crazier than that? That where... 
human beings are concerned and trees and leaves and plants and animals, the word is not the thing. But where God is concerned, the word is the thing. What are you talking about? That's why I told you last night about that famous internationally known scripture scholar who attended this course of mine in San Francisco a couple of years ago and said to me, my God, after listening to you, I understand that I've been an idol worshiper all my life. And as I said to you last night, he said this right out in the open there. Big man. It never struck me that I had been an idol worshiper. My idol was not made of wood or of metal. It was a mental idol. And these are the more dangerous idol worshippers. Very subtle substance that is used to produce this God who has no name, no form, no image. There are only indications. There are clues. More about this when I talk about the scriptures. What I'm leading you to this afternoon is the following. Awareness of reality around you. Do you remember I said, what is awareness? It means to watch, to observe what is going on within you and around you. Going on, pretty accurate. Because things are going on. The trees, the grass, the plants, the animals, the rocks, all of reality is moving. One observes it. One watches it. How essential it is for the human being to observe not just himself or herself, but all of reality. You are imprisoned by your concepts. Do you want to break out of the prison? Look. Observe. Spend hours observing. Watching. What? Anything. The faces of people. The shape and form of trees. A bird in flight. A pile of stones. Watch the grass grow. Get in touch with things. Look at them. Hopefully, you will break out of this habit, these rigid patterns that we have all developed, that our thoughts and our words have imposed on us. Hopefully, we will see. What will we see? This thing that we choose to call reality whatever is beyond these words and concepts. That is a spiritual exercise connected with spirituality, connected with breaking out of your cage, out of the imprisonment of your concepts and words. How sad if you would have passed through life and never seen it again with the eyes of a child. Don't lose your concepts, they're very precious. As a matter of fact, we begin without them. Then we develop concepts because concepts have a very positive function. Thanks to them, it would seem we develop this thing called intelligence. We're even able to then understand the limitations of concepts. Anyone who never learned a language, who was never programmed, was never given words and concepts, would, it would seem, have no intelligence at all. And so we're invited not to become children, but to become like little children. We have to fall from the stage of innocence. We have to be thrown out of paradise and develop this I, this me, thanks to these concepts. 
And then we need to return to paradise again. We need to be redeemed again. We need to put off the old man, the old nature, the conditioned self, and return to the state of the child. But without being children anymore. So we start off looking at reality in wonder. But it isn't the intelligent wonder of the mystic. It's the formless wonder of the child. Then the wonder dies and is replaced by boredom as we develop language and words and concepts. Then hopefully, if we're lucky, we return to the wonder again. Doug Hammarskjöld, the, that UN, former UN Secretary General, puts it so beautifully. God does not die, he says, the day we deny his existence, but we die on the day that our lives cease to be illumined by the radiance of a wonder which we can never describe, which is quite beyond us. We die the day our lives cease to be illumined by that radiance, that wonder. And we don't have to quarrel about a word because God is only a word, is it not? God is only a concept. One never quarrels about reality. We only quarrel about opinions, about concepts, about judgments. Don't seek for truth. Only drop your concepts. Drop your opinions. Drop your prejudices. Drop your judgments, and you will see. You know, that was philosophy. That was metaphysics. How did you, how did you like it? Not bad, huh? <laughs> well, that's, I think that will be the toughest session of all the ones we've had. Thought I'd bring you this little quote from St. Thomas. Uh, how about giving it to you in Latin for... <laughs> Quia de Deo, shire non possumus, quid sit, sed quid non sit, non possumus considerare de Deo, quomodo sit, sed quomodo non sit. This is the introduction to his whole Summa Theologica. Since we do not know what God is, but what God is not, we cannot tell you God's way of being, but rather the way he is not. Then uh, I gave you his uh, De Trinitate. The loftiest degree of our knowledge of God is to know God as the unknown, tamquam ignotum. And in his Questio Disputata de Potentia Dei 7, he says, this is what is ultimate in the human knowledge of God, to know that we do not know God. This is what is ultimate in the human knowledge of God, to know that we do not know God. This gentleman was considered the prince of theologians, as I told you yesterday. He was certainly acquainted with the scriptures. He was a mystic and a canonized saint. We're standing on pretty good ground. Then what was he talking about when he talked about God? And what is the meaning of the scriptures? More about that later. See, I keep you coming that way. They... In India, we have a Sanskrit saying for this kind of thing. It is, neti, neti. Not that. Not that. Sometimes referred to as the via negativa negative way. You know, uh, I read a marvelous work by the famous C.S. Lewis. It's a little booklet, uh, A Grief Observed. It was his diary 
when his wife died, he married, he married an American woman, said to his friends, God gave me in my 60s what he denied me in my 20s. I'm wildly in love. Fell in love with this woman, married her, and he had hardly married her when she died a painful death of cancer. Then C.S. Lewis says, the whole of my faith crumbled like a house of cards. He was the great Christian apologist. And when disaster struck home, then he, he asks himself, is God a loving father or is he the great vivisector? Pretty good evidence for both things. And uh, you can look at things in a somewhat slanted way and push aside evidence of the contrary. Remember when my own mother got cancer, my sister said to me, uh, Tony, why did God allow this to happen to mother? I said, my dear, last year a million people died in China of starvation, of a drought. They calculated it almost a million. You never raised the question. And so sometimes the nicest thing that could happen to us, for us to be awakened to reality, is for calamity to strike. Then we begin to rethink then you might lose your beliefs and come to faith, your childish beliefs and come to faith, as C.S. Lewis did. Do read that book. It's marvelously written. He said, you know, I never had any doubt before about people surviving death. But when my wife died, my, I was no longer certain. Why? Because it was so important to me that she be living. And, you know, he's the master of comparisons and analogies. He says it's like a rope. Someone says to you, would this uh, carry a, uh, would this bear the weight of about uh, uh, 120 pounds? And you say, yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to let down your best friend on this rope. You say, wait, wait a minute, let me test that again. <laughs> now you're not so sure. And somewhere in that diary, he says a marvelous thing. I was so happy and consoled, this was years ago, to find him say, we know nothing about God. We cannot know anything about God. Even our very questions about God are absurd. Marvelous. Of course your questions are absurd. Why? It's like the person born blind, the man born blind, who says to you, that color green, is it hot or is it cold? Nati, nati, not that, not that. Is it uh, long or is it short? Not that. Is it sweet or is it sour? Not that. Is it uh, round or is it uh, oval or is it square? Not that. Not that. See, he's coming from the other senses, from his limited experience. He has no words, or no concepts for this world of which he has no idea, no intuition, no experience. The world of colors. One can only speak in analogies. Not that. No matter what he asks, it isn't that. Your wording is wrong. Your question is absurd. So, C.S. Lewis says something like this. I'm not quite sure I've got the exact uh, words, but it's something like this. It's like asking... How many minutes are there in the color yellow? And everybody's taking it very seriously and discussing it and fighting about it. You know what the answer to that question is? How many minutes are there in the color yellow? 25 carrots. <laughs> and the other guy says, no, 17 potatoes. And then they're fighting. Not that. Not that. The ultimate, this is what is ultimate in the human knowledge of God, to know that we do not know. Our great tragedy, my dears, is that we know too much. We think we know. That is our tragedy. And so we never discover. In fact, Thomas Aquinas is not only a theologian, he's a great philosopher. And he says repeatedly, 
in many places. All the efforts of the human mind cannot exhaust the essence of a single fly. Cannot. We really have no notion of the nature of a fly, of a, an individual fly. Just what I was telling you yesterday. The concept is abstract. The reality, concrete, etc. He puts it in his own unique way. The limitations of the human mind. The danger we have of equating the concept with reality and as a result, never coming in touch with reality. Now, I also quoted Doug Hammerschel. Uh, you know, I like to be exact and I'm afraid the quote I gave you was from memory and wasn't quite accurate. The original is much more beautiful. He says, God does not die on the day we cease to believe in a personal deity. But we die on the day when our lives cease to be illumined by the steady radiance renewed daily of a wonder, the source of which is beyond all reason. But we die on the day when our lives cease to be illumined by the steady radiance renewed daily of a wonder, the source of which is beyond all reason. It's something beyond this conceptualizing mind of ours, which when perceived, intuited, however dimly, creates the wonder and our lives become illumined. Marvelously put. But more about this when I talk about scripture. I want to say something more about words. I said to you yesterday, words are limited. There's something more I have to add. There are some words that correspond to nothing. Words that have a very powerful influence on us. You know, when I use the word tree, it corresponds to something. When I say man or woman or child, that corresponds to something. But there are some words that correspond to nothing. Would you believe it? For instance, uh, talking of a situation back home, uh, I'm an Indian. Now we've got another country called Pakistan. Now let's suppose I am a prisoner of war in Pakistan. And they say to me, well, today we're going to take you to the frontier and you're going to take a look at your country. And so they bring me to the frontier. And I look across the border and I think, oh, my country, my beautiful country. I see villages and trees and hills. Like that thing of the poet, breathes there a man with soul so dead who never to himself has said, ma, you got it, yes. This is my own, my native land. And after a while, one of the guards says, excuse me, we made a mistake, sir. We have to move on another 10 miles. You know, it's fun. <laughs> what was I reacting to? Indian trees, Indian villages, Indian mountains. But you know something? Trees are not Indian. Trees are trees. There are no Indian trees. In a geographical map, there are no frontiers, no boundaries. Those were put there by the human mind, generally by stupid, avaricious politicians. That country of mine, once upon a time, was one. It's four now. And uh, if we don't look out, within a short time, it might be six. We'll have six flags. We'll have six armies. You never catch me saluting a flag. Me, never. Any flag. Never saluted. I abhor all national flags. I do. What are we saluting? I salute humanity. Not a flag with an army around it. Now, 
course, I, I live in a peculiar situation where I see flags coming up. These flags were in the heads of people. They're fighting for a convention. They're fighting for a frontier, which the human mind put there, but doesn't exist in reality. Now, I got news for you. There are thousands of words in our vocabulary that do not correspond to reality at all. But boy, they trigger emotions. They trigger off emotions within us. And we begin to see things which are not there. We actually see Indian mountains, but they don't exist. And we actually see Indian people, what do you know, they don't exist. They really don't. Oh, well, you know, you have your American conditioning. I have my American conditioning. That exists. Not a very happy thing. You know, in uh, our countries nowadays, in the third world countries, we talk a great deal about inculturation, culture, this thing called culture. Not very happy with it. Me, not very happy with it. Because part of our liberation is liberation from our culture. You mean you'd like to do something because you were conditioned to do it? You'd like to feel something because you were conditioned to feel it? Isn't that being mechanical? You got a stamp on you, and you uh, react according to that stamp. Ima imagine an American baby that is adopted by a Russian couple, taken over to Russia, has no notion that it was born American, because there is no such thing as American. So he's brought up talking Russian. He lives and dies for Mother Russia. He hates the American. He's all stamped with his own culture. He's steeped in his own literature. He's influenced and he looks at the world through the eyes of his culture. You want to wear your cultures the way you wear clothes, that's fine. You know, it's nice. The woman, Indian woman will wear a sari and the American woman will wear something else and the Chinese woman will wear something else and the Japanese woman will wear her kimono, that's nice. But nobody's identifying herself with the clothes. So you want to wear culture like that, that's nice. But then you become proud of your culture. They teach you to be proud of it. They teach you to be proud of your country. There are emotions, words that are emotionally charged. Nobody sits down and analyzes that. Remember how I told you, if you are affected or influenced by an experience you had with your father. Let me put it as forcefully as possible. There's this Jesuit friend of mine who says, anytime I see a poor person, a beggar, I cannot give this person an alms. I cannot not give this person an alms. I got that from my mother, he says. My mother, ever, ever since I was a kid, you know, he, he lived somewhere in the countryside in India, and any poor person who'd come there, well, his mother would offer that person a meal, etc. He said, I picked it up from her. I said to him, Joe, what you have is not a virtue. What you have is a compulsion. A good one, from the point of view of the beggar, but a compulsion nonetheless. You cannot not do this. I remember a Jesuit who said to us once, at a province meet, a kind of an intimate gathering of of the men of our Jesuit province there in Bombay. It's very nice to hear that. He said, I am 80 years old. I've been a Jesuit for 65 years. I have never once in all my life missed my hour of morning meditation. Never once. Nice. Could be very admirable. Or it could be a compulsion too. No great merit in that. If it's mechanical. The beauty of an action comes not from its having become a habit, but from sensitivity, from consciousness, from clarity of perception and accuracy of response. I may say yes to this beggar. I may say no to another. I'm not compelled by any conditioning, programming of my past experiences or my culture. Nobody has stamped anything on me, or if they have, I'm no longer reacting from that. 
it's like you have a bad experience with an American or you were bitten by a dog or you had a bad experience with a certain kind of food now for the rest of your life you're influenced by that experience too bad you need to be liberated from that don't carry over experiences from the past hey I see many of you nodding in assent how about carrying over good experiences from the past huh don't carry those either you know what it means to experience something fully then drop it and move on to the next moment uninfluenced by the previous one my you're traveling with such little baggage you could pass through the eye of a needle now you will know what eternal life is because eternal life is now in the timeless now only thus will you enter eternal life but how many things we carry with us and we never set about the task of freeing ourselves of dropping the baggage of being ourselves and I'm so sorry to say that everywhere I go I find Muslims who are using their religion and their worship and their Quran to distract themselves from this task instead of serving as a help serves as a distraction and the same applies to Hindus and you know who else <laughs> now you're very clever you're catching on quickly today now words 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 they have such an influence on us you know you're talking to somebody listen to this you're talking to somebody he seems a nice kind of guy and uh, somebody whispers into your ear Cardinal Archbishop it has an influence on your mind and on your nerves you're suddenly influenced by that the word see how it triggered off reactions within you can you imagine a human being who is no longer influenced by words who is only affected by reality you could give him any number of words he'll still give you a fair deal you could say cardinal archbishop but he'll still give you a fair deal he'll see you as you are he's uninfluenced by the label you could say Indian American Russian Chinese anything he is uninfluenced by labels so there it is the importance of understanding words and concepts if we are to attain awareness because I said to you awareness heals awareness transforms awareness puts us in touch with reality but that goes with understanding understanding how our mind functions and how we are being deceived by words and concepts there's one more thing I want to say about our perception of reality let me put it in the form of a of an analogy you've got the president of the United States now he has to get feedback or you've got the Pope in Rome who has to get feedback from the whole church now you've got millions of items that are supposed to be fed to the president but he could hardly take all of that in much less digest it so he has people whom he trusts to make abstraction abstracts to summarize things to uh, monitor to filter and then some of it gets to his desk now this is what's happening to us from every pore of our living cell of our body and from all the senses we're getting feedback from reality but we're filtering things out constantly who's doing the filtering very important to find out your conditioning your culture your programming the way you were taught to see things and to experience things even your language lots of filtering going on so that you will see things 
sometimes that are not there. And sometimes you don't see things that are there. That's so common. You've only got to look at a paranoid person who's feeling all threatened by something that isn't there, who's constantly interpreting reality in terms of certain experiences of the past or certain conditioning that he or she has. And there's another big crook inside there who's doing the filtering. It's called an attachment. Desire, craving. The root of sorrow is craving. Craving distorts perception. It destroys perception. You've got your fears and your desires. As Samuel Johnson said, the knowledge that he has, that he is to swing from a scaffold or that he is to be hanged within a week wonderfully concentrates a man's mind. <laughs> you blot out everything else. You've concentrated only on this. Fear. Or desire. Craving. Look how we, we have been brought up. We were drugged when we were young. And we were brought up to need people. For what? For acceptance. For approval. For appreciation. For applause. For what they call success. Here are words that do not correspond to reality. They're conventions. Like political realities. Conventions things invented, but we don't realize that they don't correspond to reality. Success, what is that? That is what this particular group decided is a good thing. Another particular group will decide it's a bad thing. What is good in Washington might be considered bad in a Cartusian monastery. Success in political circles might be considered failure in other circles. These are conventions. But we treat them like realities, don't we? Now, what happened to us when we were young? We were programmed. We were taught. We were programmed to unhappiness. This is amazing. You cannot not be unhappy. Why? Because they taught you, and they taught me, they taught all of us, that in order to be happy, you need, you name it, money, success, a beautiful or handsome partner in life, a good job, a friendship, spirituality, God, you name it. Unless you get these things, you're not going to be happy. You need them. Now that is what I call an attachment. An attachment is a belief that without something, you are not going to be happy. Once you get convinced of that, and my, that has got into our subconscious, it's got stamped into our nerves, to the roots of our being. But how could I be happy unless I have good health? You know, I'll tell you something. I have met people dying of cancer who are happy. But how could I be happy if I know I'm going to die? You all know of people who are happy when they're meeting death. But how could I be happy if I don't have money? You know something? This guy has got a million dollars in the bank and he's feeling insecure. The other guy has got practically no money and he doesn't seem to feel any insecurity at all. He was programmed differently, that's all. Useless exhorting the first guy about what to do. He needs understanding. He needs to understand. That's where I was talking about awareness. Exhortations are no great help, as I'm going to tell you very soon. You need to understand. You've been programmed. It's a false belief. See it as false. See it as a fantasy. And so what are people doing all through their lives? They're busy fighting. Fight, fight, fight. The conflict to what they call survival. But you know, when you talk to the average American, 
who says he or she is making a living, it isn't a living they're making. Oh no, they've got much more than enough to live. Come to my country and you'll see that. You mean you don't need all those cars to live, you really don't. You don't need a television set to live. You don't need all that makeup to live. You don't need all those clothes to live. To live, you don't need them. You really don't. But try to convince the average American of this. They've been brainwashed. They've been programmed. So conflict, work, effort, strife to get the desired object which will make them happy. Now, listen to this pathetic story. Your story, my story, everybody's story, till we understand it and break out. The story is this. They told us, until I get this object, I'm not going to be happy. Whatever it is. Money, friendship, anything. So I've got to strive to get it. Then when I've got it, I've got to strive to keep it. A temporary thrill. Oh, I'm so thrilled I got it. How long does that last? A few minutes. A couple of days. At the most, when you got your brand new car, how long did the thrill last? Uh, just as long as your next attachment was threatened. There's a funny thing about an attachment, you know. If you have a thousand attachments, you could satisfy 999, but if you haven't satisfied one, you're miserable. So, all right, I've got it. Thrill. Now, A, get tired of it after a while. They told me prayer was the big thing. They told me God was the big thing. They told me friendship was the big thing. Not knowing what prayer really was, not knowing what God really was, we made things out of them. After a while, we get bored, bored with the car. But we're still holding on to it. And we're still fending off threats. Isn't that pathetic? And if you've got one attachment, that's bad enough. When you have a couple of thousand, I mean, I mean, we're crazy. We're just crazy. And there's no way out. There simply is no way out. It's the only model we were given to be happy. We weren't given any other model. Our culture, our society, I'm sorry to say even our religion, gave us no other model. This is happening in all religions too, you know. Like... You've been appointed cardinal. What a great honor that is. Honor? Did you say honor? You used the wrong word. Now others are going to aspire to it. You lapsed into the world, what the Gospels call the world. And you're going to lose your soul. The world. Success. Honor, non-existent things, power, prestige, winning, especially over others, popularity. You gain the world, but you lost your soul. Your whole life has been empty and soulless. Nothing there. There's only one way out, and that is get deprogrammed. Get deprogrammed. How do you get that? Become aware of the programming. I'm going to be talking pretty soon about change. You cannot change by an effort of the will. You cannot change through ideals. You cannot change through building up new habits. Your behavior may change, but you don't. You only change through awareness and understanding. When you see a stone as a stone, a scrap of paper as a scrap of paper, you don't think that the stone is a precious diamond anymore, and you don't think that that scrap of paper is a check for a billion dollars. When you see that, you change. There's no violence anymore in attempting to change yourself. Otherwise, what you call change is moving the furniture around. Your behavior has changed, but not you. And I'm going to give you a whole session on understanding after the break. What does it mean to understand? 
How do we go about it? Attachment. You've got attachment. Consider how we're, we're enslaved by these things. And we're striving to rearrange the world so that I can keep my attachment. Because the world is a constant threat to my attachment. Everything keeps changing. So does this thing. It's all changing. Everything is changing. So is my friend. And my God, how insecure I am. He may stop loving me. He may, be, he, he may go out to somebody else. Hey, hey, hey wait a minute. And I've got, to, I've got to keep on making myself attractive to him because I've got to get him. Because somebody brainwashed me into thinking that I need his love. I don't. I really don't. Not in order to be happy, I don't. I don't need anybody's love. I just need to get in touch with reality. That's all. I need to break out of this prison of mine, this programming, this conditioning, these false beliefs, these fantasies, and break out into reality. And reality is lovely. Reality is an absolute delight. Eternal life is now. We're surrounded by it, like the fish in the ocean. But we have no notion about it at all. We're too distracted with this, with the attachment. And so, temporarily the world does rearrange itself to suit our attachment and we say, Yay, great, my team won. But hang on, it'll change. You're going to be depressed tomorrow. Why do we do this? Why are we so hard on ourselves? And have you noticed all those negative feelings we have, you're jealous. Where does your jealousy come from? Look for the attachment underneath. Somebody is getting what you want and what you think you will not be happy without. You're anxious and frightened. You're getting paranoid. Your attachment has been threatened. See if you can understand that. I'll go slowly. You're getting angry. Somebody is likely to come in the way of your getting your attachment or your keeping your attachment. Or else why would you be angry? Because you're convinced you're not going to be happy without this. You're not going to be happy without that. You've got cravings. And so it goes on, all those negative feelings. Just scratch a bit on the surface, under the surface, probe under the surface, and the attachment will come to light. How about a little exercise, a couple of minutes? And it is this. Think of something or someone you are attached to. In other words, think of something or someone without which or without whom you think you are not going to be happy. Could be your job, your career, your profession, your friend, your money, or whatever. And say to it, him, her, I really do not need you to be happy. I'm only deluding myself into the belief that without you, I will not be happy. I'm only deluding myself into the belief that without you, I will not be happy. But I really don't need you for my happiness. I can be happy without you. You are not my happiness. You are not my joy. Boy, if it's a he or a her, he's not going to be too happy to hear that, you know. But go ahead, you can say it within the secrecy of your heart. Because you're making contact with the truth. 
you're smashing through a fantasy. Happiness is a state of non-illusion. Drop the illusion. Or you could try another exercise, if you'd rather do that. Think of a time you were heartbroken. You thought you'd never be happy again. Your husband died. Your wife died. Your best friend deserted you. You lost your money, or whatever. Think of the time you were a child, and you didn't get what you want, or you lost what you had. And you said, I'll never be happy again. What happened? Time went on. And if you manage to pick up another attachment, if you manage to find somebody else you were attracted to, <clears throat> or something else that you were attracted to, <clears throat> what happened to the old attachment? You didn't really need it, did you, to be happy? That should have taught us, but we never learn, we're programmed, we're conditioned. Then I'll give you a few seconds to think, my how liberating not to depend emotionally on anything. If you could get even one second's experience of that, you're breaking through your prison and getting a glimpse of the sky. Someday maybe you will fly. Okay, who wants to begin? Yes. I was afraid to say this. But I talked to God. And I told him, I don't need him. My initial reaction was, this is so contrary to everything that I've been brought up. And yet, and yet I, I said, if he is the God that I think he ought to be, he is not going to imprison me. And that's where I left him. All right. If you think that unless you get God, you're not going to be happy, this God you're thinking of has nothing to do with God. You're thinking of a dream state, of a thing, of a person. You're thinking of your concept. And sometimes you have to get rid of God in order to find God. Lots of mystics tell us that. When you drop your attachments, when you drop your clinging, when you drop your baggage, Think of the baggage we carry. If I use the word happiness, you know what most... Gee, the amount of times I catch myself doing this. Am I happy? Thinking, I got a great film coming up tonight, and I got... What's the future got to do with it? What has yesterday got to do with it? But we're constantly somewhere else. As somebody said, my favorite place is somewhere else. <laughs> We're always somewhere else. But to attain the asceticism and the delight of being here now, and when now goes, let it go, then we will know what reality is, what God is. Uh, the concept is a help, as I will tell you later. But we've always to beware lest it become a hindrance. Joe? Tony, aren't you really programming the process of deprogramming? <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad comment at all. That's not a bad comment. I think I would be if I'd be telling you how to do it. All I'm saying is be aware. Be aware. There are two things. There is programming and there is awareness. And the two are opposed to each other. Where awareness comes in, programming dies. When you're listening to me, as I said to you on the first day, if you're just swallowing everything I'm saying, you're getting programmed. And lots of people do, you know. 
I'm a great brainwasher, I really am. Uh, well, that's not quite accurate. The way I speak very easily lends itself to gullible people getting brainwashed. That's more accurate. But if you're neither resisting what I'm saying nor swallowing, ah, oh, that's wonderful. You're open. You're saying, I'd like to take a look at that. Somebody else here? Yes. Someone you desire greatly? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, oh yes, oh yes. You, you begin by doing it in fantasy and role playing. Yes. Yes, you, you'd better prepare your wife before you tell her this truth. <laughs> Yes, I, I know. Isn't it amazing, though, that we uh, have been so blinded by everything that we did not discover this basic truth? I remember how frightened I was to say this to an intimate friend of mine when I, I sensed it was true. I really don't need you, period, for, what, for anything. I don't need you. I can be perfectly happy without you. Result, I enjoy your company thoroughly. There's no more anxiety, no more jealousy, no more possessiveness, no clinging. It, it is a delight to be with you. I'm enjoying you on a non-clinging basis. You're free. So am I. My, but this is like talking a foreign language to drug addicts. We've been drugged. We really have been. It took me many, many months to truly understand this, and mind you, I'm a Jesuit, brought up, brought up in the tradition of St. Ignatius, whose spiritual exercises are really all about this. And I'd missed the point, because my culture and my society, not my religious society, but the society in India in general, society, had, I mean, you take it for granted, Jesus had friends, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are we talking about? Because you know something? The moment you desire somebody in this way, namely, without you, I will not be happy, you cease to see that person. You're no longer objective. You're clinging. We begin to view people in terms of our attachment. If you're attached to appreciation, you know, I'm quite amused sometimes to see even seemingly objective people like therapists and spiritual directors, etc., say, great guy, great guy. You know, I really like him. And I find out later it's because he likes me that I like him. And anybody who attacks me, I don't like. Hey, so when someone's for you, he's okay. And when someone's against you, he's not okay. Then I look into myself and I find the same thing coming up every now and then. If you're attached to appreciation and praise, you're going to view people in terms of their threat to your attachment or their fostering your attachment. If you're a politician and you want to be voted in, how do you think you're going to look at people? How will your interest in people be guided? Who's the guy who's going to get me the votes? Who's the woman who's... And so it goes on. And if what you're interested in is in sex, how do you think you're going to look at men and women if you're attached to sex? And if you're attached to power, and so on and on and on. That colors your view of human beings. An attachment destroys your capacity to love. What is love? Love is sensitivity. Love is consciousness. To give you uh, an example, I'm sitting here listening to a symphony. If all I hear is the sound of the drums, I don't hear the symphony. What is a loving heart? 
a loving heart is one that is sensitive to the whole of life, to all persons. <clears throat> a heart that doesn't harden itself to any person or thing. But the moment you become attached, in my sense of the word, then you're blotting out many other things. You've got eyes only for the object of your attachment. You have ears only for the drum. The heart has got hardened. Moreover, it has got blinded because you no longer see the object of your attachment objectively. You cannot be objective anymore. Love entails clarity of perception, objectivity. There is nothing so clear-sighted as love. Then the heart remains soft and sensitive. But when you're hell-bent on getting this thing or that or the other, you become ruthless, you become hard, you become insensitive. But all you need is a few minutes reflection to see this. How can you love people when you need people? You can only use them. When you need them emotionally. If I need you to make me happy, I cannot love you. I got to use you. I got to manipulate you. I got to find, find ways and means of winning you. I cannot leave you free. I can only love people when I have emptied my life of people. When I die to the need for people. Then I'm right in the desert. And in the beginning, it feels awful. It feels lonely. But if you can take it for a while, you'll suddenly discover that it isn't lonely at all. It is solitude. It is aloneness. And the desert begins to flower. And at last you know what love is, what God is, what reality is. But giving up the drug in the beginning can be tough unless you have a very keen understanding or and you have suffered enough. It's a great thing to have suffered. Then you're sick of it. Make use of suffering to end the suffering. But people suffer and they go on suffering. And that's why I said to you, the, the conflict within me sometimes between the role of spiritual director and therapist. As therapist, well, let's ease the suffering. All right. As the spiritual director in me says, let her suffer. She'll get sick of this way of relating to people. And she'll finally decide to break out of this prison of emotional dependence on anyone. Am I making sense? Big conflict at times. Shall I offer a palliative or remove the cancer? Not easy to decide, I'll tell you that. And uh, when the cancer becomes painful enough, you're right, you're ready, if you have understanding. And you're ready to watch it. Uh, he says, first book, and he slams it on the table. Let him keep slamming it on the table. Don't pick the book up. All right. Lots of work to be done in the spiritual life. So much work. Spirituality is awareness. Awareness, 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 awareness. The day you begin to understand how you are really picking up things that have no connection with you at all. Like in the old days, and I guess my story is almost everyone's story. Somebody was angry with me. Gee, there's something wrong with me. Because that's the way we've been drugged. That's the way we've been programmed by our parents. When mother got angry with you, she didn't say there's something wrong with me. She said there's something wrong with you or I wouldn't be angry. Until I made the great discovery that if you are angry, darling, there's something wrong with you. So you'd better cope with your anger. 
stay with it and cope with it. It's not mine. Now, whether there's something wrong with me or not, I'll examine independently of your anger. I'm not going to be influenced by your anger. And the funny thing is, when I can do this without feeling any negativity towards you, I can be quite objective towards myself too. Because only a very aware person can do this. Not pick up the guilt, not pick up the anger. You're having a tantrum, too bad. I don't feel the slightest desire to rescue you anymore. And I refuse to feel guilty. I must talk about guilt. It's like, I'm not going to hate myself for anything I have done. Because it gets you nowhere. That's what guilt is. I'm not going to give myself a bad feeling and whip myself for anything I have done, right or wrong. I'm ready to analyze it, to watch it, and say, well, if I did wrong, as I will show you presently, it was an unawareness. I was hypnotized. Nobody does wrong in awareness. And that's why theologians tell us, nicely, it's very beautifully said, that Jesus could do no wrong. Now that makes very good sense to me, because the enlightened person can do no wrong. What do you think? Was Jesus free? You mean he couldn't do wrong and he was free? Because he was free, he couldn't do wrong. Now, since you can do wrong, you're not free. So you're not free. That's a pretty nice bind you've got yourself into, isn't it? Well, that's, it's interesting. You know, if I'm sitting here and somebody comes up to me and says, are you free? I say, yes, I'm free. Well, here's this machine gun. He gives me a light machine gun. He says, why don't you mow all these people down? I say, excuse me. I'm not free to do that. I got too much sensitivity to people to be able to do that. I cannot do it. Does that make sense to you? As soon as you have a sensitive heart, you cannot do this. You simply cannot do it. Could you do it? He says, yeah, I can. I can. All right, sit here. He sits here. And he say, wait a minute, this isn't freedom, this is a sickness. You need healing. This has far-reaching consequences. You know, I was telling you about this power of words and concepts. Your Mark Twain put it very nicely once when he said, cold, he says, if the thermometer had been an inch longer, we would have frozen to death. That's pretty accurately put, you know. We do freeze to death on words. It's like, it's not the cold outside that matters, but the thermometer. It's not reality that matters, but what you're saying to yourself. You know, they, they told me a lovely one about a guy in Finland. You know, when they were drawing up the Russian-Finland border, there was a farmer who had to decide whether he wanted to be in Finland or Russia as they were drawing the boundary line. So after a long time, he said he wanted to be in Finland. And uh, he didn't want to offend the Russian officials who came up to him and demanded to know why did he want to be in Finland. And the guy says, you know, it has always been my desire to live in Mother Russia. But at my age, I wouldn't be able to survive another Russian winter. So I want to be in Finland. That brings it out very well, doesn't it? It's only a word. It's only a concept. But it isn't. Not for human beings. Not for crazy human beings. There was a man who once attacked a guru, the master, for claiming this. That human beings were mostly reacting to words, not to reality. As I explained to you this morning, the governor, a beggar, an Indian, an American, the Cardinal, Archbishop, the Pope, Mother Teresa. I wonder how many would be capable of seeing Mother Teresa? Or would they be seeing what they heard about her? Or would they be seeing what they're expecting? So we're frequently not looking at reality. We're almost never looking at reality. So this master was attempting to explain to them how human beings uh, react to words. They feed on words. They live on words. They're perishing because they're living on words, not on reality. They're not getting nourished on reality. 
So one of the men stood up there and protested. He said, I don't agree that words have all that effect on us. And the master said, sit down, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and the man went livid with rage. He, he, he said, you call yourself an enlightened person, you call yourself a master, you ought to be ashamed of me, and so on and on for a couple of minutes. And the master said, pardon me, sir, I just got carried away. I really beg your pardon. Uh, pardon me, that was a lapse, I'm sorry. So the man calmed down, and the master said, it took just a few words to get a whole tempest within you and a few words to calm you down, didn't it? Words, 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 words. Who will liberate us from words? How valuable they are. How imprisoning if they're not used properly. Awareness, your conditioning drops automatically. That depends on the degree of your awareness. Sometimes it's greater, sometimes it's less. But remember that little exercise I gave you yesterday when I said, don't identify with the feeling? The feeling will go on in the beginning. But as you disidentify, the intensity will diminish. And there are times when you get a flash of awareness, and in that flash, it drops altogether. So, there are degrees of awareness, and we move into that. And sometimes we have more, and sometimes we have less. Towards the end of this session, I hope to give you, or the beginning of the next one, I hope to give you a little exercise to show you the difference between knowledge and awareness, between information and awareness. I said, one cannot do evil in awareness. One can do evil in knowledge or information. You know that this thing is bad, but you're really not aware. Father, forgive them because they do not know. They're not aware of what they are doing. I am the greatest of sinners, for I persecuted the church of Christ. But friends, I did it unawares. If they had been aware that they were crucifying the Lord of glory, they would never have done so. A time will come when they will persecute you and they will think they're doing a service to God. What do you know? Thomas Aquinas puts it so nicely. He says, every time someone sins, they're sinning under the guise of good. They're blinding themselves. They're seeing something as good, even though they know it is bad. They're telling themselves in some way. They're rationalizing because they're seeking something as good under the pretext of good. But more about that when we talk of freedom. Anyone else? Yes. It's very freeing to become aware of an image of driving the traffic, and they're maintaining a steady rate, and lots of horns are blowing, and they're getting four-letter words on and I find it very difficult to maintain the serenity in the midst of that, the sense of the Are you saying that by beginning the process of awareness, eventually that nervousness will dissipate and that the peace will be released? Oh, that's my big search. Did you pick up your attachment there? Peace. Your attachment to calm peace. and peace. You're saying, unless I'm peaceful, I won't be happy. Did it ever occur to you, you could be happy in your tension? Before enlightenment, I used to be depressed. After enlightenment, I continue to be depressed. Ah, you hit upon something there. You see, if you don't make a goal out of relaxation and sensitivity, you ever heard of these people who get tense trying to relax? <laughs> Yes. They're making an effort to relax. Well, if one is tense, one observes one's tension. You will never understand yourself if you seek to change yourself. I'll be explaining that to you later when we talk about self-change. The harder you try to change yourself, the worse it gets. You are called upon to be aware. Get the feel of that telephone. Get the feel of the ring of the phone the jarred nerves.
get the sensation of that. Get the sensation of the steering wheel in the car. In other words, come to reality and leave the tension or the calmness to take care of itself. As a matter of fact, you will leave it to take care of yourself because you'll be too preoccupied or too occupied getting in touch with reality. See, this is what I mean. Uh, kind of step by step and let whatever happens, happens. You know, the real change will come about in you when it is brought about not by your ego, but by reality. Awareness releases reality to change you. You change. In sensitivity, you change. In consciousness and awareness, you change. But you've got to experience this. It's useless taking my word for it. And... But if you've got a plan, if your ego has drawn up a plan in its own cunning way and trying to push you into that, you'll meet with resistance. There'll be trouble. Who else? Pretty good questions. Yes. Yes. All right. The question is, is being awakened a, uh, a growing process? At times you're awake, at times you go to sleep, etc. You pick up the mild anxiety behind that. You want to be awake, don't you? You want to find out if you're really awake or not. Now, that's part of asceticism. It doesn't matter. How strange that sounds in a culture and a society where we've been trained to achieve goals, get somewhere. There's nowhere to go. You know why? Because you're there already. The Japanese have a nice way of putting it. The day you cease to travel, you will arrive. Now, if your attitude were, I want to be aware. I want to be in touch with whatever is. And let whatever happens, happen. If I'm awake, fine. If I'm asleep, fine. But the moment you make a goal out of it and you're attempting to get it, see what's happening there is you're seeking ego glorification, ego promotion. You want the good feeling that you've made it. I got news for you. When you make it, you won't know. Your left hand won't know what your right hand is doing. Lord, when did we do this? We had no awareness. Charity is never so lovely as when one has no consciousness that one is practicing charity. You mean I helped you? I was just enjoying myself. I was just doing my dance. It helped you. That's wonderful. Congratulations to you. No credit to me. Because tell me, if you're giving, giving Jesus the credit for all the good that happened to people when he spoke, hold on to your chairs now. Why aren't you blaming him for all the evil that happened to people when he spoke? If I had not come, they would not have sinned. Who's to blame? They are to blame. And when they benefited, who gets the credit? He. Hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. The rain that is exactly the same in its nature produces thorns in the marsh and flowers in the garden. That's up to you. So, when you attain, when you are aware, increasingly you will not be bothered about labels like awake or asleep. You know, I, I must say I cheated with all of you. I used it to use an Ignatian phrase, getting in through your door, arousing your curiosity, and I'm sorry to say, your spiritual greed, but greed nonetheless. Say, let's come awake. It's going to be wonderful. Well, that's for starters. After a while, it doesn't matter. One is aware because one lives. The unaware life is not worth living. And you will leave change to take care of itself. We have another question here. Yes. All right. The question is, the harder you try to change, the worse it gets. Is there a passivity there? 
Remember I said, the more you resist something, the greater power you give to it. So resist not evil. When someone strikes you on the right cheek, offer him your left as well. You always empower the demon you fight. That's very oriental. Flow with the enemy. And you overcome the enemy. How does one cope with evil? Not by fighting it, but by understanding it. In understanding, it disappears. How does one cope with darkness? Not with one's fists. You don't chase darkness out of the room with a broom. You turn on the light. But the more you fight darkness, the more real it becomes to you. And the more you exhaust yourself. But when you turn on the light of awareness, it melts. Watch this. Uh, scrap of paper. This is a billion dollar check. Uh, I must renounce it. The gospels say I must renounce it. Got to renounce it. Got to give it up. I want eternal life. Substitute one greed with another greed. Huh? Spiritual greed with the other greed. Before, you had a worldly ego. Now you've got a spiritual ego. But you've got an ego all the rest. All the same. Kind of a refined one. More difficult to cope with. I've got to get rid of it. So I'm giving it up. I'm really giving it up. I'm, but something in me is drawing me towards it. When you renounce something, you're tied to it. But if instead of renouncing it, I look at it, I say, hey, this isn't a million dollar check. This is a scrap of paper. Lost interest. Gone. Nothing to fight. Nothing to renounce. Or if I look under it and I say, heavens, look at the anxiety under this. Look at the pain. Look at the depressions that are going to follow. I don't want this. Give it up. Understanding. Awareness. Does that address itself to your question? Don't fight. Don't make efforts. Don't drag yourself somewhere. Find out what's going on. Like, if somebody has no appetite for food, and you force the kid to eat, come on, eat. No, no, no. What's called for is understanding. What's going on? Now, you have no appetite for happiness. You have no appetite for giving up your drug or whatever. What's going on? The violence will not change you. It might change your behavior. That's what I meant. But I have much more to say about it as we go along. About what does change really entail? How does meditation, how does understanding, how does awareness bring it about? Now, during these days, uh, certainly this would apply to quite a few of you, you have understood something or other about what's going on in you. And you've experienced some little change, have you? Some little change, some little insight. I'm going to show you how insight, awareness, understanding produces easy change. There's no residue of violence. If you call in the army and suppress the citizens of a city, there's going to be a mutiny, and you're going to invest a lot of force to keep them down. So it isn't violence and effort that's called for. Who else? Yes. All right, she doesn't understand what is real and what is unreal. Look, in my country, lots of men grow up with the belief that women are chattel. I married her. She's my possession. Now, this guy walks up to you and says, that's real. Women are things. What would your response be? Not true, right? Depends, she says. You don't agree with him. If he's married to you, (laughs) 
She said, oh, he's married to me, then it's not real. It's not true. That's interesting. <laughs> That's a good one. She says if he was married to her, she'd be a widow. Isn't that great? <laughs> That's terrific. Okay. Yes. Now, is this guy to blame? Get ready for a shock. He isn't. He isn't. Just like many Americans are not to blame for the way they're viewing Russians, they're not to blame. They just got dyed in a certain color, and, and there they are, and that's the color through which they're looking at the world, and they see that color. Now, what does it mean to make him real, to make him aware that he's looking at the world through colored glasses? Ah, there is salvation. There's no other salvation. Because I could say to him, stop it, that's not good. But till he has seen, he's always in danger of finding some other way of acting according to this conviction that was given to him. So I told you that's the making of the terrorist. He's absolutely convinced. He sees a real world out there. He's got real enemies. He's got people who hate him. But when we look at it, we say, funny, that's not there at all. You're imagining things. You're conditioned. So the great search of spirituality, the great task of spirituality, where am I coming from? Is this real? Or am I conditioned? Am I brainwashed? My dears, to doubt is infinitely more important than to adore. To question is so much more important than to believe. And it's because we don't do this that we have people killing one another. The readiness, the openness to question everything. The readiness to doubt everything. Doubt, says a great Indian mystic, is a healing balm. Though it burn at first, it will heal you. It begins to burn because when those convictions that you've injected, introjected, are beginning to wear off, you feel as if you're losing your whole life. My gosh, I, I've been a communist all my life. I was seeing the world through communist eyes. Has it ever struck you that if you are thinking as a communist, you've ceased to think? If you're thinking as a communist, you've ceased to think. Does that make sense? How about if you're thinking as a Muslim? Same thing. As soon as you're thinking as anything, you stop thinking. As soon as you're looking at the world through an ideology, but what is an ideology? Those are words. Those are theories. Those are ideas and concepts. No reality fits an ideology. And all good ideologues will tell you that. They say, well, this is the best we've come up with. Doesn't fit. Life is beyond that. That is why people are always searching for a meaning to life. Has it never struck you that life has no meaning? Cannot have meaning. What is meaning? Meaning is a formula. Meaning is something that makes sense to the mind. But every time you make sense out of reality, you bump into something that destroys it all. And you say, well, God is a mystery. Life is a mystery. We don't really understand it. We don't really know. It's like the mystics graft meaning onto their experience of reality. But it is really only a graft. Falteringly, inadequately, they try to express something. They give some clue. They give an indication. As I'll tell you when we talk about the scriptures, they tell you a story, hoping you'll get a clue. But it's not contained in that formula. It goes beyond the formula. Meaning is only found when you go beyond meaning. Life only makes sense when you perceive it as mystery. And it makes no sense to the conceptualizing mind. Yes, you have a question. Meaning 
is a set of sentences that your mind can understand. Label, very well put. Yes. Can what? Oh, I didn't say adoration wasn't important. I just said that doubt was infinitely more important than adoration. Everywhere people are searching for objects to adore, I don't find people awake enough to question themselves, their attitudes, their convictions. I'll tell you this, how happy we would be if a lot of the number of those terrorists would adore less and question more. How about that? Ah, now you're getting what I'm saying. Only we don't like to apply it to ourselves. We think we're all right. The terrorists are wrong. You know something? A guy who's a terrorist for you is a martyr for the other party. Mm-hmm. Yes. I find it so true that people need people. Aloneness. Aloneness. Loneliness is you're missing people. Aloneness is you're enjoying yourself. Remember that quip of Bernard Shaw? When they asked him whether he was, he went, they saw him at a party. You know those awful things that you call cocktail parties where nothing is said. And I, I just don't see how people enjoy that, but evidently some do. So he found himself at one of these parties and they said, are you enjoying yourself? And Bernard Shaw said, it's the only thing I'm enjoying here. <laughs> right. So aloneness is when you enjoy yourself and, hey, listen to this, and others. Because you know something? You never enjoy others, really, when you are enslaved to them. Needing people means needing them emotionally. Community is not formed by a set of slaves. People enslaved to people. People demanding that other people make them happy. Go on, you're supposed to make me happy because my happiness is in you. Go on, you're not supposed to be moody now because if you're moody, you affect me. Change your mood. I need you. Community is formed by emperors and princesses. You're an emperor. You're not a beggar. You're a princess. You're not a beggar. There's no begging bowl there. You're enjoying yourself and reality. And so you enjoy everybody because there's no clinging, there's no anxiety, there's no fear, there's no hangover, there's no possessiveness. There are no demands. Free people form community, not slaves. Now, to my mind, this is such a simple truth, but you're so right there, it has been drowned out by a whole culture, including a religious culture. Religious culture can be very manipulative if you don't watch out. There was another hand up here somewhere. Yes. <laughs> All right. Now, let me, let me reword your question for you or your comment, and you check me out. Uh, see if I'm all, it's all right. She says, to my mind, awareness is a kind of a the high point, the plateau. Until I get there, I want to experience every moment as it is. Now, first of all, don't make a goal out of awareness. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing to achieve. How do I get to this awareness? Through awareness. Now, when you say you really want to experience every moment, you're really talking awareness. Because you don't want to experience this guy, it's a friend of mine who's just gone to Ireland, he tells me, he's an American citizen, he said, I'm entitled to an Irish passport, so I'm getting one, because I'm scared to travel abroad now on an American passport. You know, I don't want a terrorist walking in and saying, let me have a look at that passport of yours. He says, well, I'm Irish, I fought oppressors too, <laughs> says this guy. Well, you don't want to sit next to this guy on a plane and see an Irishman or an American. You don't want to see labels. You want to taste and experience this person as he is. And you want to do that with everything. Unprejudiced. You don't just want to taste your words. How many people spend their lives 
not eating food. They're eating the menu. They really are. Can you imagine somebody saying, reading the menu and says, beef steak, there it is. And, uh, no, for heaven's sake, wait a minute. That's only an indication of something that's available. So you want to eat the steak, not the words. That's awareness. That's awareness. All right. Your dependence. Now, as you become aware of that, as you watch that, disidentify and watch that. And as I'm going to tell you presently, don't condemn yourself. You're only going to make it worse. But if you would see the pain it brings you, you'll drop it. Mm -mm. You're quite right. You want the pain. You want the pain of having it. And you're angry with the pain. How wonderful. Now, I'm going to ask you a personal question. Have you spent 500 hours watching this? That would work out to an hour a day for over a year. Oh, the book is useless. <laughs> no, no, I'm talking about watching this. Have you spent hours watching this? Two. Two. You will see miracles happening. Famous American uh, therapist who said that. Get out, lose your mind and come to your senses. <laughs> yes, lose your mind and come to your senses. But now take that with a pinch of salt, huh? Because you need an intelligent mind to understand. It's not as if mere sense awareness is going to heal you of everything. If you're still keeping your programming, you're still keeping your conditioning, if you still think your wife is a thing and not a person, if you still think that you're looking at reality objectively when you're looking at it distortedly, well, just coming to your senses may not be all that much of a help. Certainly a help, but uh, one needs intelligence to understand too. Well, awareness isn't a tool. Awareness is a method. Awareness is the goal. Awareness is life. One cannot misuse awareness. One is aware. One cannot... How does one misuse... non-misuse? Be aware. Be aware. No one will tell you that the unaware life is preferable to the aware life. Be open to feedback. Be open to questioning. To be open to be sensitive, to be aware. One cannot misuse that. Can one be fully human without experiencing tragedy? The only tragedy there is in the world is ignorance, and all evil comes from there. The only tragedy there is in the world is unwakefulness and unawareness, and from there comes fear, and from fear comes everything else. But death is not a tragedy at all. Dying is wonderful. But it's only horrible to people who have never understood life. It's only when you're afraid of life that you fear death. It's only dead people who fear death. But people who are alive have no fear of death. And one of your American authors has put it so well. The test of your awakening I don't remember what word he uses exactly, is the depth of your belief in injustice and tragedy. What is the end of the world for a caterpillar is a butterfly for the master. Death is resurrection. But we're not talking about something that will happen, but is happening right now. If you would die to the past, if you would die to every minute, the person who is fully alive is the person who is full of death. We're always dying to things. We're always shedding everything in order to be fully alive and to be resurrected at every moment. Now, the mystics, the saints and others, their great effort is to wake people up if we don't wake them up, my dears, we're always going to have these other 
minor ills of hunger and war and violence, etc., because of the great ill, the great evil of sleeping people, ignorant people. We're always coming up with new schemes, aren't we? There's a great debate going on in India about Mother Teresa's work, because lots of people are saying, what's she doing? She's running an ambulance service for people who are being crushed by an unjust society. You know, imagine a huge factory and people are getting crushed there. So they're taking these broken bodies and throwing them out the window. And Mother Teresa comes along with her sisters, picks up the body, puts them in an ambulance and takes them away. We, we mustn't do that. We've got to change the whole system. Is that right? Yeah. Well, wait a minute. I think she's doing a great work because, all right, at least there's somebody to pick up the broken bodies. And they say, rightly perhaps, it's precisely the owners of the factories who are giving her the money to, to keep the lawn clean. Pick them up. Something there. Something. But I wouldn't exclude her work at all. But what exactly do you plan to do now? Take over the factory, huh? Yeah. You know what's wrong with the factory? It's being run by wolves. Are you going to substitute it with another set of wolves? You think changing the system and putting wolves in charge is going to change it. In Mexico, there was a Jesuit who became the treasurer of the province. He says he wrote a note to Arupe once to ask him about the relative value of communism, socialism, and capitalism. And Father Arupe gave him a lovely reply. He said, a system is about as good or as bad as the people who use it. You know, people with golden hearts would make capitalism work beautifully. They say, look, I don't want to crush you out of the market. I, I'll make a little space for you so you can run your little business too or whatever. But if that doesn't change, if people haven't woken up meaning, they have not become sensitive to reality, then we have tragedy. That's the origin and the root of tragedy. Now, changing. I said, uh, I, I said to you yesterday... We're talking about people who are always wanting others to change so that they will be happy, remember? And I was saying, don't ask the world to change. You change first. Then you will get a good enough look at the world so that you will be able to change whatever you think ought to be changed. First, take the plank out of your own eye. But if you don't take it out of your eye, you have lost the right to change anyone or anything. Till you are aware of yourself, you have no right attempting to interfere with anyone else or with the world. Now, the danger of attempting to change others and to change things, if you yourself are not aware, is that you may be changing things for your own convenience, your own pride, your own dogmatic convictions and beliefs, or just to relieve your negative feelings. I happen to have negative feelings, so you'd better change so that I'll feel good. First, cope with your negative feelings. So that when you move out to change others, you're coming from love. You're not coming from hate. You're not coming from negativity. You're coming from love. And strange as it may seem, people can be very hard on others and very loving. The surgeon can be so hard on the patient and so loving. Love can be very hard indeed. What does self-change entail? I've said it in so many words again and again, but I'm going to break it down into little segments. First, insight. Not effort, not cultivating habits, not having an ideal Ideals do a lot of damage. You're the whole time focusing on what should be instead of understanding what is. And so you're imposing what should be on present reality, never having understood what present reality is. Now, insight. Let me give you an example of that from my own experience, counseling experience. There's this priest who comes to me and says he's lazy. He wants to be more industrious, more active. 
he is lazy. And I say, lazy? What does that mean? Now we're going to get into awareness, into insight. What's he talking about? In the old days, I would have said to him, oh, you're lazy, huh? He says, yes. Well, let's see. Why don't you do this? Why don't you make a list of things you want to do every day? And then every night you tick them off, that will give you a good feeling. And then, so build up a habit. Or I might say to him, who's your ideal? Who's your patron saint? He says, Saint Francis Xavier. Now see how much that guy worked? You've got to meditate on your ideal, and that will get you moving, etc. Now that's one way of going about it, but I'm sorry to say, it's superficial. Making him use his willpower, his effort, etc., doesn't last very long. His behavior may change, but he does not. Let's move in the other direction. I say to him, lazy? What's that? You know there are about 500 million types of laziness. Let's hear what your type of laziness. Would you describe what you mean when you're talking about laziness? He says, well, you know, I never get anything done. Uh-huh. You don't feel like doing anything. That's right, I don't feel like doing anything. You mean right from the moment you get up in the morning? Yes. He says, you know, I wake up in the morning and nothing worth getting up for. He says, that's right, nothing worth getting up for. You're depressed. He says, you could call it that. I'm depressed. So I've sort of withdrawn. Have you always been like this? Mm, well, not always. When I was younger, I was more active. When I was in the seminary, I was full of life. When did this begin? Oh, about three years ago, four years ago. Anything happen? He's thinking. So, well, if you have to think so much, nothing special could have happened four years ago. How about the year before that? What happened? He said, well, I was ordained. Anything happen in your ordination year? No, well, there was a little thing, the final examination in theology, you know, I failed and uh, it was a bit of a disappointment, but I've gotten over it, it's all right. Uh, what happened? He says, well, the bishop was planning to send me to Rome to eventually teach in the seminary and, uh, well, I rather liked the idea, but since I failed in the examination, he changed his mind, he sent me to this parish. He said, actually, that was an injustice because the man on the board, he was... Oh, he's getting worked up now. There's anger there. He hasn't gotten over it. We've got to work through that. He's disappointed. It's useless preaching him a sermon. We've got to find out what's happening there. It's useless giving him an ideal. We've got to get him to face his anger, his disappointment, to get some insight into all of that. When he's able to work through that, he's back into life again. If I had only given him an exhortation, if I had said, do you have married brothers and sisters? I do. Do you see how hard they have to work? And you know the trouble with us clergy? We, get ev we have everything found, for, you know, we, we get our meals. That'll make him guilty. But he hasn't got self-insight, which is going to heal him. So that's the first thing, the marvels of psychological insight. Now there's a great boon in psychology, great help. Modern psychology is indeed a great help to understand how our emotions keep tying us into all kinds of situations. Not really necessary. It isn't too difficult to unearth his addiction, his attachment. There's another great help, understanding. Did you really think this was going to make you happy? You just assumed it was going to make you happy. Why did you want to teach in the seminary? Because you wanted to be happy. You thought that being a professor, having a certain status and prestige would make you happy. Would it? Understanding is called for there. Or the other thing that I told you the other day, when I made the distinction between I and me. There's a great help to disidentify what's going on. After we unearth what's causing your depression, that's not difficult to see at all. Meditating and imitating externally the behavior of Jesus is no help. 
It's not a question of imitating Christ. It is a question of becoming what Jesus was. It was a, it's a question of becoming Christ, becoming aware, understanding what's going on within you. You know, all the other methods we use for self-change could be compared to pushing a car. Let's suppose you have to go from here to, what shall we say, to Syracuse. I have to go from here to Syracuse. The car breaks down somewhere. Say, well, too, car, too bad, the car's broken down. We roll up our sleeves and begin to push the car. And we push and we push and we push and we push till we get to Syracuse. Say, well, we made it. Where do we go next? St. Louis. Oh, God, St. Louis. So we roll up our sleeves and push it all the way to St. Louis. You say, hey, you're making a mess of your life. Yes, but we got there, didn't we? But you call this life? You know what you need? You need an expert. You need a mechanic. Lift the hood. Say, hey, you've got to change your spark plug. That's what we do. Turn the ignition key and the car's moving. You need the expert. You need understanding. You need insight. You need awareness. You don't need pushing. You don't need effort. That's why people are so tired. People are so weary. This afternoon, I'll tell you the, the root of the whole thing. You were trained, and I was trained, to be dissatisfied with ourselves. That's where the thing is. That's where the evil comes from, psychologically. We're always dissatisfied. We're always discontent. We're always pushing. So go on, make more efforts. More and more efforts. There's always that conflict inside. But there's very little understanding. I told you about those red-letter days in my life. One of them was in Chicago. One was in Spain. And the third one was in India. It was a great day, really. It was the day after I was ordained, and I sat in a confessional. We had a very saintly Jesuit priest in our parish, a uh, Spaniard, Spanish priest. I remember the day I went to the novitiate. I thought I'd better make a clean breast of everything and, you know, confess everything. So when I go to the novitiate, I'll be nice and clean. And I won't have to tell the novice master anything, all right, so. <laughs> And old Soler, you know, he'd have crowds of people outside his, lining up his confessional because he'd have a violet curtain. And a, I don't know where he got this, a violet colored handkerchief, which he'd cover his eyes with. And he'd just mumble something and uh, give you a penance and send you away. And he'd only met me a couple of times, you know, once. He'd call me Anthony, Anthony. So, all right. So he met me and I, I thought I, I, I'll go to Soler. I stood in line. When my turn came, I changed my voice. <laughs> Well, I said, it's, uh, you know, quite a while since I've been to confession. He listened to me patiently, and he gave me my penance, and he gave me the absolution, and he said, Anthony, when are you... Oh, God, when are you going to the novitiate? Oh. Well, I went to this place the day after my ordination. He said, do you want to hear confessions? I said, yeah, all right. So he said, go and sit in my confessional. I thought, my, the holy man, I'm going to sit in his confessional. I heard confessions for three hours. It was Palm Sunday. We had the Easter crowd coming in. I came out depressed. Not at what I had heard. Because I had been led to expect that. And having some inkling of what was going on in my own heart, I was shocked by nothing. You know what depressed me? The realization that I'd give them that little pious advice, now pray to the Blessed Mother, she loves you, and remember that God is on your side. But what was I saying? Were these pious platitudes any cure for cancer, really? And this is cancer I'm dealing with. And I swore a mighty oath to myself that day. I'll learn. I'll learn. So that it would not be said of me, Father, what you said was absolutely true and totally useless. <laughs> Awareness. Insight. Because when you get the expert, when you become an expert, you'll soon become an expert. You don't need to take a course in psychology, you know. As you begin to observe yourself, to watch yourself, to pick up those negative feelings, you'll find your own way of explaining it. And you'll notice the change. 
But then you'll have to deal with a big villain. And that villain is self-condemnation, self-hatred, self-dissatisfaction. Let's continue with change through awareness. Effortlessness in change. It's sort of a nice image for that. The sailboat. You have a sailboat with a mighty wind in its sails. And it glides along so effortlessly. And the boatman, what does he have to do? Nothing but steer. He makes no effort. He doesn't push the boat. That's something of an image of what happens when change comes about through awareness, through understanding. Plenty of quotes today. I was going through uh, some of my notes this afternoon and I found some quotes that fit pretty well with what I've been saying this morning, so I thought I'd read them to you. Listen to this one. There is nothing so cruel as nature. In the whole universe, there is no escape from it. And yet, it is not nature that does the injury, but the person's own heart. Does that make sense? It isn't nature that does the injury, but the person's own heart. You know the story of Paddy who fell from the scaffolding and got a good bump? He was working on that building. And they said, did the fall hurt you, Paddy? And Paddy says, no, it was the stop that hurt, not the fall. When you cut water, the water doesn't get hurt. When you cut something that's solid, it breaks. You've got solid attitudes inside. You've got solid illusions inside. That's what bumps against nature. That's where you get hurt. That's where the pain comes. Beginning to make sense? My, I've been talking about nothing else these days. You pick up your addictions. You pick up your illusions. You identify yourself with the me. You're going to get hurt. You're going to experience pain. So that's where it comes from. How come? You experience so much pain in this situation, someone else doesn't. Same situation, different heart, different outlook, different attitude. Change your attitude, something will happen. And here's a lovely one. These are mostly from Oriental sages. Don't even remember from whom. It really doesn't matter. Like in the Bible, the author doesn't matter. Uh, what is said is what matters. If the eye is unobstructed, the result is sight. If the ear is unobstructed, the result is hearing. If the nose is unobstructed, the result is a sense of smell. If the mouth is unobstructed, the result is a sense of taste. If the mind is unobstructed, the result is wisdom. When you drop those barriers that you have erected through your concepts and conditionings, wisdom is not something acquired. Wisdom is not experience. Wisdom comes from not being influenced by experience. Wisdom is not applying yesterday's solution to today's problem. As somebody said to me when I was doing my degree in psychology in Chicago years ago, someone said, Frequently in the life of a priest, 50 years' experience is one year's experience repeated 50 times. You've got the same solutions. This is the way to deal with the alcoholic. This is the way to deal with priests. This is the way to deal with sisters. This is the way to deal with the divorcee. That isn't wisdom. Wisdom is to be sensitive to this situation, to this person, uninfluenced by any carryover from the past. No residue from the experience of the past. Quite unlike what most people are accustomed to thinking. I would add another sentence to the ones I've read. When the heart is unobstructed, the result is love. Now, I've been talking a great deal about love these days. And I told you 
there's nothing that can be said really about love. We can only speak of non-love and drop that. We can only speak of addictions and drop that. But of love itself, nothing may be said explicitly. How would I describe that? You know what I decided to do? Uh, I hope it will go down well with you. I decided to give you one of those meditations I'm writing in a new book of mine, one of those reflections. I'll read it to you slowly, and you meditate on it as we go along, because I've got it put down rather pithily there, and I could get that done in three or four minutes. Otherwise, it would take me half an hour. Let's try it out, shall we? Okay. It's a comment on a gospel sentence. And the sentence is, most of these reflections I've written in this book uh, deal with gospel reflections. I was just thinking this morning of another nice reflection. This one comes from Plato, by the way. One cannot make a slave of a free person. For a free person is free even in prison. Or rather, one cannot make a slave of a wise person. Does that ring a bell? If someone forces you to go one mile, go two. You think you've made a slave out of me, putting a load on my back? You haven't. Exactly what I was talking about all of these days. You're trying to change exterior reality? My dear, if you need to be out of prison in order to be free, you are a prisoner indeed. Freedom is not in exterior circumstances. Freedom resides in the heart. And when you have attained wisdom, who can enslave you? And you're out of prison and enslaved by your addictions and your attachments and your conditionings and your negative emotions. You call yourself free? Aha, there it is. Now listen to this gospel sentence. He sent the people away. After doing that, he went up to the mountain to pray alone. It grew late, and he was there all by himself. That's what love is all about. Has it ever occurred to you that you can only love when you are alone? What does it mean to love? It means to see a person, a thing, a situation as it really is and not as you imagine it to be. And to give it the response that it deserves, you can hardly be said to love what you do not even see. And what prevents us from seeing our conditioning? Our concepts, our categories, our prejudices, our projections. The labels that we have drawn from our culture and from our past experiences. Seeing is the most arduous thing that a human being can undertake. For it calls for a disciplined, alert mind. Remember what I said to you this morning? Am I really seeing this person or am I coming from my conditioning or from my prejudiced view? It calls for an alert mind. But most people would much rather lapse into mental laziness than take the trouble to see each person, each thing in present moment freshness. Let's stop there now and ask, is that clear or isn't it? To see, that's the least we could demand of love. See me, as someone said once, I'll always remember the false image that I had of you. I will always love the false image that I had of you. Am I loving the image or am I loving this person? Am I projecting something from the past onto this person? 
very well. To drop your conditioning in order to see is arduous enough. But seeing calls for something that is more painful still. The dropping of the control which society exercises over you. A control whose tentacles have penetrated to the very roots of your being. So that to remove it is like tearing yourself apart. What is this control? If you wish to understand this, think of a little child that is given a taste for drugs. As the drugs penetrate the body of the child, it becomes addicted and its whole being cries out for the drug. To be without the drug is so unbearable a torment that it seems preferable to die. Think of that image. The body has got addicted to the drug. Now this is exactly what your society did to you when you were born. You were not allowed to enjoy the solid, nutritious food of life. Namely, work, play, fun laughter, the company of people, the pleasures of the senses and the mind. You are given a taste for the drug called approval. Appreciation. Attention. You know, to the point where psychologists began to tell us that a child needs attention. You've got to give him plenty of attention after you've drugged the child. Yes. I'll be quoting a great, great man after a while. A man called Neil. Those of you in education have surely heard of him. A.S. Neil, the author of Summerhill. Remind me to recommend two books to you tonight. I'll write them on the board. I'm only going to recommend two, and one of them is going to be Summerhill, Neil. Neil says, the sign of a sick child is that it is always hovering around its parents. It is interested in persons. The healthy child has no interest in persons. It is interested in things. You know, when, when the child is sure of mother's love, it forgets mother. It's going out to explore the world. It's curious, looking for a frog to put into its mouth, kind of thing. When he's hovering around mother, bad sign, he's insecure. Maybe mother has been trying to suck love out of the child and not giving the child, giving the child all the freedom and assurance it wanted. Mother's always been threatening to go away in many subtle ways. All right, so we were given a taste for the drug called addiction, approval, attention. The drug called success, you've got to make it to the top. Prestige, get your name in the papers. Power, be the boss. That's a success story. People take orders from you. We were given a taste for this. Be the captain of the team. Lead the band. Having got a taste for these drugs, you became addicted and began to dread their loss. So the control. You felt terror at the prospect of failure, of making mistakes. The prospect of criticism from others. So you became cravenly dependent on people and you lost your freedom. Others now have the power to make you happy or miserable. You're craving for your drug. And much as you hate the suffering that this involves, you find yourself completely helpless. There is never a minute 
when consciously or unconsciously you are not aware of, you are not attuned to the reaction of others marching to the beat of their drums. A nice definition of an awakened person is that this person no longer marches to the drums of society. This person dances to the tune of the music that springs up from within. When you are ignored or disapproved of, you experience a loneliness so unbearable that you crawl back to people to beg for the comforting drug called support, encouragement, reassurance. To live with people in this state involves a never-ending tension. Have you ever paused to think of that? Living with people is tension. Sartre, hell is the other. How true when you are in this state of dependence, but how true? You've always got to be on your best behavior. You can never let your hair down. You've got to live up to expectations. You're, you're always tense. To be with people is to live in tension. To be without them brings the agony of loneliness. You miss them. You have lost your capacity to see them exactly as they are and to respond to them accurately because your perception of them is clouded by the need to get your drug. You see them in as much as they are a support for getting your drug or a threat to having your drug removed. You're always looking at people, consciously or unconsciously, through these eyes. Will I get what I want from them? Will I not get what I want from them? And if they can neither support nor threaten my drug, I'm not interested in them. That's a horrible thing to say, but my dear friends, I wonder if there's anyone in this room of whom this cannot be said. If we really dropped our illusions, inasmuch as they can give me what I want or deprive me of what I'm wa I want, I'm interested. I'm alert. Otherwise, not much interest or no interest at all. The consequence of this is terrifying and unescapable. You have lost your capacity to love. You need awareness and you need nourishment. You need good, healthy nourishment. Learn to enjoy the solid food of life. Good food, that too. Good wine, good water. Taste. Lose your mind and come to your senses. That's good, healthy nourishment. The pleasures of the senses and the pleasures of the mind. Good reading, when you enjoy a good book or a real good discussion. Thinking, marvelous. See, unfortunately, people have gone crazy and they're getting more and more addicted because they do not know how to enjoy the lovely things of life. So they're going in for greater and greater artificial stimulants. Some years ago, President Carter, during the oil crisis, made an appeal uh, to Americans everywhere to go in for austerity. I thought to myself, he shouldn't tell them to be austere. He should tell them to really enjoy things. Most of them have lost their capacity for enjoyment. I really do believe that most people have in affluent countries. They got to have more and more expensive gadgets. They can't enjoy the simple things of life. And then I walk into all kinds of places where they have all the most marvelous music.
you know, get these records at a discount or whatever, they're all stacked there. I never hear anybody listening to them. No time, no time, no time, no time. They're guilty. No time to enjoy life. They're overworked. Go, 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 go. If you really enjoyed life and the simple pleasures of the senses, you would be amazed. You would develop that extraordinary discipline of the animals. An animal will never overeat. Left in its natural habitat, it will never be overweight. It will never drink or eat anything that is not good for its health. Never. We'll never touch it. You'll never find an animal smoking. <laughs> it always exercises as much as it needs. Look at your cat after it's had its little breakfast. Look how it relaxes and see how it springs into action. Look at the suppleness of its limbs and the aliveness of its body. We've lost that. We got lost in our minds and our ideas and our ideals and so on. And it's always go, go, go. And we've got an inner self-conflict which the animals don't have. And we're always condemning ourselves and making ourselves guilty. You know what I'm talking about because I could have said of myself what one Jesuit friend said to me some years ago. Take that plate of sweets away because in front of a plate of sweets or chocolates, I lose my freedom. He said, and that was true of me too. I lost my freedom in front of all kinds of things. No more, no more. I'm satisfied with very little. And I enjoy it intensely. When you've enjoyed it intensely, you need very little. But you've lost your capacity for enjoyment. You're never there. It's like people who are busy planning their vacation, and they spend months planning it. They get to the spot, and then they're all anxious about their re reservations for flying back. But, they, but they're taking pictures all right. And later, they'll show you pictures in an album of places that they never saw, <laughs> but that they photographed. That's a symbol of modern life. So I cannot insist enough on this kind of asceticism. Slow down and taste and smell and hear and let your senses come alive. You want a royal road to mysticism? Sit down quietly and listen to all the sounds around you. So that as far as possible, no sound is excluded. You do not necessarily focus on any sound, but you hear them all. Oh, you will see the miracles that happen to you if you are able to do this. When your senses come unclogged. So that is extremely important for the process of change. That with awareness, as I've explained to you all of today. Before the end of the session, I do want to give you a taste of the difference between analysis and awareness or information on the one hand and insight on the other. Information is not insight. Analysis is not awareness. Knowledge is not awareness. Suppose I walked in here and there was a snake crawling up my arm and I say to you, do you see the snake crawling up my arm? I just checked in an encyclopedia, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica before coming into the session, and I find that this snake is known as a Russell's Viper. If it bit me, I would die inside of half a minute. Would you kindly suggest ways and means by which I could get rid of this creature that's crawling up my arm? Who talks like this? I got the information, but I got no awareness. I'm destroying myself through alcohol. Would you kindly suggest ways and means I could get rid of this? This guy got no awareness. He knows he's destroying himself, but he's not aware of it. If he were aware of it, it would drop that minute. If I were aware of what this thing was, I, I wouldn't brush it off my arm. It would get brushed off through me. That's what I'm talking about. That's the change I'm talking about. You don't change yourself. It's not me changing me. Change takes place through you in you.
that's about the, the most adequate way, adequate way I can express it. You see change take place in you, through you, in your awareness. It happens. You don't do it. When you're doing it, bad sign. Won't last. And if it does, God have mercy on the people you're living with. Because you're going to be very rigid, you know. These people who are converted on the basis of self-hatred and self-dissatisfaction, boy, they're impossible to live with. Uh-huh. Somebody said, you want to be a martyr? Marry a saint. <laughs> oh. So, uh, so God have mercy on all of us if you, the, the change lasts. Because you're so rigid on yourself, you're going to be rigid on everyone else. But in awareness, you keep your softness, your suppleness, your gentleness, your openness, your flexibility. And you don't push. Change occurs. Remember an alcoholic priest telling us in Chicago when I was studying uh, my psychology there, he said, you know, I had all the information and I knew that the alcohol was killing me. And believe me, nothing changes an, changes an alcoholic, not the love of his wife or the love of his kids. And he does love them, but it doesn't change them. But he said, I discovered one thing that changed me. I was lying in a gutter one day. There was a slight drizzle. I was in the bad books of the Archbishop again. They, we had been friends before. Uh, not too friendly now anymore. But all of that did not affect me. But he said, in that moment, I opened my eyes. And I saw that this was killing me. But I saw it. I've never had the desire to touch a drop after that. He said, as a matter of fact, I've even drunk a bit after that, but never more than I needed, or never, more, n never enough to damage me. I couldn't do it. I just cannot do it. I've seen. I've been aware. That's what I'm talking about. Awareness. Not information. Awareness. A friend of mine who was given to excessive smoking, said, you know, he had all kinds of little jokes. He'd say, oh, come on, they tell us that tobacco kills people. Uh, look at the ancient Egyptians. They're all dead and none of them smoked. <laughs> They're all dead. So uh, that kind of thing. Well, one day he was having trouble with his lungs. He went to our uh, Cancer Research Institute in Bombay, which is pretty well equipped. He went there and the doctor said, Father, you've got two patches on your lungs. It could be cancer. You'll have to come back next month. You know, he never touched a cigarette after that. He knew it could kill him before. Now he was aware that it could kill him. That's the difference. The founder of my religious order, St. Ignatius, has a nice expression for that. He says, he calls it, tasting and feeling the truth. Not knowing it, but tasting and feeling it. Getting a feel for it. Ah, when you get a feel for it, you change. When you know it in your head, you don't. Listen to this, for instance. Just give you a couple of examples more and then we'll end. I've often said to people, the way to really live, but to really live, is to die. Or, the passport for live to living is to imagine that you're in your grave. Can you imagine that? You're lying in your coffin. Uh, any posture you like, nice. In India, they, they put them, in India, we put them cross-legged. What do you know? You know when they, they oh, yes, yes, and they sometimes carry it that way to the, to the burning ground. Sometimes they're lying flat and, and so on. All right. So imagine you're lying flat and your hands are there and uh, one over the other and you're dead. Look at your problem from that viewpoint now. Come on, look at it. Changes everything, doesn't it? Sure does. Or, as someone says, you know, it really bothers me that after a hundred million years, no one except a handful will probably remember me, says this guy. <laughs> what does he think he is after a hundred million years? But anyway, now, your uh, the coffin. What a lovely, lovely meditation. Do it every day if you have the time. huh? You'll come alive. It's unbelievable. You know, I've got, I've got a meditation about that in that book of mine, Wellsprings where you see the body decomposing, then you've got bones, then you've got dust. And you know, every time I talk about this, I have people say, ooh, ha, ah, 
What's so disgusting about it? This is reality, for heaven's sake. See, I told you, you don't want to see reality. Who conditioned you? You don't want to think of death. You people don't live, most of you, you don't live. You're just keeping the body alive. That's not life. You're not living until you don't, it doesn't matter a thinker's damn whether you live or you die. Now you live. Only when you're ready to lose your life, you live it. When you're protecting your life, you're dead. You're sitting up there in an attic, and I say to you, come on out. You say, no, 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 you know, if you die. I read about people going down the stairs, and they slip, and they break their necks. That's too dangerous. <laughs> And I can't get you to cross the street because say, do you know how many people get run over when they're crossing a street? And if I can't get you to cross a street, how could I get you to cross continents? And if I can't get you to peep out of your little narrow beliefs and convictions and take a look at another world, my, I mean, you're dead. You're completely dead. Life has passed you by. You sat in your little prison. You're scared. You're frightened. You're frightened you lose your God. You lose your religion, you lose your friends, you lose your health, you lose all kinds of things. Life is for the gambler. It really is. That's what Jesus was saying. You're ready to risk it. And you know when you're ready to risk it? When you found it. When you know that this thing that people call life is not really life. You found something else. when you have seen something else. And it doesn't matter whether you live or die. Everywhere I go, it seems to matter so much to keep people in a state, in a vegetable state. You know, it's like when the body perishes, life disappears. So people frequently mistake keeping the body alive with living. It's not the same as living. Now, Love the thought of death. Love it. Go back to it again and again. Think of the loveliness of that corpse, of that skeleton, of those bones crumbling, till you got a handful of dust. Huh? Huh? And from, the, from there now, look at your life. What a relief. What a relief. Most of you probably don't even know what I'm talking about. You're too frightened to think of it. Probably. But it's such a relief, you know, when you can look back on life from that perspective. What about all those mighty problems? Or visit a graveyard. It's an enormously purifying and beautiful experience. You, you walk there, why are you so frightened of reality? Huh? Huh? And you look at this man and say, gee, he lived so many years ago. Two centuries ago. Must have had all the problems that I have. He must have had lots of sleepless nights. Over stupidities like me. How crazy. We live for such a short time. And then... As that Italian poet says, we live in a flash of light. And evening comes and it is night forever. It's only a flash and we waste it. We waste it with our anxieties and our worries and our concerns and our burdens. Now, if you make that meditation, you may just end up with information. Or you may end up with awareness. And in that moment of awareness, you're new. At least as long as it lasts. Then you'll know the difference between information and awareness. Am I talking sense? All right, you're getting it. You're on. Very good. Or listen to this. A friend of mine, just uh, 10 days ago in India, who was an astronomer, was giving me some of the most fundamental things in astronomy. It's mind-boggling. You know, I did not know till he told me that when you see the sun, you're seeing it where it was eight and a half minutes ago, not where it is now. Because it takes the ray of the sun and eight and a half minutes to get to us. 
So you're not seeing it where it is, it's somewhere else. You're seeing it where it was eight and a half minutes ago. And stars, the, the ray of light comes from the sun in eight and a half minutes. Stars have been selling, sending light to us for hundreds of thousands of years. So when we're looking at them, they may not even be there when we're looking at them. They're somewhere else. We're getting the light now. Now, he said, imagine a galaxy, a whole universe, and this earth of ours lost towards the tail end of the galaxy, the Milky Way. It's not even in the center. Somewhere at the tail end. Every one of those stars is a sun. Some suns are so big that you could put the sun and the earth and the distance between them in one of them. They've got planets, possibly, but we don't know because the planets don't send light. Possibly there's life on those planets. We, we have no means of knowing because there's no light coming from them. The planets are in darkness. Well, uh, after discovering all of this about 50 years ago, they found there was yet another universe, another galaxy. You know how many universes they calculate there are or how many galaxies they calculate there are today? A sober estimate says 100 million galaxies. And the universe as we know it is expanding at the rate of the, the diameter. Is that the word I want? Yes, not the radius, the diameter. Is expanding at the rate of 2 million miles a second. Imagine a bubble that you're blowing and the universe is expanding at the rate of 2 million miles a second. You know, I was having dinner with this guy and it was, it was fascinating listening to all of this. And I come out of that restaurant and move into the street and look up there and I have a different field, a different perspective. That's awareness. You could pick this up as cold facts and that's information. Or you suddenly get another perspective on, on life. What are we? What's this universe? What's human life? Now when you get that feel, that's what I'm talking about when I talk of awareness. Now as you begin to practice some of the exercises I've been giving you, you will get this feel in many things. Then you will know. Then you will know. If you wish to love, you must learn to see again. And if you wish to see, you must give up your drug. As simple as that. Give up your dependence. You must tear away from your being the tentacles of society that have penetrated to the marrow. You must drop out. Externally, everything will go on before. You will continue to be in the world, but will no longer be of it. Because in your heart, you will now be free at last and utterly alone. It is only in this aloneness, in this utter solitude, that dependence on your drug will die. Incidentally, aloneness means not not having the company of people. It means not depending emotionally anymore. This, for this aloneness, you don't go to the desert. You're right in the middle of people. You're enjoying them immensely. But they no longer have the power to make you happy or miserable. That's what aloneness means. So, in this solitude, your dependence dies and the capacity to love is born. For one no longer sees others as means of satisfying one's addiction. Only someone who has attempted this knows the terror of the process. It is like inviting yourself to die. It is like asking the poor drug addict to give up the only happiness he has ever known and to replace it with the taste for bread and fruit 
and the clean, fresh morning air and the sweetness of the water from the mountain stream. While he is struggling with his withdrawal symptoms and with the emptiness that he experiences within himself now that his drug is gone. To his fevered mind, nothing can fill the emptiness except his drug. Can you imagine a life in which you refuse to enjoy, to take pleasure in a single word of approval and appreciation? Or to rest your head on anyone's shoulder for support? A life in which you depend on no one emotionally so no one has the power to make you happy or miserable anymore. You refuse to need any particular person or to be special to anyone or to, tell any, to call anyone your own. Even the birds of the air have their nests and the foxes their holes. But you will have nowhere to rest your head in your journey through life. If you ever get to this stage, you will at last know what it means to see with a vision that is clear and unclouded by fear or desire. Every word there is measured. To see at last with a vision that is clear and unclouded by fear or by desire. And you will know what it means to love. But to come to the land of love, you must pass through the pains of death. For to love persons means to have died to the need for persons and to be utterly alone. How would you ever get there? By a ceaseless awareness, by the infinite patience and compassion that you would have for a drug addict, by developing a taste for the good things of life, to counter the craving for your drug. What good things? The love of work which you enjoy doing for love of itself, the love of laughter and intimacy with people to whom you do not cling and on whom you do not depend emotionally, but whose company you enjoy. It will also help if you undertake activities that you can do with your whole being. I just said that. Activities that you so love to do, that while you are engaged in them, success or recognition or approval simply do not mean a thing to you. It will help too if you return to nature. Send the crowds away, go up into the mountains and silently commune with trees and flowers and animals and birds with sea and clouds and sky and stars. Remember I told you yesterday what a spiritual exercise it is to gaze at things, to be aware of things around you. Hopefully, the word will drop, the concept will drop, and you will see, and you will make contact with reality. That is the cure for loneliness. Generally, we seek to cure our loneliness through emotional dependence on people and through gregariousness and noise. That is no cure. Get back to things. Get back to nature. Go up into the mountains. Then you will know that your heart has brought you into the vast, desert of solitude. There is no one there at your side. Absolutely no one.
At first, this will seem unbearable. But it is only because you are unaccustomed to aloneness. But if you manage to stay there for a while, the desert will suddenly blossom into love. Your heart will burst into song. And it will be springtime forever. It really will. The drug is out. You're free. Then you will understand, my dears, what freedom is, what love is, what happiness is, what reality is, what truth is, what God is. You will see, you will know, beyond those concepts, beyond your conditioning, beyond your addictions and your attachments. Does that make sense? Let me end this with a lovely story. There was a guy who invented the art of making fire. So he took these tools with him and went to a tribe up in the north where it is very cold, bitterly cold. And he taught the people how to make fire. The people were interested. And he showed them the uses to which he could put, you could put fire to. You could cook. You could keep yourself warm, etc. My! They were so grateful. They learnt the art of making fire, but before they could express their gratitude to the man, he disappeared. He wasn't concerned about getting their recognition or their gratitude. He was concerned about their well-being. And he went to another tribe, where again he began to show them the value of his invention. And people were interested there too, a bit too interested for the peace of mind of their priests, who began to notice that this man was drawing the crowds and they were losing their popularity. So they decided to make away with him, which they did. They poisoned him. They got rid of him. They stoned him. They crucified him. Put it any way you like. But, they were afraid now that the people might turn against them. So they were very wily. You know what they did? They had a portrait made of the man. And they mounted it upon the main altar in the temple. And those instruments for making fire were placed there in front of the portrait. And people were taught to revere the portrait and to pay reverence to those instruments of fire, which they dutifully did for centuries. The veneration and the worship went on, but there was no fire. Where's the fire? Very religious. Where's the fire? Where's the love? Where's the drug uprooted from your system? Where's the freedom? This is what spirituality, this is what religion is all about. Tragically, we tend to lose sight of it, don't we? This is what Jesus Christ is all about. But then, we overemphasize the Lord, Lord, didn't we? Where's the fire? And if worship isn't leading to the fire, if adoration isn't leading to love, if the liturgy isn't leading to clearer perception of reality, if God isn't leading to light, of what use is it? Except to create more divisions, more fanaticism, more antagonisms, etc. And so awareness. It is not from lack of religion in the ordinary sense of the word that the world is suffering. And you know that. It is from lack of love. Lack of awareness. And love is generated through awareness. No other way. No other way. When the heart is unobstructed, the result is love. When the mind is unobstructed, the result is wisdom. Understand the obstruction and it will drop. 
understand the obstacles you are putting to the way of love and freedom and happiness and they will drop. Turn on the light of awareness and the darkness will disappear. Happiness is not something you acquire. Love is not something that you produce. Love is not something that you have. Love is something that has you. You do not have the wind and the stars and the rain. You don't possess these things. You surrender. And surrender occurs when you are aware of your illusions, when you are aware of your addictions, when you are aware of your desires and fears. And so I told you this morning, first, psychological insight, that's a great help, not, as I will tell you at the end of this lecture, not analysis. Analysis is paralysis. And I'll explain that to you. Insight isn't necessarily analysis. One of your great American therapists put it very well. He said it is the aha experience. Merely analyzing me gives me no help. It just gives me information. But if you could produce the aha experience, that's insight. That is change. Then, the understanding of your addictions. You need time. Alas, so much time that is given to worship and to singing praises and to singing songs could so fruitfully be employed in self-understanding. Community, my dears, is not produced by joint liturgical celebrations. You know deep down in your heart, and so do I, that they only serve to paper over differences. Community is created by understanding the blocks that we put to community by understanding the conflicts that arise from our fears and our desires, then community arises. We must always beware of making worship yet another distraction from the important business of living. And living doesn't mean working in the foreign ministry, as we call it in India, or working in government or being a big businessman, or doing great acts of charity. That isn't living. Living is to have dropped all the impediments and to live in present moment freshness. Look at the birds of the air. They do not toil and spin. That is living. Come alive. You're dead. I began by saying people are asleep. People are dead. Dead people running governments, dead people doing big business, dead people educating others, come alive. Now, worship must help this, or else it's useless. And increasingly, you know this and so do I, we lo we're losing the youth everywhere. They see this. They're not interested. They're not interested in having more fears and more guilts laid on them. They're not interested in more sermons and exhortations. But they are interested in, how can I love? Of course they are. How can I be happy? How can I live? How can I taste these marvelous things that the mystics tell us? So that's the second thing. Understanding. Third. Don't identify. Somebody asked me as I was coming up to the hall this afternoon, do, do you ever feel low? <laughs> Boy, do I feel low. I certainly do every now and then. I get my attacks of low feelings. But you know, they don't last. They really don't. What do you do? I told you. I gave you a four-point program. Put it into action and see the results. It's miraculous. Don't identify. Here comes the low feeling, all right, well, low, feeling low. Instead of getting tense about it, instead of getting irritated with yourself about it, understand, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling disappointed, or whatever. Second step, the feeling is in me, not in the other guy. 
not in the person who didn't write me that letter, not in, it's not in the exterior world, it's in me. You know what that understanding alone does for you? Try it out. It's miraculous. When I suddenly realize that it's in me, it's not outside. Because you know, as long as I think it's outside, I feel justified in holding on to my feeling. Anybody would, no, no, anybody wouldn't feel this way. Only idiotic people feel this way. <laughs> Only sleeping people do. Third, don't identify with the feeling. I is not that feeling. I am not lonely. I am not depressed. I am not disappointed. Disappointment is there. One watches it. You'd be amazed how quickly it glides away. Anything you're aware of keeps changing. The clouds keep moving. As you do this, you also get all kinds of lovely insights into why they were coming there in the first place. Strange but true. I'm a therapist, you know. You don't even need to keep delving into your past anymore. You're able to cope with them right here in the present. Those feelings. Another understanding. So the I and the me. Yet another thing that I would recommend. And it is that you would understand that most of our evils arise from violence to ourselves, self-dissatisfaction. I've got a lovely, lovely quote for you. Uh, a few sentences that I would write in letters of gold that I picked up from this book, Summerhill, written by this guy, Neil. Listen to this. Uh, I must give you the background. You probably know he was a man who was in education for 40 years. He developed this kind of maverick school where he took in these boys and girls and he just left them free. That's all. You're free to do whatever you want. You want to learn to read and write? Fine. You don't want to learn to read and write? Fine. You can do anything you want with your life provided you don't interfere with the freedom of someone else. Don't interfere in someone else's freedom. Otherwise, you're free. He says, uh, the worst ones were the ones who came to me from convent schools. These were in the old days, of course, but the convent schools. He said, it took them about six months to get over all the anger and the resentment that they had repressed. So they'd be six months a rebelling, fighting the system. He says, the girl who had the record... Uh, would take a cycle and for six months would be cycling in town, avoiding class, avoiding school, avoiding everything. Once they got over their rebellion, everybody wanted to learn. Everybody was protesting. Why don't we have class today? Everybody was interested. But they would take what they were interested in. They'd be transformed. Amazing. Unbelievable. Incredible. Transformed. Parents were frightened to send their children to the, this school in the beginning because they said, how could you bring them up if you don't discipline them? And you've got to teach them, you've got to guide them, you can't leave them free, etc., etc. Oh, you must read that book. It was, it created a revolution in my life. Summerhill, A.S. Neil, N-E-I-L. I'm not sure if it's a double L now. It's A-N-E-I-L-L, A.S. Neil, Summerhill. Paperback, you find it everywhere. Now, what was the secret of his success? He'd be getting, so to speak, the worst kind of kids. The kids that everybody had despaired of. And within six months, they were all transformed. Listen to what he says. Extraordinary words. Holy words. That's a holy book. He says, every child has God in him. Our attempts to mold the child will turn the God into a devil. Our attempts to mold the child will turn the God into a devil. Children come to my school, little devils, hating the world, destructive, unmannerly, lying, thieving, bad-tempered. 
in six months, they are happy, healthy children who do no evil. These are amazing words coming from a man who has this school of his in Britain that is regularly inspected by people coming from the Ministry of Education and by any headmaster or headmistress or anyone who cared to go there. Amazing. Well, it was his charism. You don't do this kind of thing from a blueprint. You've got to be a special kind of person. He says in some of his lectures to headmasters and headmistresses, he said, come on into Summerhill and you'll find that all the fruit trees are laden with fruit. Nobody's taking the fruits off the trees. No desire to attack authority. They're well fed and they don't feel any desire to attack authority. There's no resentment and anger. Come to Summerhill and you'll never find a handicapped child with a nickname. You know how cruel kids can be when someone stammers? He says, you'll never find anyone needling a stammerer. Never. There's no violence in those kids. You know why? No one's practicing violence on them. That's why. Listen to these words of revelation. Sacred words. There's no violence in those kids. Do you know why? Because no one has practiced violence on them. That's why. You know something else? We have peoples in the world who are like this. No matter what your scholars and priests tell you and your theologians. There are and have been people where there has been no quarrels, no jealousies, no conflicts, no wars, no enmities. None. They exist in my country, or oh, I'm sad to say they existed till relatively recently. I've had friends of mine, Jesuits, go out to work, live and work among people who they assured me are incapable of stealing or lying. They cannot. One sister said to me that when she went to the northeast of India to work among some tribes there, uh, the, the Mizos, uh, Meghalaya, in Meghalaya, up there in the northeast of India. He, she said, you know, when we first went there 40 years ago, the people would lock up nothing. Nothing was ever locked up. Nothing was ever stolen. And they never told lies until the Indian government officials and the missionaries showed up. She said both. That's important to understand. We went there to reform them, to change them, to mold them. Every child has a God in him. Our attempts to mold the child will turn the God into a devil. Now you try to figure that one out. Why would this be? You know there is that, uh, I can't resist telling you this, cameras or no cameras. Listen to this. There is uh, that lovely Italian film of Fellini, I think, Eight and a Half. Now I haven't seen it, but I read a book about it. And this guy describes a scene. In that scene, there's a Christian brother who's going out for a picnic or an excursion with a group of kids, I guess eight to ten year old kids, boys. And uh, they're on the beach and this group of kids moves right on ahead while the brother comes and brings up the, the rear guard kind of with three or four kids with him. Now these boys go on ahead and they come across an old woman who's a whore. And they say to her, hi. And she says, hi. And they say, who are you? And she says, I'm a prostitute. They don't know what that is, but they pretend they do. And then they ask uh, one, of the, one of the guys who seems a bit more knowing than the others. He says, a prostitute is a woman who does certain things uh, if you pay her. They say, would she do those things if we paid her? He said, yeah, why not? So they make a little collection, it seems, and they give her the money. And they say, would you do uh, certain things now that we've given you the money? She says, Hi, yeah, sure, kids, what do you want me to do? Now, the only thing that occurs to the kids is, take your clothes off. So she does. Well, they look at that, never seen it before. <laughs> now they want to, uh, they don't know what else to do. They say, would you dance? She said, sure. So they all gather around and they're singing and clapping. And the old, the old whore is, you know, kind of uh, moving her, her, her hind and so on. And they're enjoying themselves immensely. Now, the brother sees that. He comes staring down the beach. He breaks into the circle, he yells at the woman, he gets her to put her clothes on, and the author says, at that minute, 
the kids have been spoiled. Till then, they were innocent and beautiful. He spoiled them. I have a rather conservative missionary in India, a Jesuit brother of mine, who, well, not a blood brother, you understand, brother because Jesuit, who came to a workshop of mine, something like this, and I developed this theme over two days. Oh, he suffered. And he came to me at the end of the second day at night, and he said, Tony, I can't explain to you how much I'm suffering here, listening to you. I said, why, Stan? He said, you know, you're reviving within me a question that I've suppressed for 25 years. It's a horrible question. And I said, what is it? And he said, again and again, I have asked myself, have I not spoiled my people by making them Christians? He is none of your liberals. He isn't one of your liberals, by the way. He's an orthodox, pious, devout, conservative man. Have I not spoiled them by making them Christians? They were a happy, loving, simple, guileless people. Till I got there. You know the story of the American missioners who went to the, the South Sea Islands? with their wives, Protestant missioners. They were horrified to see these women coming bare-breasted to church, and they insisted with their husbands that the women should be more decently dressed, so then they gave them shirts to wear, that to put shirts on, I, I guess, so they could give their own hang-ups to the natives. Well, next Sunday, the, the women showed up with their shirts and two big holes cut out <laughs> for comfort. Ah, oh, yeah. For greater comfort, you understand. <laughs> Ventilation, it's like this. They were all right. It's the missioners who were all wrong. They were all right. You read that book, Papillon? Papillon? Uh, all right. You know, I wouldn't have believed a word of what that man was saying if I hadn't read studies in certain tribes. Not all tribes, unfortunately. Lots of tribes are very cruel and very inhuman. But you do run into places. Saw that movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Something like that. But what about progress, they say to me, to which I reply, progress? What are you talking about? You're talking about jumbo jets and putting people in space and Star Wars? You call that progress? Progress is love progress, idiot. Heart progress, idiot. That's what progress is. Did you forget that? Are we more loving? That's progress. Not have we created vehicles of greater speed and precision. That's not progress. So there it is. You know where, oh my goodness, I was, I was reading Neil to you. I'm so sorry I got carried away. <laughs> he says in six months, they are happy, healthy children who do no evil. These kids are not tribals. They're coming from so-called civilized society, whose parents were civilized barbarians. And they're the victims of these barbarians and this barbaric society, which has imposed all kinds of things on these poor kids. Well, in six months, they are happy, healthy children who do no evil. And now get ready for a shock. And I am no genius, says Neil. I am merely a man who refuses to guide the steps of children. How about that, huh? How about original sin, huh? How about the born evil, huh? Every child has a God in him. Our attempts to mold the child will turn the God into a devil. So I am no genius. I am merely a man who refuses to guide the steps of children. I let them form their own values. And the values are invariably good and social. Can you believe that? When a kid feels loved, which means 
when a kid feels you're on his side, you're on her side, she's okay. The kid doesn't experience any violence anymore. No fear, so no violence. Loving. The kid begins to treat others the way he or she has been treated. Understandably. You've got to read that book. You can make your Bible meditations on that. It's a holy book. It really is. Read it. It revolutionized my life. It revolutionized my dealings with people. And the miracles I began to see. It revolutionized my dealings with me. I began to understand all the self-dissatisfaction that had been ingrained into me. The competition, the comparison, the go on, you've got to improve, that's not enough, etc., etc., etc. And you mean, if they hadn't pushed me, I wouldn't have been what I am? Did I need all that pushing? And anyway, who wants to be what I am? I want to be happy. I want to be holy. I want to be loving. I want to be at peace. I want to be free. I want to be human. All right. And then he adds, the religion that makes people good also makes people bad. But the religion knows, known as freedom makes all people good. For, the, for it destroys the conflict that makes people bad. The self-conflict. The religion known as freedom makes them all good. For it destroys that self-conflict that makes them bad. Do you know where wars come from? They come from self-conflict. We're projecting outside of us the conflict that is inside. Show me an individual in whom there is no inner self-conflict, and I'll show you an individual in whom there is no violence. There'll be effective action. There'll be hard action. There is no hatred. There's only understanding. When he or she acts, they act as the surgeon acts. When he or she acts, they act as a loving teacher acts with mentally retarded people or children or whatever. You don't blame them. You understand, but you swing into action. But when you swing into action with your own hatreds and your own violence, well, you've compounded the error. You're trying to put fire out with more fire. You're trying to deal with a flood by adding water to it. So, every child has a God in him. Our attempts to mold the child will turn the God into a devil. Children come to my school, little devils, hating the world, destructive, unmannerly, lying, thieving, bad-tempered. In six months, they are happy, healthy children who do no evil. And I am no genius. I am merely a man who refuses to guide the steps of children. I let them form their own values. And the values are invariably good and social. The religion that makes people good makes people bad. But the religion known as freedom makes all people good, for it destroys the inner conflict. I've added the word inner. That makes people devils. He has a, he has a horrible statement. He says, the first thing I do when a child comes to Summerhill is destroy its conscience. Would you believe that? The first thing I do when a child comes to Summerhill is destroy its conscience. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about, at least I assume he's talking about it, because I know what he's talking about. You don't need conscience. When you get consciousness, you don't need conscience. When you have sensitivity, you don't need a conscience. You're not violent. You're not fearful. Now you think, this must be an unattainable ideal. Well, read that book. And I have run into an individual here or two, here or there, who suddenly stumbles upon this and knows. So that's one more thing you must understand. The root of the evil within you. As you begin to understand this, you stop making demands on yourself. 
You stop ha making, having expectations of yourself. You stop pushing yourself and you understand. Gee, that would take us 20 days to comment on. But you've got the kernel, you've got the seed, you can develop it. There's one last thing I have to say and it is this. You know, connected with change through awareness. The last thing is, what I insinuated in that meditation that I read to you, and it is this. Nourish yourself on wholesome food. Good, wholesome food. And I'm not talking about physical food. I'm talking about sunsets, about nature, about a good movie, about a good book, about enjoyable work, about good company. And hopefully you will break your addiction to those other feelings. Just think, what kind of feeling comes upon you when you're in touch with nature? Or when you're absorbed in your work that you love? Or when you're really conversing with someone whose company you enjoy in openness and intimacy without clinging? What kind of feelings do you have? Compare those feelings with the feelings that come when you win an argument or you won a race, or you become popular, or everybody's applauding you. A different type of feelings. Those feelings I call worldly feelings. The other feelings I call soul feelings. Lots of people gain the world and lose their soul. Lots of people live empty, soulless lives because they're feeding themselves on popularity, on appreciation, on praise, on I'm okay, you're okay, on look at me, attend to me, support me, value me, on being the boss, on having power, on winning the race. You feed yourself on that, you're dead. You've lost your soul. Feed yourself on other, more nourishing material. Then you'll see the transformation. Given you a whole program for life, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs>